fundraising investigation. Attorney General Janet Reno discussed her decision last week not to appoint an independent counsel to probe White House fundraising calls. FBI Director Louis Free also testified before the Government Reform and Oversight Committee about the Attorney General's decision. Chairman Dan Burton's opening statement leads off the hearing. Let's get down a little bit so we can, uh, we can all see each other. Uh, the Attorney General and uh, uh, the uh, FBI Director will not be coming out for a few minutes because we have some procedural things we have to deal with. And for that reason, uh, if you can take a deep breath and relax, and, and uh, we'll, we'll let you know. We'll do like Johnny Carson say, here's Janet, and then you'll be ready to go, okay? Uh, good morning. The quorum being present, the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight will come to order. Before Mr. Lantos and I deliver our opening statements, we'll dispose of some procedural matters first. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses' statements be included in the record, and without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all exhibits, articles, and extraneous and tabular material referred to during this hearing be included in the record. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the depositions of Holly Weymouth, David Mercer, B.J. Thornberry, Thomas F. McClarty, Bruce Lindsay, Douglas Buford, and the interrogatories of Wayne Raud, C.W. Kahn, John Moores, and Eli Broad be made part of the record and delivered to the FBI, the Department of Justice, and the appropriate independent counsel so that they may pursue evidence the committee has gathered. Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from California, Mr. Lance. Reserving the right to object, I would like to ask why we are singling out these particular depositions. It has been the position of uh, the Democratic side of this committee that all depositions be made available and public. We have nothing to hide. It is our judgment that selecting specific depositions uh, restricts the opportunity for the American people and for all who are engaged in this uh, investigation to have full access to all the materials which are available. So I would like to suggest respectfully that you amend your unanimous consent request to encompass all depositions. Uh, Mr. Lantos, uh, the reason we have uh, picked these specific uh, depositions is because we have questions that are relevant to these people and their depositions. If the minority has questions uh, that they would like to ask regarding other people's depositions, uh, we would uh, uh, entertain those as well. That is not my point, Mr. Chairman, so let me restate my point. Well, I understand your point. You don't need to restate it. Well, if you do, will do allow you, me to make... Uh, you, you've made your point. Do you object, Mr. Lantos? I will not be, I will not be muffled. I wish to make a statement, and I don't want you to cut it off. Do you have a point of order you'd like to raise, Mr. Yes, Hines? I do. Okay, state your point of order. My point, my point of order is that it is the judgment of this side that all depositions... The, the gentleman is not stating a point of order. If you have a point of order, state your point of order, Mr. Lantos. My point of order is that selective release of depositions jeopardizes the fairness of these proceedings, and I'm calling for the release of all depositions. That is, is not a valid point of order. However, you have stated your position. Do you object, Mr. Lantos? I do. Gentleman objects. The question now comes on whether or not these – well, pardon me. The clerk will report motion number two at the desk. Mr. Burton moves that the depositions of Holly Waymouth, David Mercer, B.J. Thornburg, Thomas F. McCarty, Bruce Lindsley, Douglas Buford, and the targeters of uh, John Moore, Ellie Barmont, made part of the record and delivered to the FBI and the Department of Justice and the appropriate independent counsel so that it may be pursuant to evidence that the committee has gathered. The question now comes on the motion before the committee. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. Those opposed will signify by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The roll ayes call. Have it. The gentleman from California has asked for a roll call. A roll call will be granted. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burton? Aye. Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Gilman? Aye. 
Mr. Gilman votes aye. Mr. Hester? Ms. Morella? Mr. Shays? Mr. Schiff? Mr. Cox? Aye. Mr. Cox votes aye. Ms. Ross Layton? Aye. Ms. Ross Layton votes aye. Mr. McHugh? Mr. Horn? Mr. Horn votes aye. Mr. Micah? Aye. Mr. Micah votes aye. Mr. Davis of Virginia? Aye. Mr. Davis of Virginia votes aye. Mr. McIntosh? Mr. Souter? Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Shattuck? Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. LaTourette? Mr. LaTourette votes aye. Mr. Sanford, Mr. Sessions, Mr. Pappas, Mr. Snowbarger, Mr. Snowbarger votes aye. Mr. Barr, Mr. Barr votes aye. Mr. Miller, Mr. Waxman, Mr. Lantos, no. Mr. Lantos votes no. Mr. Wise. Mr. Owens, Mr. Towns, Mr. Kanjorski? No. Mr. Kanjorski votes no. Mr. Condent, Mr. Sanders? No. Mr. Sanders votes no. Mrs. Maloney? No. Mrs. Maloney votes no. Mr. Barrett? No. Mr. Barrett votes no. Ms. Norton? No. Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Fatah? Present. Mr. Fatah votes present. Mr. Cummings? Mr. Kucinich? No. Mr. Kucinich votes no. Mr. Bogoyevich? Mr. Davis of Illinois? Mr. Tierney? Aye. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes aye. Mr. Allen? Aye. Mr. Allen votes aye. Mr. Ford? Mr. Hastert? Why are they voting on? Ms. Morella? Mr. Shays? Mr. Schiff? Mr. McHugh? Mr. McIntosh? Mr. Souter? Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Sanford? Mr. Sununu, Mr. Sessions, Mr. Pappas, Mr. Miller, Mr. Waxman, Mr. Wise, Mr. Owens, Mr. Towns, Mr. Condent, Mr. Cummings, Mr. Bogoyevich, Mr. Davis of Illinois, Mr. Ford. Report the tally. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Mr. Fertal, you're recorded as present. Uh, I'd like to be recorded in favor. The clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, there are 15 ayes, seven noes, and one, uh, excuse me. What's that? 15 ayes and seven noes. The motion carries. Uh, questioning in the matter under consideration shall proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14, in which the Chairman and Ranking Minority Member allocate time to committee counsel as they deem appropriate for extended questioning not to exceed 60 minutes, equally divided between the majority and the minority. Questioning in the matter under consideration shall proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14, in which the Chairman and Ranking Minority Member allocate time to members of the committee as they deem appropriate for extended questioning not to exceed 60 minutes, equally divided between the majority and the minority. Is there any objection? Hearing none, so ordered.
Uh, we would now like, if, uh, if, if they're available, the Attorney General of the United States and the FBI Director to come in, be sworn. No, they will not be. They will not be. For the uh, information of uh, those in attendance, uh, we will have two panels because we have a series of questions for each individual. The first panel will consist of the Attorney General of the United States, Janet Reno, and uh, later on today, uh, when she concludes and leaves, we'll have FBI Director Louis Free uh, uh, before the committee as well. Chairman, I would like to raise a question. Uh, the gentleman will state his question. I have been advised by the distinguished director of the FBI in a meeting yesterday that he requested that he appear jointly with our distinguished attorney general. I think this is a reasonable request. I would like to support this request. And I would like to suggest that uh, these two outstanding public servants be appear, appear on a joint panel together. I, I uh, understand the gentleman's question. We have discussed this at some length. We have so many uh, questions for the Attorney General, and then we have a, a number of questions for the uh, FBI Director. And the Attorney General is under some time constraints. Uh, we're going to try to have her conclude her testimony by 2 o'clock or thereabouts so she can leave. So. We have decided that uh, we have to have two separate panels, uh, and I think we'll be able to expedite our business uh, more efficiently if we do that. So we will have the Attorney General first. Mr. Chairman, under those circumstances, I move that the Attorney General and the Director of the FBI appear together. I don't think so. <laughs> the uh, motion is that uh, the Attorney General and the FBI Director appear together uh, before the committee instead of in two separate panels. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. I'll have a roll call vote on this. Mr. Barton? No. Mr. Burton votes no. Mr. Gilman? No. Mr. Gilman votes no. Mr. Hassert? Mrs. Morella? No. Mrs. Morella votes no. Mr. Shays? Mr. Schiff? Mr. Cox? No. Mr. Cox votes no. Ms. Ross Layton? No. Ms. Ross Layton votes no. Mr. McHugh? Mr. Horn? No. Mr. Horn votes no. Mr. Micah? No. Mr. Micah votes no. Mr. Davis of Virginia? No. Mr. Davis of Virginia votes no. Mr. McIntosh? Mr. Souter? Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Shattuck? Mr. Shattuck votes no. Mr. LaTourette? Mr. LaTourette votes no. Mr. Sanford? Mr. Sununu? Mr. Sessions? Mr. Pappas? Mr. Snowbarger? Mr. Snowbarger votes no. Mr. Barr? No. Mr. Barr votes no. Mr. Miller? Mr. Waxman? Mr. Lantos? Aye. Mr. Lantos votes aye. Mr. Wise? Mr. Owens? Mr. Towns? Mr. Kanjorski? Aye. Mr. Kanjorski votes aye. Mr. Condent? Mr. Sanders? Yes. Mr. Sanders votes yes. Mrs. Maloney? Aye. Mrs. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Barrett? Aye. Mr. Barrett votes aye. Ms. Norton? Aye. Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Fatah? Aye. Mr. Fatah votes aye. Mr. Cummings? Aye. Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Kucinich? Yes. Mr. Kucinich votes yes. Mr. Bogoyevich? Mr. Davis of Illinois? Mr. Tierney? Yes. 
Mr. Tierney votes yes. Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes aye. Mr. Allen? Aye. Mr. Allen votes aye. Mr. Ford? Mr. Hastert? <coughs> Mr. Shays? Mr. Schiff? Mr. McHugh? Mr. McIntosh? Mr. Souter? Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Sanford? Mr. Sununu? Mr. Sessions? Mr. Pappas? Mr. Miller? Mr. Waxman? Mr. Wise? Mr. Owens? Mr. Towns? Mr. Condent? Mr. Bogloyevich? Mr. Davis of Illinois? Mr. Ford? The clerk will report the tally. Mr. Cha Chairman, there are 12 ayes and 12 nays. The motion fails. We will proceed as, uh, as planned. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Attorney General. I understand you prefer to be called Ms. Reno rather than Attorney General? Well, the, uh, uh, what I object to is general because my predecessors looked at the history and determined that it was the attorney who did general work for the Crown as opposed to specific work, and that's the way the name arose, so I'm an adjective, not a noun. Well, I appreciate that historical fact. Uh, uh, how about I address you as Ms. Reno? That'd be fine, okay. sir. Thank you. Uh, I've called this hearing today because of the unique and unfortunate situation in which we find ourselves. This is the first time in my memory and maybe in history that the Attorney General of the United States and the Director of the FBI have disagreed so publicly about such an important issue. The campaign finance investigation involves the President and the Vice President of the United States. It involves their top aides. It involves their major fundraisers. When our nation's the, the opening statements, uh, Mr. Lantos, uh, we will not have any time constraints. Uh, if you choose to use as much time as I do, you're welcome to do that. When our nation's top two law enforcement officers have such a serious disagreement about a case involving our country's highest elected officials, Congress is compelled to step in and examine the facts. Last week, Attorney General Reno said that there will be no independent counsel for this investigation. We are led to believe through press accounts that Director Free objected vigorously. The director wrote a detailed memo to the Attorney General explaining why an independent counsel is necessary. Despite a subpoena from this committee, we still have not seen this memo. However, the Wall Street Journal reports that Director Free's memo lays out the case that the diversion of soft money into hard money by the DNC and other related campaign finance law violations may have constituted a conspiracy that reaches into the White House. According to the New York Times, Mr. Free's memo argues that the conflicts of interest for the Justice Department are so great that the Department cannot credibly investigate the campaign finance issue. I must ask, how are members of Congress and the public supposed to react when they pick up the newspaper and this is what they read? Several articles in the Washington Post in October, for instance, spelled out some of the deep divisions between the FBI and the Justice Department lawyers on the task force. FBI officials said that they were being restrained from investigating key people, especially high-level Clinton administration officials. If that is the way the investigation has been operating, the need for an independent counsel could not be more clear. The Justice Department investigation has been underway for more than a year. We have heard reports that, in that time, they have not even attempted to contact John Wong or get his testimony. He is one of the central figures in this case. Why hasn't he been contacted? We have heard reports that the task force develops new leads mainly when it reads about them in the newspaper. It was widely reported that the Justice Department had documents in its possession that showed that the DNC was converting soft money to hard money. Unfortunately, the prosecutors learned about it by reading the Washington Post. Why?
they had the documents and they didn't look at them. One of the Attorney General's primary advisors on this investigation has been the head of the Public Integrity Section, Mr. Lee Radick. Mr. Radick has publicly called the Independent Counsel Act, quote, an insult. Is this the person that should be advising the Attorney General on whether we seek an independent counsel? In July, Senator Thompson said in his opening statement that there was a communist Chinese government plot to infiltrate our political system. He then received a public letter from Andrew Foy at the Justice Department contradicting his statement, and it was widely publicized. Now, within the last month, Bob Woodward has reported in the Washington Post that the Justice Department had other information in its files that supported Senator Thompson's statement. The files, which were only revealed to us in November, were reported to shed more light on the Chinese government plan. This information has apparently been in the Justice Department files since 1991, and yet the Justice Department was writing to Senator Thompson saying that he was misstating the facts. I think that's terrible. What is worse, the Attorney General was informed about this information on November the 5th. We were not given this information, Madam Attorney General, until the 14th of November, 10 days later. This is absolutely unacceptable conduct. The Attorney General has stated that her refusal to seek an independent counsel is based on the law and the facts. She is wrong on both counts. Section 592 of the Independent Counsel Act clearly authorizes the Attorney General to request an independent counsel whenever the Department of Justice has, quote, a personal, financial, or political conflict of interest. Section 592 recognizes that sometimes the Attorney General simply has an unavoidable conflict of interest in investigating other government officials. The President is the Attorney General's boss. She serves at his pleasure. She cannot conduct an impartial investigation of the President and his political allies. Listen to the Attorney General's own words when she testified in 1992. Will you play the video, please? 1993, pardon me. This was before the Senate Government the Affairs Committee. The thus served as a vehicle to further the public's perception of fairness and thoroughness in such matters, and to avert even the most subtle influences that may appear in an investigation of highly placed executive officials. Three months ago, the Senate Judiciary undertook an extensive study of everything I had done for the last 15 years, and the fact that the governor of Florida, independent of me, could appoint special prosecutor when anybody said boo about me was oftentimes, I think, what gave credibility to the process of those 15 years. I'm not sure that uh, our staff had the right uh, quote up there, so I will, uh, I will <laughs> read the correct here? quote, and I will quote the Attorney General directly. She said, quote, the reason that I support the concept of an independent counsel with statutory independence is that there is an inherent conflict whenever senior executive branch officials are to be investigated by the department and its appointed head, the Attorney General, end quote. How have investigations of the White House been handled by attorneys general in the past? Just look at Iran-Contra. Within a month of the Iran-Contra story breaking in 1986, Attorney General Ed Meese requested an independent counsel. President Reagan publicly called on him to do so. Mr. Meese said it was in the public interest. Oliver North was not a, quote, covered person. Mr. Meese used the same conflict of interest section of the bill that we're talking about today and asking Attorney General Reno to use. What a marked contrast with the Clinton administration. It has been 14 months since this foreign fundraising scandal became public. The Attorney General is still resisting an independent counsel. Unlike President Reagan, President Clinton has not called for an independent counsel. He has remained silent. This has all the appearances of an Attorney General protecting the President. By focusing on the narrow issue of phone calls from the White House, Ms. Reno guaranteed the result of her preliminary inquiry. By apparently avoiding key witnesses and stifling attempts by FBI agents to interview key people, the Attorney General continues to allow her investigation to drag on with few results. Ever since the Independent Counsel Law was enacted in 1979, every other President and Attorney General, when faced with such large politically sensitive cases, has turned them over to an Independent Counsel. I would refer to the chart on the screen, I hope we can get that right this time which identified 
19 independent counsels which have been appointed over the years. While the Attorney General has cited her previous appointments of independent counsels as evidence of her impartiality, she omits that in one case, which touched upon the President, the Whitewater investigation, she initially opposed appointing an outside counsel and only did so after months of opposing it and at the direction of the President. Many of my Democrat colleagues here today will say that this is a partisan Republican attack against the Attorney General. We will hear this repeated throughout the day. Fortunately, it is not true. The need for an independent counsel to investigate the White House has been obvious to many Democrats. Former President Jimmy Carter has called for an independent counsel. So has Senator Moynihan, Senator Feingold, and Senator Wellstone. Even Henry Waxman, the ranking member of this committee, called for an independent counsel last February. It doesn't stop there. Groups like Common Cause have been very critical of the Attorney General. If that's not enough, just pick up the New York Times. The Times is hardly an organ of the Republican Party, yet 15 times in the last year the Times has called for an independent counsel. Former Justice Department officials also see the need. Philip Hyman, Ms. Reno's former, former Deputy Attorney General who also served in the same position in the Carter administration, supports the appointment of an independent counsel. He has said, and I quote, I served in seven administrations, and I've never seen the Justice Department so dominated in the policy realm by the White House. Mr. Hyman also stated, I think the law requires her to appoint an independent counsel. I think the career people are telling her the law hasn't been broken, and I think they're wrong, end quote. Ms. Reno would have us believe that she can thoroughly and impartially investigate people such as Webster Hubble, her former associate attorney general. He was convicted and sent to jail. In the summer of 1994, while he was under investigation, Webster Hubble was paid $100,000 by the Riotti family's Lippo group. Ms. Reno defended Webster Hubble and called him her friend. Can she conduct an impartial investigation and question Mr. Hubble about his dealings with the Riottis, with John Wong, and other people who are, who, who are subjects of our investigation? This would certainly appear to pose a conflict. John Wong, the president's, quote, longtime friend, to use the president's own words, has anyone at the task force asked him for a full accounting? We were surprised to learn from his attorney last spring that he had not been contacted. Indeed, Mr. Wong's attorney was surprised he had not been contacted. And we continue to hear that there has been almost no contact. Charlie Tree, another longtime friend of the president's, have there been any attempts to bring him to justice? Charlie Tree's sister testified before this committee that when she met the president at a fundraiser, President Clinton told her that her brother had been his close friend for two decades. Tree is someone who knew the president for years and gave hundreds of thousands of dollars to the campaign and the president's legal defense fund. At virtually the same time, he was awarded a coveted trade commission slot. Before he was appointed, the first lady and Harold Ickes were warned of Tree's suspicious contributions to the legal defense fund, which were all returned. Conveniently, Char Charlie Tree has fled the country and bragged to NBC's Tom Brokaw that he can stay lost in China for as long as 10 years. When China's President Zhang Zemin visited Washington in October, I asked the President in two separate letters to seek the return of Charlie Tree for questioning. The President has promised to cooperate with this investigation. However, he apparently made no effort to raise this subject with President Zhang. Bruce Babbitt presents a remarkable situation. We have the Attorney General withholding documents under executive privilege claims in this matter in a civil lawsuit. At the same time, the Attorney General is supposed to, quote, thoroughly and impartially, end quote, investigate allegations of wrongdoing by her cabinet colleague and his aides, as well as senior White House officials in criminal investigation. The nonpartisan Congressional Research Service Legal Division has found no basis for the White House and DOJ's privilege claims in these documents. And I will submit the CRS opinion and correspondence to the Attorney General on this matter for the record. The Attorney General clearly has inherent conflicts with these close friends of the President and many other key people in this investigation. But the problems do not stop there. The Justice Department has sided with the White House in almost every politically sensitive matter of recent note. They sided with the White House and opposed independent counsel Kenneth Starr when he sought Whitewater-related notes. They lost. The Attorney General and the Justice Department also sided with the President and argued before the Supreme Court that he was immune from a civil suit arising out of events that occurred before the President took office. They lost. Justice Department lawyers also opposed independent counsel Donald Smoltz's attempt 
to prosecute a top agricultural department official. Again, they lost. Mr. Smaltz has been leading the investigation into former Agricultural Secretary Mike Espy. He has obtained 10 indictments, five convictions, and six guilty pleas. He will testify tomorrow about the roadblocks thrown up by Justice Department that have hampered his important work. The Attorney General's decision not to appoint an independent counsel is one of the most important decisions she has made during her tenure. It is, to say the least, a controversial one. The American people and Congress have a right to know both how and why she arrived at her decision. Clearly, there was a serious disagreement between the Attorney General and the FBI Director. We have gone out of our way to address concerns about grand jury material that might be in the memo. We have indicated that grand jury material could be redacted, crossed out. However, there was no attempt on the Attorney General's part to meet us halfway. Ms. Reno said on television on Sunday, I think it was Face the Nation, that there have been ongoing discussions between her staff and our committee. Unfortunately, that is not true. We have had almost no contact from the Justice Department since last Friday, even though the Attorney General said otherwise on Face the Nation. There is clear precedent for Congress receiving such documents. I am submitting for the record the correspondence we have had back and forth with the Justice Department on Director Free's memo, as well as a review of the Congressional Research Service regarding precedents for turning over such material. Congress has an obligation to make sure that the Justice Department is enforcing the law in a fair and even-handed manner. If half of the news reports we are reading about the Justice Department are true, we have cause for concern. Those concerns are compounded when we learn that our two top law enforcement officers have such a fundamental disagreement over the need for an independent counsel. With a case of this magnitude, Congress cannot sit idly by. We have an obligation to pursue Director Free's memo and hope the Justice Department will commit some time to work with us. The Director of the FBI serves a 10-year term. Congress provided the FBI Director with this 10-year term after Watergate so he would have the independence that is necessary to enforce the law free from political pressure. This is particularly important when investigations involve the White House and high-level political officials. The Attorney General does not have the same security. She is a member of the President's Cabinet. The Attorney General comes and goes with the President who appoints her and serves at his pleasure. Director Free has served this country as a federal prosecutor, a federal judge, and now as the nation's top investigator. He arrived at the independent judgment that the credibility of this investigation would best be served by appointing an independent counsel. In response, the director has been the target of a steady stream of attacks from the White House. This constant sniping at the director of the FBI from the White House is the clearest sign we have of where the president stands. The Clinton White House has an instinct to attack any time it feels threatened. Mr. McCurry's comments about the director were disgraceful. I think the President should issue a public apology to Mr. Free. As the Chief Law Enforcement Officer in the nation, Director Free's duty is to the law. That duty should not be subordinated to anybody, including the President. It is interesting that the President's people think the FBI Directors should be loyal subordinates, and its Directors should be loyal subordinates. Before I finish, I would like to address one last topic. I understand that my friends on the Democratic side are going to make an issue of my involvement in this hearing. According to Roll Call magazine, they are going to ask for an independent counsel to investigate these bogus charges that have been raised against me. Let me say this to my good friends, and I hope you're all listening. I have no problem with that at all. I believe that we need an independent counsel for the entire task force investigation. If the Attorney General wants to include my case under an independent counsel, I say fine. You know as well as I do that these are politically timed, politically motivated charges made by a former White House staffer, Democrat White House staffer, and a leader of the Democrat National Committee who worked for the Democrat National Finance Committee. They're nothing more than part of a smear campaign, and if you want to include me in that kind of investigation, fine. I have nothing to fear from an independent counsel. It is apparent that the President does not feel the same way. If the Attorney General is willing to request an independent counsel for this entire campaign finance investigation, I have absolutely no problem with having my case included with the others. The American people must have confidence in our Justice Department. Many have noted that both Republican allegations and Democrat allegations must be pursued, and I agree. 
An independent counsel is the best way for the Justice Department to proceed with its responsibilities. In Congress, in this committee, we will continue our public review of these important matters so that the American people who have a right to know are not kept in the dark. Mr. Lantos. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Your opening statement is so pregnant with inaccuracies, misstatements, innuendos, and false statements that were I to respond to all of them, we would be here until midnight. Let me just take one general item, which I think sort of puts this thing in perspective. You started out your statement by suggesting that the disagreement between an attorney general and an FBI director is unique in American history. I don't know what this reveals except your total lack of understanding of American history. Recent American history has given us countless examples of attorneys general and FBI directors disagreeing on important issues. And I find it not at all surprising that these two distinguished public servants occasionally find themselves on opposite sides of an issue. But let me put this whole investigation and the appearance of uh, the Attorney General and the FBI Director in some perspective. There has been an attempt on the part of the Republican majority of this committee to portray the 1996 elections as one between one party with pristine purity obeying all federal election laws and the other party mired in illegal activities. Now, you don't have to have the IQ of a 10-year-old child to recognize the absurdity of this underlying assumption. There were plenty of violations of law on both sides, and it is the position of the Democratic minority on this subcommittee that every single one of these violations, whether committed by Democrats or Republicans, high or law, should be investigated to the fullest extent of the law, and the perpetrators should be punished according to the law. This is our position. Unfortunately, the conduct of this investigation by the majority has clearly indicated that this is the most lopsided and partisan investigation in American history. You issued some 700 subpoenas to Democrats and I believe 11 to Republicans. We have been unable to deal with any Republican violations because the majority has stifled us every step of the way. Now, let me deal with the issues of this hearing. I want to say a few words about Janet Reno. President Kennedy wrote a book entitled Profiles in Courage. And if a sequel will be written to that book entitled Profiles of Integrity, the most noble chapter of that profile will be a profile of this distinguished Attorney General. I meet, as uh, many of you do, with students who visit Washington on various programs. And invariably, I use Janet Reno as the paragon of public virtue, as the paragon of an outstanding, impeccable public servant. And I would like to extend to our distinguished Attorney General my personal apologies for the outrageous statements made about you and concerning you over recent weeks. These are cheap, petty, partisan political attacks, and the people who make them will be thrown into the dustbin of history while your fine record will stand here as an important chapter in American history. Let me also say a word about um, the director of the FBI. I have the highest regard for this distinguished public servant. He has served our nation with exemplary effectiveness, integrity, and intelligence. And I profoundly deplore the attempts of the Republicans on this committee and in this town to try to, try to drive a wedge 
between two distinguished, outstanding public servants, both of them of impeccable integrity. I want to say a word about Mr. Burton's comments concerning conflicts of interest in the Attorney General conducting this investigation. The facts are, Mr. Burton, that the independent counsel law was written by the Congress. It was not written by Louis Free or Janet Reno. That law gives the Attorney General sole jurisdiction in determining whether an independent counsel is called for or not. She takes advice from many sources, but the judgment call is hers. Now, the fact that we occasionally disagree with judgment calls is nothing new. The Supreme Court often has five to four decisions. It would be preposterous and absurd to question the integrity of the four or the five who are on different sides of those cases. But this is really not the Supreme Court. This is a staff agency. Let me, let me indicate from the Justice Department manual the role of the FBI. And I'm quoting, the FBI is a fact-finding and reporting agency only. The results of FBI investigations are furnished without recommendation or conclusion to the U.S. Attorney's Office or to the Department for the determination of appropriate action. The decision for action to be taken is the sole responsibility of the U.S. Attorneys or the Department and special agents are not authorized to express an opinion as to such matters. The Attorney General received advice from the Attorney General, uh, from, the, from the FBI Director. She received advice from many other sources, and with her customary and traditional integrity and independence, she made a judgment. Now, the people whose hatred for the Clinton administration has reached pathological proportions simply cannot deal with this. They simply cannot deal with this. They become livid because they think that they will be missing yet another opportunity to attack the administration. Well, that's too bad. That's too bad. Uh, in some cases, only quick medical advice may be helpful in dealing with the degree of pathological hatred that permeates portions of this town. I also find it amusing, truly amusing, Ms. Burton, that you cite the New York Times editorials as your ultimate source of wisdom. I wonder how many times during the last decades you found the New York Times editorial judgments horrendous, abhorrent, idiotic. There are editorial judgments on both sides of this issue. Scores of distinguished newspapers agree with the decision of the Attorney General. Others disagree with her decision. That is the nature of a free and open and democratic society. I would also like to make an observation concerning your demand for FBI directors, the FBI director's recent memorandum to the Attorney General. And I want to be very careful that you listen to, to the letter I'm about to read, because this letter was sent to you and signed by both our distinguished Attorney General and our distinguished Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. December 8, 1997, to Mr. Burton. We are writing, we are writing, in response to your December 5th letter, 
and subpoenas seeking a copy of the director's recent memorandum to the Attorney General. The memorandum expresses the director's views about whether the Attorney General should request the appointment of an independent counsel and about other matters relating to the ca pending campaign finance investigation. We remain quite concerned, not I, not the Attorney General, we, the FBI Director and the Attorney General, we remain quite concerned that releasing the Director's memorandum to Congress would compromise the Department's ability to discharge its responsibilities for the fair administration of justice. As a general matter, we feel strongly that the Attorney General's decision-making on prosecutorial matters must have the benefit of candid and confidential advice and recommendations from the Director and other Department officials and employees. More specifically, we believe that both the integrity of the criminal justice process and the government's ability to prevail in particular prosecutions could be threatened by acceding to the committee's demand. Parenthetically, I might add, it was not the committee's demand, it was the Republicans' demand on the committee. On the Democratic side, we think this demand was outrageous. I'm continuing to quote from the letter written by Director Free and Attorney General Reno. Public and judicial confidence in the criminal justice process would be undermined by congressional intrusion into an ongoing criminal investigation. Access to the confidential details of an ongoing investigation would place members of Congress in a position to exert pressure or attempt to influence the prosecution of specific cases, irreparably damaging enforcement efforts, irreparably damaging enforcement efforts. Moreover, the disclosure of this memorandum could provide a roadmap of our investigation. The document or information contained therein could come into the possession of the targets of the investigation through inadvertence or deliberate act on the part of someone having access to the documents. The investigation could thereby be seriously prejudiced by the revelation of the direction of the investigation or information about the evidence we possess. In addition, the reputation of individuals mentioned in a document like this could be severely damaged by the public release of information about them, even though the case might ultimately not warrant prosecution. Finally, the Department has reviewed the precedent cited in your letter that's the Burton letter, and in the, and in the accompanying Congressional Research Service Memorandum. It is unprecedented, I repeat, it is unprecedented for a Congressional Committee to demand internal decision-making memoranda generated during an ongoing criminal investigation. What you're asking for, Mr. Burton, is unprecedented. Returning to the letter. None of the cited examples are to the contrary. In particular, the three prior matters that you highlighted in your letter did not involve ongoing criminal investigations and therefore are not relevant precedents. We have decided, we again, the Attorney General and the head of the FBI, we have decided for the foregoing reasons that we must respectfully continue to decline your request for the memorandum. We will be prepared at tomorrow's committee hearing to respond to your questions to the fullest extent we can, consistent with our law enforcement responsibilities. We are hopeful that our participation in the hearing will respond to your concerns. If questions remain after the hearing, we would be willing to discuss them further in a manner that properly accommodates 
both the legislative and the executive branch interests. Sincerely signed, Janet Reno, Attorney General, Louis J. Free, Director, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Well, this is the response of two responsible public servants to an irresponsible, politically motivated, tawdry, partisan request. And I want to fully associate myself with that letter. The facts speak for themselves. As the Attorney General has stated, the investigation is ongoing. If, in her judgment, at any time in the future, she feels that an independent counsel should be appointed, I have full confidence she will do so. Janet Reno has appointed more independent counsels than any attorney general in American history. This is not a person who will be intimidated. This is not a person who can be threatened. This is not a person who can be bullied. He, she is a person who is an enormously competent attorney who responds to her own conscience, who follows the law, and who follows the facts. That is why she stands in such high admiration by the American people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I uh, ask the Attorney General to be sworn in, uh, I ask unanimous consent that all committee, Department of Justice, and FBI correspondents we have traded over the past two weeks be included in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Madam Attorney General, do you swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, I do. Thank you. On behalf of the committee, uh, we welcome you here today. Uh, you are recognized to make an opening statement, and your entire uh, testimony will be submitted for the record. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Congressman uh, Madam Lantos. Madam Attorney General, would you pull the mic a little bit closer, please? Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, Congressman Lantos, and members of the committee, I'm pleased to appear before the committee today and very much appreciate your accommodating my schedule relating to the ministers of justice who are here and will be here this afternoon. But one of the most important duties of Congress is to oversee the work of the executive branch. Since I took office in 1993, I have, I have come before the House and Senate many times to answer questions and explain the work and the conduct of the Justice Department. This is one of my most important duties, and I appreciate this opportunity to be with you today. In connection with the committee's oversight investigation of campaign finance matters, the department has provided the committee with classified briefings on matters related to its investigation, and we have provided the committee with more than 200 documents. Those documents include classified material, memoranda that do not relate to the campaign financing task force's ongoing criminal investigation, and portions of telephone logs and calendars of high-ranking department officials, including my own. We will continue to work with the committee to assist in its oversight needs consistent with our law enforcement responsibilities to our ongoing criminal investigation. In effect, we have two functions. They are different, and I want to do everything I can to fulfill my function of investigation and prosecution under the law, while at the same time working with you to do everything possible to support the exercise of your oversight function. Mr. Chairman, I would also like to address your request for a copy of Director Free's recent memorandum to me discussing the campaign finance investigation and expressing his views about whether I should request the appointment of an independent counsel. The director and I remain quite concerned about releasing that memorandum as indicated in the letter which Congressman Lantos has re read. We're concerned that releasing it would compromise the department's ability to discharge its responsibilities to ensure the fair administration of justice. We feel strongly that as investigative and prosecutorial decision makers, we must have the benefit of candid and confidential advice and recommendations from our advisors. 
we do not want to chill the free exchange of ideas necessary to a solid investigation and legal decision making. In addition, the disclosure of this memorandum could provide a roadmap of our investigation, thus jeopardizing our work by tipping off potential targets of our approach and of our analysis. I'm sure we will be discussing these issues further during today's hearing. As Director Free and I indicated, we will be prepared to respond to your questions to the fullest extent we can, consistent with our law enforcement responsibilities. We are hopeful that our participation in the hearing will respond to your concerns, and we will continue to work with you. Our staffs have already recently discussed several other matters of interest to the committee, including the FBI investigation known as Merck Reaction, and our more recent investigative activity regarding an Indian gaming proposal in Wisconsin. We are prepared to work with you to accommodate the committee's oversight needs for information on these matters to the extent possible, consistent with our law enforcement responsibilities. This process is clearly less complicated where the department's investigation is closed, such as in Mercury Action, and we will do the best we can with each request. I look forward to a continuing dialogue with you and the committee on all of these matters. I know you and the members of your committee are anxious to discuss the work of the Campaign Financing Task Force. I look forward to discussing it with you to the extent that I can. Before providing the committee an overview of recent action by the task force and my decision under the Independent Counsel Act not to seek the appointment of an independent counsel as a result of our preliminary investigations of President Clinton, Vice President Gore, and former Energy Secretary Hazel O'Leary, I would like to take a moment to talk about two important things. First, there's been a great deal of discussion in the media and around Washington about disagreements within the Department of Justice, and I would like to address those issues head on. Secondly, I'd like to discuss the fine work of prosecutors, agents of the FBI, and the Campaign Financing Task Force on this matter. It is entirely consistent with the hard work and dedication to the American people that I have seen in the Justice Department's outstanding employees. As for disagreements within the Department, and in particular disagreements between Director Free and me, let me say this very, very clearly. Louis Free is one of the most dedicated public servants I know. He is an experienced investigator, he is an experienced prosecutor, and he is an excellent director of the FBI. I know, because I've worked with him for four years, through some of the most difficult situations that public servants confront. I have seen him there at the ready, there to, ready to give good advice, unvarnished advice, honest advice. And that's the kind of director of the FBI I want. I value his judgment, I value his counsel, and we have a strong and very amicable working relationship that I don't think anybody's gonna bust up. We do not always agree as he will tell you in his statement today, we disagree on the issue of whether I should apply for the appointment of an independent counsel. But I'd be upset if I found that the director of the FBI was agreeing with me all the time, and I wouldn't think he was doing his job. When I took this job, I deliberately sought out independent thinkers to work in the department. I do not want to be surrounded by yes people telling me what I, they think I want to hear because that would not serve the American people. In setting up this campaign financing task force, Director Free and I have followed the same practice. We discuss the issues and we sometimes disagree. It's healthy, it promotes good investigative work and clear thinking about the law. With respect to the Independent Counsel Act, after listening to the reports on the investigation, discussions about the law and all of the debates, it is my job to take all of that information and make the legal decision that Congress entrusted to me and to me alone. <clears throat> I have done so, Mr. Chairman, and for as long as I serve this nation as Attorney General, I'm going to continue to do so in the same manner. One of the things I learned about editorials a long time ago, and I'm sure you've learned about it, if not from the New York Times, from your local newspaper, that there are a lot of editorials you just disagree with. If editorials, however, have arguments based on the evidence in the law, I want to consider them. But I will get the best lawyers and the best agents to give me their best recommendations, and I will make the decisions based on the evidence and the law, and not on newspaper headlines 
newspaper editorials, threats, or polls. That is what we do in the Justice Department every day, and that is why I want to specially commend the work of the 108,000 fine people who serve the American people at the Department of Justice. They work around this nation and around the world. They catch spies and drug lords and terrorists. They stand guard at our borders. They uphold our liberties. And around the country, the Justice Department and the FBI are full partners with police, mayors, and neighborhoods in the 24-hour-per-day world of protecting the public and prosecuting criminals. In this particular campaign finance investigation, as in all others entrusted to the Department of Justice, we are going to follow every lead wherever it goes. And if at any time specific and credible evidence develops indicating that the Independent Counsel Act should be triggered, I will not hesitate to do so. More than a year ago, the Justice Department assembled a fine task force of experienced attorneys and FBI agents to investigate allegations of criminal wrongdoing surrounding the 1996 elections. No criminal case in this department has more resources. The task force now numbers more than 120. <clears throat> more than a million pages of documents have been obtained, hundreds of interviews have been conducted, and agents have been dispatched across the country and around the world to track down leads. Numerous allegations have been made against high government officials. As required by the Independent Counsel Act, we have reviewed every one of them to see if there is specific and credible information that a crime may have been committed by a covered person or someone for whom it would be a conflict of interest for the Justice Department to investigate. When these allegations have been specific and credible, we have commenced a preliminary investigation that is what the law demands, and we have implemented it faithfully. Since I have been Attorney General, I have sought the appointment of no fewer than four independent counsels. I have also sought the expansion of independent counsels' ongoing investigations and have referred other matters to them. Last week, pursuant to the law, I decided that the allegations against President Clinton, Vice President Gore, and former Energy Secretary Hazel O'Leary do not at this time warrant the appointment of an independent counsel. This decision was mine, and it was based on the facts and the law, and not pressure, politics, or any other factor. I want to emphasize one point. Any decision not to ask for an independent counsel does not mean that a person has been exonerated or that the work of the Campaign Finance Task Force has ended. These decisions do not end our work. We will continue to investigate vigorously all allegations of illegal activity, and if the Independent Counsel Act is triggered, I will do so. With respect to the decisions I made last week, I would note that the complete statement in our notification to the court of matters that can be made public is contained in the notification, a copy of which has been forwarded to you, and I would ask that that be reviewed for the specifics. With respect to President Clinton, on October 14th of this year, we began a preliminary investigation pursuant to the Act into allegations that President Clinton may have violated federal law by making fundraising calls from his office. Documents obtained by invest investigators identified 68 <coughs> potential donors who might have been solicited by the President. 64 of them were interviewed, and the other four gave statements through their attorneys. Investigators also interviewed White House and DNC personnel who might reasonably have been aware of any fundraising calls made by the President. <clears throat> President Clinton was interviewed. Investigators also thoroughly reviewed other records, including telephone toll records, White House operator diaries, scheduling requests, and the President's schedule. We have taken every reasonable step to investigate these allegations. The investigation uncovered three occasions when the President made telephone calls from the White House relating to fundraising. In two of these instances, the President was calling to thank a contributor or fundraisers and did not solicit contributions. On the third occasion, on October the 18th, 1994, the President placed a number of phone fundraising calls to potential contributors. Telephone records, investigative interviews, and the President's schedule all established that these calls were made from the White House residence, not from the Oval Office or any other official White House space. 
The criminal law prohibiting solicitation of political contributions on federal property does not encompass the residential areas of the White House. With respect to Vice President Gore, on September the 3rd of this year, we began a preliminary investigation into allegations that the Vice President may have violated federal law by making fundraising telephone calls from his office in the White House. Investigators interviewed or obtained affidavits from approximately 250 witnesses, including the Vice President and members of his staff, White House, DNC, and campaign officials, <clears throat> and more than 200 potential donors. Investigators also obtained numerous documents from many employees of the White House, the DNC, and the Clinton-Gore re-election campaign, as well as persons whom the Vice President called. The evidence gathered in this preliminary investigation indicates that the Vice President made calls from his office to approximately 45 people between the fall of 1995 and the spring of 1996 to raise money for the Democratic National Committee. However, the evidence found by the investigators shows that the Vice President solicited only soft money in these calls, not hard money. For example, no donors said the Vice President solicited hard money. Donors were given follow-up instructions on donating to DNC soft money accounts and the amount solicited exceeded hard money limits. Sometime after the 1994 elections, the DNC began to split some large checks into soft and hard money accounts without the donor's prior knowledge or consent, including several of the donations solicited by the Vice President. <coughs> Investigators uncovered no evidence that the Vice President was aware of the DNC's practice or in any way knew that donations he solicited would make their way into hard money accounts. We are, however, continuing to investigate whether the DNC's practices violate any criminal laws. Finally, even if we were to assume that the Vice President had violated 18 U.S.C. Section 607, the Independent Counsel Statute prohibits me from asking for an independent counsel to investigate allegations that the Justice Department would not prosecute under its existing standards. Congress inserted this provision into the law so that government officials would not be subject to different application of the law than other citizens. In this case, the Department's clear, long-standing policy is not to prosecute under 18 U.S.C. Section 607 unless certain aggravating factors are present, such as coercion, knowing disregard of the law, substantial number of violations, or significant disruption of government functions. The investigation uncovered no evidence of any of these aggravating factors. <clears throat> With respect to Secretary O'Leary, on September 19th of this year, we began a preliminary investigation into former Energy Secretary Hazel O'Leary. Allegations had been made that she may have violated federal laws by soliciting a $25,000 contribution for a charitable organization in return for an official meeting with a visiting delegation of Chinese petrochemical officials. After an extensive review of the documents and more than 40 interviews, including an interview of Johnny Chung, investigators developed no evidence that she had anything to do with the solicitation of the charitable donation. However, the task force will continue to review whether anyone else may have broken the law in connection with the solic solicitation <coughs> and payment of the $25,000 Africare donation. These decisions were arrived at after thousands of hours of investigation and discussion with investigators, attorneys, and senior officials at the Justice Department and the FBI. I am proud of their work. That includes Director Free, whose counsel I have regularly sought and whose advice I value highly. However, the decision to ask for an independent counsel is mine, and I alone am responsible for it under the law. I also want to make clear to this committee and to the American people that there are no constraints on the task force's ability to pursue the matters they are investigating. I have repeatedly told them to pursue every lead, explore every avenue, interview witnesses, and ask any question that is relevant to the matters they are investigating. At any time the task force uncovers sufficient grounds to investigate whether a covered person may have committed a crime, that is, specific and credible information, I will again commence a preliminary investigation under the Act as I am required to do. In the meantime, we are continuing to pursue a vigorous and a thorough investigation. I urge everyone to study the documents that we have filed with the court and that I have enclosed with my testimony. These filings show how searching our inquiry is, how complex these matters can be, 
and how hard we have worked to do the right thing. As you know, Mr. Chairman, I have begun a preliminary investigation into allegations concerning Secretary Babbitt. Again, however, I cannot comment on our ongoing investigation. I believe strongly, as I told you at the outset, in the oversight process, and I want to answer your questions to the best of my ability and in a manner which safeguards the integrity of ongoing investigations. I must follow the longstanding department policies which strictly limit what I can say about pending investigations. When an investigation interacts with the Independent Counsel Act, the importance of being circumspect is even greater. I'm sure you all agree that we should do nothing to jeopardize the investigation or to create the appearance that it is being affected by political pressure. At the same time, there is a unique public interest and congressional interest in any matter that could involve the Independent Counsel Act. That is why I welcome your questions. While our longstanding policy prevents me from telling you as much as you might like, I will do my best to answer your questions based on information in the public domain, to explain how we interpret the act and to clarify our investigative policies. These policies have been applied by the career professionals at the Justice Department and the Federal Bureau of Investigation for years and sometimes decades. <clears throat> Under Democrats and Republicans, Mr. Chairman, I'm a career prosecutor and I work with hundreds of career prosecutors. They are some of the finest attorneys in America. My only guiding star is my desire to follow every lead, to find the truth, and to apply the law the right way. I don't care where the facts lead because I'm going to follow them as far as and wherever they go and take whatever action is required under the law. I care what the law says, and I will continue to abide by the law and the Constitution of the United States. That is the oath I took in 1993 and which I affirm to you today. I do care what our longstanding practices are because they are time-tested and crafted to ensure that our work is guided by professionalism and not partisanship, guided by standards that apply in Democratic administrations and Republican administrations. I will close by saying this. In my four and a half years in Washington, I have asked for independent counsels on several occasions and required additional matters, or referred additional matters to them at least twice more. I have done so whenever the facts and the law said I should. On other occasion, I have declined to do so. On those occasions, the law did not call for the appointment of an independent counsel. On each occasion, I acted deliberately after thorough analysis. Each time I worked with career prosecutors, agents, and the senior staff of the FBI and the department to separate the facts from the hype. Each time I carefully reviewed the evidence before making a decision. And each time my decision was based on the facts and the law and nothing else. That's not going to change. We may disagree on the law. We may disagree on our construction of the facts. We may differ on the significance of a piece of evidence. That's what honest public debate is all about. In the end, Congress made the Attorney General responsible for these decisions. That is what the American people expect. Now, under the law, every decision I will make will be based only on the facts in the law. That is what the American people expect and deserve, and it is the only way that I can uphold the very precious oath that I have taken to the American people that I shall bear a true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States, so help me God. Thank you very much. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Ms. Reno. As so often is the case, uh, we received last night, yet again, another late production of White House documents. Uh, we were told that uh, the White House learned of these Uh, start the clock, please. Mr. Lantos uh, was aware that the clock hadn't started. Anyhow, last night uh, we received a production, a late production of White House documents. We're told that the White House learned of these in early November, yet it took over a month to disclose those documents. Uh, White House spokesman Lanny Davis has claimed that you had those documents before December 2nd when you made your decision. Uh, is that correct, and did you have all the documents? I don't know whether 
if this is the material just furnished to me, we had all of these documents, but I'll be happy to check and see what we had and when we got them and let you know, Mr. Chairman. Well, we'd like to provide those uh, to you for the record, and if you could let us know, we'd appreciate that. Yes, sir. Are you concerned, as uh, we are uh, with the White House response to subpoenas, I sent a subpoena in March for uh, videotapes, audio tapes, and any documents relating to this investigation, and uh, we keep getting them dribbling in. We got more yesterday. And are you confident that your subpoenas have been responded to? I have expressed my concern in the past, and we continue to do everything we can to make sure that there is full disclosure. But are you concerned about the slowness with which the White House has been responding to our subpoenas and yours? Uh, as I say, I have expressed my concern. Thank you. Are you confident uh, that uh, you have received all relevant information from the Democrat National Committee? Again, I want to do everything I can to make sure that there has been full disclosure and we will continue that effort. One of the things that I have discovered, Mr. Chairman, is the, the new mystery of the computer and what the computer can and can't produce and what can be stored and isn't stored on hard drive and soft drive. And so we continue to pursue that angle as well as any other possible angle that we can to make sure that there's full production. The problem, Ms. Reno, is that uh, these documents uh, were subpoenaed uh, by you and us and others uh, almost a year ago, and uh, we still don't have all the documents. You don't have, I mean, I, I assume that you don't have all the documents, and isn't this of uh, some concern to you that it's taking that long? I mean, this could drag on for years. What I have mention, Mr. Chairman, is that I don't know whether I have all of these or not, but we will check and let you know. With respect to my concern, as I have said on a previous occasion, I was mad at one point, really mad. Uh, who advised you regarding your decision in appointing an independent counsel? Lawyers in the Department of Justice, Director Free, and l lawyers who are on the task force. Uh, did uh, Chief of Staff John Hogan or Bob Litt uh, participate in that decision? Again, what I would suggest to you, Mr. Chairman, is that I want the people who advise me to make sure that they can talk without having to disclose their thought process since I am the one that is responsible for this decision well, okay, and well, I'm the one where the buck stops. I understand, but let me just say that uh, Mr. Hogan and Mr. Litt, they're both uh, politicals, political appointees. And uh, Mr. Lee Reddick uh, was appointed to head up the public integrity section by Mr. Clinton. D did they advise you on this decision? Again, I am not going to discuss who advised me. I think it is important that they be able to talk freely and openly with me because the decision is mine. Now, I understand, Ms. Attorney General, but the, the, the reason I'm asking that is because uh, this is a very important investigation. And you as Attorney General, uh, if you're relying upon the judgment of people who have a political interest in the decisions, uh, then we're, we're concerned that your decision might be swayed one way or the other by politics and not by legal uh, uh, issues. I have relied on senior officials in the Department of Justice, both politically appointed and otherwise. I have uh, re relied on decisions made by an, a number of people, but it is my decision with respect to the independent counsel. Mr. I'm the one that has to explain it. I understand. Mr. Radick has said that uh, he, he thought uh, that the independent counsel statute uh, is an insult, and he now heads up the independent, uh, the, uh, the uh, public integrity section. Uh, did he have any voice in this? Again, I, the d decision is mine. The voice is mine. Was uh, Director Free uh, in the room when you made your decision? As I talked to Director Free, I explained to him that I had uh, struggled with the opinion, the decision overnight. I talked with him. Uh, I can't tell you precisely when I made the decision, whether he was in the room or not, because I had... You cannot imagine, Mr. Chairman, how much time and much effort and much thought I give to this. I wake up in the middle of the night trying to think of every new angle. I come up with a new idea and I come to the office and try to have it explored. I talk to Director Free before I make a final decision. I understand. I probably don't make the decision till I put my name on the paper 
just to make sure that I try to consider every aspect, and I don't think he was in the room when I put my name on the paper. I, I understand, and, and the next time you're up at 3 or 4 in the morning, call me, because I'll be up too. Uh, your recent independent council decision was based solely uh, on the phone calls made by the president and the vice president. Is that correct? With respect to the president and the vice president, of course, Secretary O'Leary's issue was different. In, uh, in fact, Vice President Gore has been quoted uh, that he has been vindicated and he's glad it's over. But you've not closed down any lines of inquiry regarding the vice president, have you? I have been very explicit and was explicit when I made the statement because I saw some statements from Congress that indicated that they thought I would be closing it down. I've made the statement that no one is exonerated, I'm not closing it down, and I'm going to continue to follow every lead. Thank you. Uh, your decision didn't have anything to do with uh, anyone's knowledge at the White House or the DNC with respect to illegal foreign money coming into the, uh, the DNC then. Your decision regarding this independent counsel at this time didn't the have anything. The notification spells out the, the issue that we focused on and the issue that triggered the preliminary investigation. Uh, the matter to which you refer was not included in this preliminary investigation. Ms. Reno, in this matter, we have had over 65 people, 65 people that have taken the Fifth Amendment, many of them friends of the President, or flee the country. Have you ever experienced so many unavailable witnesses in any matter that you prosecuted? I've never prosecuted a matter like this. I've never investigated a matter like this, and so I haven't seen a situation like this. 65 people, many friends of the president, taking the Fifth Amendment, hiding under their Fifth Amendment rights, fleeing the country so they can't be discussed. Uh, I can't, can't discuss comment again. on your investigation, Mr. Chairman. All I can tell you is in my investigation, I've never handled one like this, so I've not seen one like okay. this. Okay. Does it concern you that the number of these individuals who have taken the Fifth Amendment or fled the country are close associates or friends of the president? Mr. Chairman, I would not comment on continuing matters that the task force is pursuing because that again lays out the road map for what I am doing or not doing. Now totally apart from the mandatory sections that trigger the independent counsel statute, there's a section in the independent counsel law that allows you to appoint an independent counsel when you have conflicts in pursuing a case, is that correct? It says that if there is, uh, if I have specific and credible information about a non-covered person, the investigation of whom would create a conflict of interest, I may seek the appointment of an independent counsel. So you could, in this case, seek an independent counsel if you so choose. If I felt it was triggered. And that's Section 592 of the statute. Don't that, you don't need to look it up. That is Section 592 of the statute. In 1993, when you spoke in the, favor the of... The specific is... 591C that provides for the discretionary conflict. I believe it also is 592, but that's uh, we won't quibble about that. In uh, 1993, when you spoke in favor of the independent counsel statute, uh, you said, and I quote, the role of declining to prosecute a high government official is, I suggest, as important a goal of the independent counsel process as any prosecution. The credibility and public confidence engendered by the fact that an independent and impartial outsider has examined the evidence and has concluded that the prosecution is not warranted serves to clear a public official's name in a way that no Justice Department investigation ever could. This was on May 14, 1993. By keeping this investigation in political hands instead of an independent counsel's, aren't you undermining public confidence in this investigation? I don't think so, sir, because if it w if it's pursued according to the independent counsel statute provisions, it assumes, and the independent counsel statute presumes, and Congress presumed that there was a conflict of interest with respect to the covered persons. But it also provided that there must be spe specific and credible information against the covered person, as well as against a person for whom a discretionary conflict might arise. We try to review each matter to determine whether there's specific and credible information and make a judgment accordingly. If you otherwise did not, and Congress talks in its legislative history about not lowering the threshold too much, otherwise I would suggest that you have the fear of an independent counsel statute being a, triggered on any occasion. 
regardless well, of whether the evidence is sufficient to trigger it. I, I understand uh, your reasoning, although I, I take issue with it. But it is correct that you could petition to appoint an independent counsel under the law, if you so chose. If I believe that there was a conflict. In fact, Mr. Free, in his memo, do you recommend an independent counsel and a course of action which is entirely in keeping with the spirit and the letter of the independent counsel statute, isn't it? Again, I have, Director Free and I have suggested to you in our letter why it would not be appropriate to discuss the details of that memorandum. But there was logic and, and legal reasons why in his letter. You don't have to give us the contents, but there were logical and le legal reasons why he thought an independent counsel uh, was warranted. Director Free, as I understand it, will in his statement tell you that he thought an independent counsel was warranted. But there were legal and reasonable reasons why he suggested that. I mean, he must have researched it. I mean, you, I'm sure you may have, you disagreed, obviously. I disagreed with but, him. But weren't there legal reasons and, and logical reasons why he thought an independent counsel was necessary? I mean, was he off the wall or what? If it were Louis Free, he would make one decision. If it's me, I think another decision is reasonable. I'm talking about the basis, Madam Ms. Reno. Uh, but in basis. determining whether a conflict exists, it's not Director Free's conflict, it's mine. So it was a conflict that he was talking about in his letter? Again, if the issue is conflict, it's my conflict. I know, but you just alluded to that part of his letter by saying... Do you have the letter, Mr. Chairman? If you've got the letter, then we, we no, won't but, worry but, about but, it. But you just alluded to something that was in the letter, and that was a conflict, so we now, now at least have that. No, sir, you asked about a conflict, I, and I, I don't know what you're reading from, but you specifically asked about a conflict, and I simply responded by pointing out to you that if it is, the issue is a conflict, it's not Louis Fries, it's mine. Well, I'll, I'll reread the question, and you'll see if I said anything about a conflict. In fact, Mr. Free, in his memo, do you recommend an independent counsel on a course of action which is entirely keeping with the spirit and letter of the independent counsel statute, isn't it? It says nothing about conflict. You're the one that said that. That's why I raised that issue. Didn't Director Free present... Does the independent counsel statute give anybody a course of action other than by virtue of a conflict? No. Okay, sir. Yeah, but, Thank the, you. but the point is you raised that, but we, we won't quibble. Didn't Director Free present a case based on the law and facts for an independent counsel? Director Free, as I have told you, Mr. Chairman, I want the people around me to be able to talk freely, voluntarily, and openly. I don't think that I should say what people who work with me volunteer when the decision has to be mine. Okay. I am responsible for it. Do you think Director Free presented an unconstitutional interpretation of the law that would be struck down if you were to follow his recommendations? I would not comment on what Director Free said to me. Well, that's not, I mean, I don't understand. How is this going to jeopardize your investigation if you comment on the constitutionality of his position in the letter? Mr. That has nothing to do with the investigation. Mr. Chairman, if I have a conference room, and there are so many occasions where I have had lawyers from all parts of the Justice Department around the table in that conference room, I think that they know that they can speak openly, with candor, with good give and take. And sometimes there are eight lawyers there, and there are eight different opinions. I don't want those lawyers to feel that every time they give me their best and most candid advice, they're going to be hauled before a congressional committee to discuss well, that, an ongoing investigation. That, that is not my question. Let me read it to you again. Do you think Director Free presented an unconstitutional interpretation of the law that would be struck down if you were to follow his recommendation? I give you the same answer, sir. I think that I have a responsibility to make the decision and to not comment on the opinions given to me in the deliberation process with respect to ongoing matters. So this committee in the Congress does not have a right to know whether or not you thought that his recommendation was constitutional. If you have a right to know about these matters, then you have a right to know everything. If, if the president asked, well, but we're not talking about things that might be redacted or should be redacted that are before grand jury or any evidence that would lead to a criminal indictment. We're not talking about that. We're trying to find out why that decision was made 
and about I'll tell you why the decision was made. Well, but why you, there's this difference between you and the attorney or the FBI director and whether or not you thought his recommendation was unconstitutional. I'll tell you why the decision was made. Because you wanted to make it and you made it. No, I made the decision because the Congress of the United States provides that it is the Attorney General who will make the decision. I considered the information from everyone, and the reason I made the decision is contained in the notification filed with the Special Division. If the President asked you to appoint an independent counsel, would you do so? It would depend on the circumstances. Well, isn't that what you did when you appointed a special counsel in the Whitewater matter? I mean, after all, you opposed it for a long time until the president gave his approval. As I indicated on a number of occasions in that instance, the Congress had not reenacted the independent counsel statute. It had, uh, what do you call it, lapsed or sunsetted. And so we were in an interim period where there was no independent <laughs> counsel statute. Okay. You're aware in 1986 that President Reagan called for an independent counsel in the Iran-Contra matter even though there were not any covered persons involved, uh, and he did so in the public interest. You're aware of that? No, sir, I'm not. You're not aware of the Iran-Contra? No, I am aware of Iran-Contra. I'm don't. not aware of what uh, President Reagan did. Well, it was public, publicly disclosed. It was in all the papers. You just didn't read that. I may well have read it. Don't remember. Okay. Do you recall that in 1993 you stated that the Iran-Contra investigation could not have been conducted under the supervision, supervision of the Attorney General and concluded with any public confidence in his thoroughness or impartiality? You said you didn't know about it, but in 1993 you commented about it. I don't know what I, I... I'm well aware of the investigation. What I am not aware of was, or have no recollection of, is President Reagan's calling for the appointment of one. But you recall this comment that you made in 1993? Yes, I do. Okay. And do you, you, do you stand by that comment? It, yes, and I, I do. I'll read it again. It says, could no, you... No, you don't have to. I stand well, by Well, let it. me read it one more time, anyhow, okay. for my own edification. That the Iran-Contra investigation, quote, could not have been conducted under the supervision of the Attorney General and concluded with any public confidence in his thoroughness or impartiality. And you stand by that? Mm -hmm. Oliver North was not a covered person. That's correct. And yet he, they appointed an independent counsel because they thought that there was the appearance of a conflict. Isn't, it, isn't public confidence in investigations of high-ranking public officials the main rationale of the independent counsel statute? I think there is a considerable history, and I would refer you to it. Wasn't the statute enacted to provide public confidence in prosecutions and declinations to prosecute high-level public officials? I think that's certainly one of the reasons. Well, when you supported a special counsel and then an independent counsel in the Whitewater matter, didn't you do so at least in part because the McDougals were friends of the President and the First Lady? They had a business relationship with the President and the First Lady. Well, they were, they were friends. I think, of, I, I think, again, I spelled it out in the referral. But it was because of the, the provision that we, we've been discussing here today. I do not have the language with me, but I would refer you to the notification to the court. Didn't you say it would be an inherent conflict for you to investigate the Whitewater uh, matter? If you would get the exact language of the notification, we can be more accurate. Well, I believe that's, that's what was said. Ms. Reno, isn't this the first time that Director Free found himself trying to maintain the integrity of the FBI? Pardon me. Okay. I'll read this quote to you. The circumstances of this matter call for the appointment of an independent counsel. Because the investigation by the Department of Justice of the allegations of violations of criminal law by James B. McDougall and other individuals associated with President and Mrs. Reagan would present a political Clinton. conflict of interest. You, were you said Reagan. Oh, pardon me, President Clinton would present a political conflict of interest. I hereby request that the court appoint Robert B. Fisk, Jr. so that he may continue his ongoing investigation without disruption and with the full independence provided by the act. So you thought there was a conflict uh, because of the McDougal's ties to the president. I mean, that's your quote. That's correct. Now, Ms. Reno, isn't this the first time that Director Free found himself trying to maintain the integrity of the FBI's investigation as a result of a Washington Post story back in February on the Chinese connection? White House Counsel Charles Ruff requested documents from the Justice Department. 
Director Free voiced strong reservations about giving the White House intelligence information that might tip off the White House to the investigation. Yet, despite Mr. Free's opposition, attempts were made by the Department of Justice and you to send certain information to the White House. While Director Free was out of the country in Egypt, White House and DOG political appointees forced FBI agents to provide the information Free had objected to. FBI agents had to call the FBI director in Egypt to prevent this material from being sent to the White House. It was only uh, FBI Director Free's 11th hour call from the Middle East which prevented this information from being forwarded to the White House, which was very sensitive. Do you recall that? No. What I do recall is that I said, what does Louis think? They said, he's in Cairo. He won't be available till the next morning. I said, get him as fast as you can because I want to talk to him before I make a decision. Well, I want to, uh, I had some personal involvement in this and investigated it. And I talked personally to the people at the FBI. And they, but you didn't talk to me. Well, I and know, you but didn't I want you talk to, to Director Free, and you weren't in the room when I talked to I Director talk Free. I did talk to Director Free. And I you, did talk to Director Free, so let me finish. Okay. What happened was, according to the people I talked to, was that Louis Free told the people, the, your chief of staff, that this information should not be given to the White House in his opinion. He left and went to Egypt after giving that advice, and after he left for Egypt and was there, his chief deputy was summoned to the uh, Justice Department and was told that that information must be given to them. He then came over to the Justice Department and gave that information, and on his way back in the car, he said to an associate, I'm not sure we should have given that information to the Justice Department without having first talked to Louis. They called Louis in Egypt, and then Louis called you immediately and said that he didn't think that information should be given to the, to the, uh, to the White House, and then you didn't give it to them. I think the best thing... I can't hear you, Madam uh, Attorney General. I think General. the best thing to do rather than then get into this hassle is have Director Free come up and let's talk about it. I will ask Director Free about this later, but I will just tell you that the, story, the information we have it does not jive with what you just told us. Well, since you weren't there, I can understand it might not. And since you haven't asked me about it before this and have already reached a judgment, I can understand it why it might not. But I talked to the FBI people. I talked to the FBI people what who I would involved directly. If you want to talk to the FBI people, let's bring Director Mr. Free Chairman, Mr. Chairman, why don't we let the FBI director answer the question which has just been Regular raised. order, Mr. Chairman. Director Free, we will ask him that question when he comes before the committee later. And don't interrupt the Attorney General. Regular Let's order, finish Mr. Your Chairman. Answers. Regular order. I have the time. You'll That's have what your, I'm asking you'll for. Have your Regular order. You'll have your time later. What I would say, Mr. Chairman, is to try to get to the truth of it all, you should hear from the people involved. We're both here. And with, with, with I refer you to your inquiry of Director Free at the time because I can tell you, since you've never talked to me about it before, I'm the one that talked to him. I'm the one that had to wait overnight till he, we could find him in Cairo on a stew phone. And I know what I talked to him about, and I know the decision that I made. I understand and that's that. And I understand what, that you did make that decision. But the thing that I disagree with and the information that I have that contradicts that is that the FBI associate of Mr. Free talked to him on the way back from the Justice Department and said, we'd better talk to Louis about this. He called Louis Free, and then Louis Free initiated the call back to you. Mr. Chairman, I have a parliamentary inquiry. Uh, suspend the time. The gentleman will state his parliamentary inquiry. Would you entertain a motion to re or would a motion to reconsider uh, the placing of Mr. Free at the table with Ms. Reno? Would that be the, timely the, the at this time? The committee's already voted on that. We will not reconsider it at this time. Mr. Chairman, my question is, would it, would it be appropriate? I'm, my question is, under the rules, the, when... There, you're not when, stating a valid point of order. My, my, my question you're is, when would it be appropriate for a motion for reconsideration? No. No, no. When would it be appropriate for a motion for reconsideration? We have already voted on it, and I don't think... No, a, we have not voted on a motion for reconsideration. What I'm asking you is, when would it be appropriate to consider a motion for reconsideration. That motion failed on a 12 to 12 vote. It is my understanding of the rules that on a tie vote, any member can move for reconsideration, and I would like to move for reconsideration. My question to you, Mr. Chairman, is when would that motion be appropriate? When would you entertain that motion? I'm advised by uh, counsel that uh, only a member who voted for the motion uh, can move to reconsider. And uh, we will. We, we all know that 
We all voted for it, yeah. Mr. Well, Chairman. I, we Mr. Chairman, I did vote for it, so I would move that we would reconsider that We will that entertain vote. that at the conclusion of my, uh, of my uh, questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Now, uh, with respect to Webster Hubble, uh, Madam Attorney General, don't you believe you would have an inherent conflict investigating matters regarding uh, Mr. Hubble, who was your number three Justice Department official and ran the Department of Justice with you in 1993 and 1994? I don't know what you mean by inherent conflict. It would depend on the circumstances, sir. Well, you said he was a friend, and, and you, when he was uh, about to uh, be indicted and left the Justice Department, you indicated you, you didn't think he was, uh, was uh, guilty or had done anything wrong, and he was a paragon of virtue. And if you want me to, I'll read exactly what you said about him. I don't know whether I called him a paragon. Well, but you made some pretty strong statements. Uh, I did saying, indeed, sir. Yes. But in any event, did you, do you think that there was a, a conflict or would be a conflict of you investigating his relationship with a number of the principals involved in this investigation and or the president? It would depend on the circumstances, sir. In other words, uh, Webb Hubble, who was a friend of, uh, uh, who, who received $100,000 from the Riottis, the Lippel Group, after 10 meetings at the White House involving the president of the United States, James Riotti, John Wong, uh, and uh, Webb Hubble, uh, you don't think uh, that those three, many of whom uh, have, are being investigated for large sums of money being illegally funneled into the DNC and to the President's Re-Election Committee and to the President's Legal Defense Fund, you don't believe that there might be a conflict of you investigating him? What I have said, sir, is that as we continue investigations, I cannot discuss them, but if at any time the statute is triggered, I will do so. I, I, I know, but I, I, what I can't understand is why you can't give us an answer about whether or not you think, because of your relationship with Webb Hubble at the Justice Department, because of his relationship with the President, his golfing buddy and longtime friend, because of his relationship and employment by the Riottis who have fled the country, James and Mokhtar Riotti, because of his ties to Charlie Tree, because of his ties to John Wong, who's taken the Fifth Amendment, whom you, your department, almost, I don't believe, has even contacted, you don't think there's a conflict? The issue is, sir, whether there's specific and credible information against a person that relates to CAMCON. There are also matters that other independent counsel, another independent counsel is reviewing. I cannot discuss these, and I cannot discuss how an ongoing investigation, either by me or by, another in, by an independent counsel, is being conducted. Now, let me just make a comment then. I think on its face, the American people would think that there would be a conflict of interest. And for that reason, in order for there to be a fair and impartial investigation of this whole mess, there ought to be a person appointed as an independent counsel who has no ax to grind, who has no ties to Webb Hubble or John Wong or to the president or anybody else so we can get to the bottom of it. And for you to keep hiding behind this saying, well, you'll consider it, I, I think is a, a derelict of your responsibility. Mr. I'm not hiding, Mr. Chairman. I am trying to do my duty under the independent counsel statute and under the law to conduct an investigation in a professional way, taking it wherever it leads me, and I will continue to do so. I also have an obligation under the independent counsel statute to trigger it in certain situations, and I have the discretion in others. And in each instance, I have asked for an independent counsel on at least four occasions. I have referred other matters. I have used the discretionary provision. I have demonstrated an ability to do it. But I am going to do it based on what I understand the evidence and the law to be. You said earlier that you had the ability and the authority under Section 591 or 2 of the statute to appoint an independent counsel if you felt that there was a conflict. You said that earlier in your testimony. I said something else, too, sir. If there was the specific and credible information against a non-covered person, the investigation of whom I felt created a conflict. Well, that same situation occurred in Iran-Contra. And the Attorney General, Ed Meese, at that time said, even though Ollie North was not a covered person, in order for there not to be any appearance or question about propriety, that he would appoint an independent counsel. And the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, concurred. Here we have you saying, you're going to take care of it yourself, even though there is an apparent, in many of our minds, maybe not your mind, there's an apparent conflict of interest that's visible to most people in America, I believe. And as a result, 
You just continue to say, uh, I'm going to handle it. I don't see any conflict. I don't see any problem. So we're going to, going to, to, to proceed ahead. I just don't, and the president, of course, is not saying anything. What I have indicated previously and have indicated and will indicate here is that the legislative history as we read it of the independent counsel statute as it has been reenacted does not provide for an independent counsel when there's an appearance of conflict. There must be an actual conflict. Well, does it trouble you at all that a number of your Democrat colleagues like Mr. Carter and Senator Moynihan and others feel that you should appoint an independent counsel? Does it trouble you at all that there's that big difference? Or Trouble is not the word, I think, Mr. Chairman. What I strive to do is to listen to everyone who has an opinion that's based on the evidence and the law. When people start talking to me about polls, I say forget it. I'm not talking when about When they ta start talking to me about how many editorials have been written me about me, I say forget it. I try to do it, and one of the people, for example, that I talk to is Director Free. Okay. I listen to others. I have appeared before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Senator Feingold has given me his thoughts on it, and I have tried to take those into consideration. Oh. But it's not Senator Feingold's decision. It's not President Carter's decision. It's mine. And one of the problems I have, Mr. Chairman, is that if I had to please everybody well, and make sure that everybody agreed with me, we'd never get anything done. Well, my time's running out, and I want to get one more thing in the record here, and I'll, I'll uh, grant you an extra 30 seconds if we have to, because I think this is important. I want to read to you. June 20th, 1994. John Wong called Mark Middleton and asked for a meeting for June 21st, 1994. June 21st, 1994, John Wong and James Riotti were cleared into the White House twice. 4.45 p.m. They met with Mark Middleton, who was then working in the office of the White House Chief of Staff. 6.50 p.m. They went to a White House reception on the South Lawn hosted by the President. The next day, June 22nd, John Wong and James Riotti again met with Mark Middleton in the White House. June 23rd, Riotti had a breakfast meeting with Webb Hubble, who at this time was under investigation by the Independent Council. June 23rd, after breakfast, Riotti, accompanied by John Wong, returned to the White House to meet with President Clinton. June 23rd, after this meeting, Riotti returned to his hotel room at the Hay Adams and placed two calls to Indonesia and then placed calls to the White House Chief of Staff's office where Middleton worked. He also called Webb Hubble. 10.01, first called Indonesia. 10 a.m., second, 10.02, second called Indonesia. 11.04, called to Webb Hubble. 11.05, called to the White House Chief of Staff's office. June 23rd, Riotti had lunch with Webb Hubble at the Hay Adams Hotel one block from the White House. June 24th, Wong and Riotti went back to the White House for another meeting with Mark Middleton. June 24th, Mark Middleton, John Wong, and members of Riotti's family had lunch in the White House mess. June 24th, Riotti, Riotti met, met again with Webb Hubble. June 25th, Riotti, John Wong, Mark Middleton attended the President's weekly radio address. June 27th, a Lippo company, Hong Kong China Limited, paid Webb Hubble $100,000. July 2nd, President Clinton calls Webb Hubble at his home at 10.16 p.m. July, July 1994, John Wong, a principal with the Lippo Group who gave $100,000 to Mr. Hubble, goes to work as Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Department of Commerce. In February 1995, Mark Middleton left the White House to start his own business specializing in Asian business affairs. And uh, you don't think there's any conflicts with any of these people and their ties to the President and, uh, and, and, and your investigation? Again, I am conducting the investigation based on what I understand the evidence and the law to be. At this point, I have not triggered the independent counsel statute, except as I have previously indicated to you. Thank you, Madam. But I will tell you this. I just wish I could tell you everything that I was doing and that the task force is doing in trying to pursue allegations. The impression is that we're not doing anything but the fact is, we are, and we're going to continue to pursue every lead till we get to where it takes us. Our committee Mr. will Chairman. continue its investigation as well. I now yield to uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, for a motion. Yes, gentlemen from... Mr. Chairman, based on your statements, I would move that we reconsider the vote upon which um, the request was made to have Mr. Free and Ms. Reno appear at the same time. And if that is not, that is not requested, I would have an alternative motion. 
you, you'll have to forgive me, my parliamentarian uh, evidently misspoke. He said a, a motion to reconsider must be made by a member who was on the prevailing side of the vote, and that would be a member on our side of the aisle. I would have an alternative motion then, Mr. Chairman. Is, uh, I don't see any member who wants to reconsider on our side. Now, what's but your alternative motion? My alternative motion? motion is based on the statements of, of Ms. Reno and Mr. Free. Rather than having Mr. Free give his formal testimony at this time, I would move that he be permitted to answer questions um, that pertain to statements purportedly made by him. That's the rule on the floor. That's not a motion that's, uh, that we can entertain at this time. Why is that, Mr. Chairman? It, it's not a regular motion under the rules of the committee or the House. Mr. Lantos, you're recognized for 30 minutes. Mr. Chairman, I would appeal the ruling of the chair. The gentleman appeals the ruling of the chair. All those in favor of the ruling of the chair signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed to the ruling of the chair signify by saying no. 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 The the chairman, opinion, I ask for roll call. Request recorded request a roll call. Ask for a roll call. Roll call has been ordered. Roll call will be granted. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burton? No. Mr. Burton votes no. Mr. Gilman? No. Mr. Gilman votes no. Mr. Hastert? Mrs. Morella? Mrs. Morella votes no. Mr. Shays? Mr. Schiff, Mr. Cox, Mr. Cox votes no, Ms. Ross Layton, Mr. McHugh, Mr. Horn, Mr. Horn votes no, Mr. Micah, Mr. Micah votes no, Mr. Davis of Virginia, Mr. McIntosh, Mr. Souter, Mr. Scarborough, Mr. Shattuck, no. Mr. Shattuck votes no, Mr. La Tourette, Mr. Sanford, Mr. Sununu, Mr. Sessions, Mr. Pappas, Mr. Snowbarger? No. Mr. Snowbarger votes no. Mr. Barr? No. Mr. Barr votes no. Mr. Miller? No. Mr. Miller votes no. Mr. Waxman? Mr. Lantos? Aye. Mr. Lantos votes aye. Mr. Wise? Mr. Owens, Mr. Towns, Mr. Kanjorski, aye. Mr. Kanjorski votes aye. Mr. Condent, <coughs> Mr. Sanders, aye. Mr. Sanders votes aye. Mrs. Maloney, aye. Mrs. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Barrett? Mr. Barrett votes aye. Ms. Norton? Aye. Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Fatah? Aye. Mr. Fatah votes aye. Mr. Cummings? Aye. Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Kucinich? Yes. Mr. Kucinich votes yes. Mr. Bogloyevich? Aye. Mr. Bogloyevich votes aye. Mr. Davis of Illinois? Mr. Tierney? Mr. Tierney votes yes. Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes aye. Mr. Allen? Mr. Allen votes aye. Mr. Ford? Mr. Hastert? Mr. Shays? 
Mr. Schiff? Ms. Ross Layton? Ms. Ross Layton votes no. Mr. McHugh? Mr. Davis of Virginia? No. Mr. Davis of Virginia votes no. Mr. McIntosh? No. Mr. McIntosh votes no. Mr. Souter? Mr. Scarborough? Mr. LaTourette? Mr. Sanford? Mr. Sununu? Mr. Sessions? Mr. Pappas? Mr. Waxman? Mr. Wise? Mr. Owens? Mr. Towns? Mr. Condent? Mr. Davis of Illinois? Mr. Ford? Mr. Hastert? Mr. Shays? Mr. Schiff? Uh, the clerk has called the roll twice. I think that's sufficient unless somebody has objection. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. How's Mr. LaTourette recorded? Mr. LaTourette is not recorded. Mr. LaTourette votes no. Clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, there are 13 ayes and 14 nays. The motion uh, is uh, defeated. Uh, Mr. Lantos, you're recognized for 30 minutes. Mr. Chairman, before I begin my questioning, I respectfully suggest, since our distinguished Attorney General has been on the witness stand for over two hours, we take a five-minute recess as a matter of elementary courtesy. I'm, I'm fine. I know, Even but I think... Some of the members might not be. <laughs> I don't think it will be inappropriate to take a five-minute recess. The chair point. declares a recess for five minutes. Do you want to stay or do you want to go back? Five minutes. Sorry for you, uh, reporters down there. You must be getting leg cramps. Uh, have to start doing deep knee bends to get in shape. Yeah. Would uh, we clear the aisles, please, and uh, close the doors? Can we get the people in the aisles to, to either leave the room or sit down? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and let me welcome our distinguished Attorney General. It seems that Mr. Burton and some of my colleagues on the other side are fixated on the notion that since the President appoints you to your job, by definition, you are incapable of conducting an investigation that involves the president. And leaving aside the issue that, of course, the law clearly gives you the sole authority to determine whether you call for an independent counsel attorney general. So if we have any quarrel with that law, we should amend that law or repeal it but not harass and badger the Attorney General for following the law. 
I would like to sort of speculate on this alleged conflict of interest. A few weeks ago, Mr. Burton alleged on national television that the White House had altered the videotapes it was providing to congressional investigators. Since that time, White House career military employees testified under oath that the tapes were not altered. Senator Thompson stated on television just this past weekend that he thoroughly investigated that matter and, and concluded that the tapes had not been altered. And when at our last hearing Mr. Burton was asked to produce any evidence to support his unsubstantiated allegation, he was unable to produce a single shred of evidence. But if my colleagues on the other side of the aisle really believe that you lack the integrity and judgment to determine whether or not a frivolous allegation is true, under that interpretation, whatever allegation is made concerning the president or the vice president, you would have to disqualify yourself because you are incapable of making a judgment concerning the validity of the claim. It, it seems to me that this absurd interpretation would mean that when allegations are leveled against a member of Congress, for instance, you would immediately need to appoint an independent counsel. A lobbyist alleged that Mr. Burton tried to extort campaign funds from him. Mr. Burton's favorite newspaper, the New York Times, reported that he solicited an invitation to the Pebble Beach Golf Tournament sponsored by AT&T at a time when AT&T had pending business before this committee. The Hill, the publication here on Capitol Hill, reported that Mr. Burton accepted illegal campaign contributions from tax-exempt religious institutions. Well, it seems that you are capable of conducting an investigation with respect to the president, with respect to the vice president, members of the cabinet, members of Congress. And the notion that we have heard ad nauseum this morning is that somehow the inherent conflict, by virtue of your appointment to your position by the president, makes it impossible for you to be objective and conduct an independent investigation, leads me to explore the history of your relationship to the president. So may I ask a few specific questions? How well did you know President Clinton before you were appointed Attorney General? I had never met him. I had only met Mrs. Clinton briefly. You had never met the president prior to your... Until I met with him, I think it was the night of February 9th, prior to his nomination of me on February the 11th. So it's probably fair to say, on the basis of your testimony, that you are not long-time friends. That's correct. Now, since you have served as a member of his cabinet, how close has been your social relationship? Have, do, would you consider yourself one of President Clinton's confidants? Are you, are you frequently participating in the various social activities of the President and the First Lady? Do you, do you consider yourself a close personal friend or confidant of the President? No, I do not, and I do not socialize with them. How about the Vice President? What has been the extent of your personal relationship with uh, Mrs. Gore and the Vice President? How close 
is your social relationship? How frequent is that relationship? I, I had not met the vice president before the day that I was nominated, and I had only met Mrs. Gore briefly. I would characterize my relationship with them as the same as with the president. But in deference to the chairman, I'd really like to make clear what my position is. Under the Independent Counsel Act, no matter how well or how little I know the president, I am required to trigger the Independent Counsel statute, provided and there is, I have no discretion on that, but what I have to do is to make a judgment as to whether the evidence is specific and credible to indicate that there may have been a violation of federal law. That's the, the decision I have to make, and it doesn't, when it goes to the president and vice president who are covered persons, it, I don't have discretion. I've got to do it. When I reach that threshold, and from my reading of the history of the independent counsel statute, Congress put that threshold there so that everything was not referred, that might anything that was frivolous would not trigger the statute. I've, I very much appreciate your, your elaborating on this point. Let me ask specifically, has the president or the vice president put any pressure on you directly, indirectly, through others, with respect to the question of appointing an independent counsel? None whatsoever. Your testimony under oath, Madam Attorney General, is that there has been no attempt by the President or the Vice President to influence your decision with respect to this matter. That's correct, sir. Um, may I ask, and I apologize for the personal nature of this question, but I think it's necessary given the context. Are you expecting, after you conclude your very distinguished tenure as Attorney General, to look perhaps for an ambassadorial appointment or another high-level appointment by this administration um, that might influence your objectivity and independence with respect to this issue? No, sir, I'm not. I'm looking to getting in my truck and going across the country and seeing all the places that I haven't had a chance to really explore. Well, if and when that time comes, and we all hope it will be a long time in the future, we all will wish you well. But I think it was important to underscore these items because the sickeningly persistent innuendo, Madam Attorney General, that you are protecting your old friend Bill Clinton and your old friend Al Gore because of your close personal relationship with them or because of your political aspirations in the future had to be put to rest. You are, without question, one of the most nonpartisan, non-political public servants in a highly politicized city. And we are all enormously fortunate to have you uh, in the position as Attorney General. Let me raise a question concerning the release of um, FBI Director Free's memorandum to you. I read the letter that you jointly sent to Mr. Burton I wonder if you would care to elaborate on the reasons why you feel this request was inappropriate and why it would in fact interfere with an ongoing criminal investigation. As I said at the outset, Congressman Lantos, I very much respect and think that, and I think the oversight function is very important. I want to try to work with everybody concerned to make sure that, that we honor that function and that responsibility of Congress. But when it relates to a pending investigation or a pending prosecution, that becomes a very difficult line to, to walk. And it is important for three reasons. One, the responsibility for investigation and prosecution lies within the executive branch. 
We've got to present it in the court. We've got to do what's right. And having been a prosecutor come January the 20th, it will be for 20 years in my life, it is sometimes a very difficult decision, but it is one that is an important decision for the American people. It is terribly important that politics not be a part of it. Thus, I think in, in this instance, it is really important that we pursue this just based on the evidence and the law. If I were to disclose what we were planning to do or what was being suggested in an investigation, and the roadmap was out there for all the people who were the subject of the investigation to see, nobody with common sense would suggest that that's a good idea. You don't tell the, the people you're investigating how you're going to investigate them. Secondly, as I have said on a number of occasions, it is very important for me to make sure that my subordinates in the Department of Justice know that they can speak freely to me, that I'm the one that's going to be responsible for the decision that the buck stops with me and that they can speak freely and openly and that I don't want yes people around me. And I can say proudly I haven't had yes people around me because I sure get different views on a lot of occasions. If Congress can come in to a pending investigation and say we want to know all about it, that creates a real issue of Congress who has other responsibilities, not those of investigation and prosecution for the determination of whether a crime has been committed, that, that creates a, a situation where you have an, an outside influence in an investigation where just in the history of this nation and the, our checks and balances and the separation of the different branches of government, it just doesn't hold up. And thus, I know it's frustrating for the chairman to have me say, well, that's a... A little frustration that. won't hurt him, Madam Attorney General. Well, I don't know. Let him speak for himself. <laughs> but what, where the oversight function can come in, as indicated, is as the investigation proceeds, when matters can be discussed. And one of the points of the independent counsel statute is that it provides, it gives me an opportunity to provide in an appropriate forum with the approval of the court a notification as to why I took action. And then I can make a statement to this committee, and I have made it on an occasion to other committees, that we are going to continue this investigation and that I'm going to be the one ultimately responsible for it. So I'm not ducking anything. I'm not trying to protect anybody. I'm trying to do the job of conducting an investigation in the right way, recognizing that along the way, I not only have to pursue the objects of the investigation, but I've got to constantly review it to determine whether the Independent Counsel Act has been triggered and whether, and if so, I intend to trigger it. Madam Attorney General, it's obvious to all of us that the strategy on the other side is to drive a wedge between Director Free and yourself. Um, the, Mr. Burton started out this hearing by making the, the startling and historically totally inaccurate statement that it's a unique situation that the Attorney General and the FBI Director are in disagreement on an issue. My reading of American history is diametrically opposed to that, because in almost every recent instance, an attorney general and an FBI director differed, and differed publicly and differed for protracted periods of time. Perhaps the best known case is the confrontation between the late Robert Kennedy and J. Edgar Hoover. But there are, con there are countless such instances. On the scale of the historic relationship between attorneys general and FBI directors, how would you rate your relationship with Director Free? I haven't compared it to others, but I think it's an excellent working relationship because I have a public servant of the highest honor who has a great variety of experiences in the criminal justice and the judicial system who's not afraid to tell me what he thinks. 
and he knows that I value his opinion. He knows that I'm not always going to agree with him. But we have a relationship where we can pick up the phone, talk back and forth, walk across the street, talk it out, work it out, and we find ourselves in agreement much of the time. But if we were in agreement all the time, I'd get suspicious. The question was repeatedly asked of you by Mr. Burton whether Director Free's recommendation was constitutional or not. I didn't quite understand that question because his recommendation to you is not a constitutional issue. He expressed his views to you as other officials in the department did and you made the final determination taking into account all of the input. Was there any discussion um, with all of your associates, including Mr. Free, which questioned your sole authority to make the final judgment concerning the invocation of the independent counsel statute? Again, if I were to get into the discussions and what I'm was I'm not discussed, asking for details. The decision is mine and mine alone. I'm the one responsible for it. I want to talk for a minute about the length of these independent counsel investigations and their cost. Um, former Republican Senator Warren Rudman said, and I think I quote him accurately, that these independent councils are kings in a country that doesn't like kings. They have no limits, no time limits, no budgetary limits. We have independent councils that go on for four, five, six years, spend tens of millions of dollars. What is your general judgment about the way this law is now written? What I have said from the beginning is that I don't comment on independent counsel's activities because I want to do everything I can to ensure their independence. With respect to the overall policy, yes. I have said that it is better that I finish my job and see how it has operated. The independent counsel statute has, has been implemented in the investigations that are ongoing and then make a judgment, because if I were to make judgments with respect to the independent counsel statute now uh, and said it should be changed in certain ways, that might deflect from what I am trying to do, which is to use the statute as it is drafted and use it the right way. I have made one comment that goes to the general issue because it was raised, and that is the budgeting issue. I do think that everybody in government should have a budget and be accountable for it. And I would have, I, as I recollect, and we can confirm it for you, written to Senator Hatch in these last several years suggesting that there might be some revision of the bu budget policy so you can hold each person who is spending the money accountable. One of the key issues in this entire investigation has been our judgment that Mr. Burton and his colleagues attempted to portray violations of the letter or the spirit of campaign finance laws as if they had been all one-sided, mistakes committed purely by the Democratic side. In 1995, the Republican House Senate dinner invitation put a very clear price tag on federal property. $15,000 contributors were invited to a breakfast hosted by then Senator Bob Dole in the Senate caucus room. $45,000 contributors were invited to a luncheon hosted by Speaker Gingrich in the Great Hall of the Library of Congress. Were you asked by Mr. Burton or any other colleague on the other side to have an independent counsel appointed to investigate these facts? 
I think it is important. The only time I've ever heard Mr. Burton say anything like uh, about independent counsel in that context was what he said at the outset. But I think it is important that I not comment for the very reasons that I have discussed previously on how matters should be handled or on what we are doing. Because part of it is, is necessary to protect people who may be the subject of the investigation as well. And it, it is important that it be done in a professional, orderly, confidential way to ensure the efficacy of the investigation, to provide for an appropriate decorum with respect to, to people or witnesses or other people that might be inappropriately implicated in the investigation, though it's done the right way, and to make sure that people can speak their mind. Madam Attorney General, I will not ask you to comment on my next observation, but I think it's important to make it because it is important to underscore that this pretended horror on the other side that calls were made from um, uh, the White House is unprecedented in American history. I would like the record to show that President Reagan made fundraising calls from both the White House and from Camp David. These calls included a direct solicitation of Richard DeVos, president of Amway, asking him to raise $3,350,000. Now, no one is calling for an independent counsel to investigate this. But I think it's important to realize, as we clearly do on this side of the aisle, that what is called for is a fundamental review of campaign finance laws so that the American people again will be able to have confidence in the way their government officials function in this arena. Uh, Madam Attorney General, I did not think that my respect for you could increase during the course of this hearing because it was such a high level. But the dignified and candid and straightforward and professional answers you gave to Mr. Burton have served to, to increase my respect and admiration for you as a person and for the work you are doing. And I want to yield five minutes now to my colleague, Mr. Kanjarski. Thank you very much, Mr. Linus. Uh, Madam Attorney General, uh, when you make this process and this decision as to what your final determination will be on the selection of an independent counsel or not, do, is this done with your advisors around the table, or is this done on a, uh, a request on your part that this material be provided by, in memorandum form? It's done in both ways. In regard to the particular... Oftentimes, I, I don't make the decision around the table. I leave the table, think about it, take my walks, figure it out, come back, read something, go back and say I need to talk to some more people, get more the, issues clarified in the law. The, it is an evolving process. The advisors that you have, uh, how many of them would you say give you a written memorandum as opposed to oral advice? There are a significant number of ri written memoranda prepared. Uh, it varies again from case to case and how straightforward it is. I find it highly unusual that in the tobacco industry, uh, the relationship between tobacco and the cause of cancer was contained in memorandum and legal files of some of the outstanding law firms of this country for more than 30 years. In the asbestos industry, legal files contain memorandums and studies of scientists within those industries that indicated there were adverse health reactions and uh, relationships to the cause of cancer and asbestos that were contained in those files for more than 50 years. And unusually in this instance, a written memorandum provided for you in an advisory manner by the chief investigator of the United States appears to have been partially or totally disclosed outside of the confidentiality of that relationship. Is that a reasonable conclusion that it has been disclosed outside? I've read reports and 
I don't New York know. Times and, and, the, and the Wall Street Journal that indicate that portions of this memorandum were read in their totality to members of the press. Is that correct? I, d I don't know, sir, but I think clearly there has been some discussion of it. And what that goes to are, are leaks. I think it is so important that government be as open as possible. As I indicated to earlier, one of the ways that I well, was responsive to the people that I served in Dade County was that I wrote closeout memorandum that were summarized that didn't contain information that related to other investigations and that I could be held responsible. Well, and I think I should be held responsible at the conclusion of my efforts and be as open as I possibly can. Right. And so I, I'm, I'm not trying to avoid I'm that. limited in time and I want to direct particularly to this leak. Do you consider this a leak? I frankly have not had a chance to think about just what it is uh, because I have been concentrating first on making the appropriate decision and secondly how, preparing for the how, chairman. How many people prepared written memorandum for your consideration in regard to the decision? I have not counted the number. Do you have a rough estimation? There are at least six. Were they all in your possession or in a very confidential group in the Department of Justice or were they scattered and copyrighted and sent out in free distribution in the department? Are there a limited number of people that would have had access to this material? Because I consulted with a large number of people, both senior staff, longtime career people, a large number of people had access to these the memorandums. To these memorandums? To your knowledge, has the uh, FBI or the director of the FBI ordered uh, investigation as to how this memorandum leaked to the press? Well, again, we don't know that it leaked. Its existence certainly uh, became evident. It's and the only one I've read about. Uh, you said many memorandum were prepared, and I, I saw no others referred to, Madam Attorney General. Well. I, I, there's a saying in this town, and we all recognize that this is a political town, and regardless of your your decision in this case, unless you were satisfactory in making the decision to appoint an independent counsel, you know you would have been here today. And that would be perfectly acceptable. It would be a political act on the part of the majority. We'd expect that. And this is a political witch hunt. But the fact that there is this difference between the Attorney General of the United States and the Director of the FBI where confidential discussion and information apparently leaked to the press, that disturbs me a great deal. Because just recently, Senator Hatch thinks that the FBI should make a private investigation of this entire matter. And I, I'm very disturbed as to uh, this investigator's agency's ability to hold confidentiality. I, I think that's the most important thing that we're going to discuss here today. How did this all happen? And when it did happen, uh, should we take some action now? I don't know what's in that memorandum. Quite frankly, since a good member of the press know, and obviously a lot of people in the Department of Justice know, maybe the American people ought to know. And I'm not sure I'd oppose giving carte blanche approval on my part to release that document. But it does substantially annoy me that that type of uh, legal confidentiality between the chief investigative agency of the United States and the chief law enforcement officer of the Attorney General of the United States cannot remain confidential. That in a matter of hours. Now, we have an old saying in this town that it's cover your own something. And I'm, I'm, I hope that we're going to have some investigation or determination how that happened to determine whether or not we have a subset of political activities ongoing in the city as a result of this investigation. I see my time has expired. Mr. Lances may have an additional question. I'd like to yield to Mr. Sanders for whatever time we have left, and then we give you the balance of the time the next round. Thank you very much, Mr. Lantos, and I'd like to welcome the Attorney General. I'd like to make a, a brief statement and then ask the Attorney General uh, several questions. Mr. Chairman, this committee has had an enormous opportunity to seriously address one of the major crises facing this country. And that is that we are living under an absurd campaign finance system which allows the wealthiest people in this country to use their financial resources to exert enormous influence over the economic and political policies of our government. 
Tragically, the United States of America today has by far the lowest voter turnout of any industrialized nation on earth. All over America, working people and middle class people are giving up on the political system because they say, well, I have one vote. But how does that one vote compare to the millionaire or the billionaire who can contribute hundreds of thousands of dollars to the political party of their choice, whether it's the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, or the candidate of their choice? Ordinary people, as Mr. Lantos indicated a moment ago, do not go to fundraising dinners at $45,000 a plate. Ordinary people do not contribute huge sums of money to the political party of their choice. It seems to me that what this committee should be doing, if it were serious, and if it were serious about campaign finance reform, which admittedly you are not serious about, what we should be doing is trying to understand why people contribute hundreds of thousands of dollars, what they get in return, and how this has created a situation in this country so that tens of millions of people no longer even participate in the political process because they are so disgusted with it. The fact is that one quarter of 1% of the people contribute over 80% of all political contributions, and that's absurd. It's got to change. And we should point out that at the end of all of these hearings, you don't believe in campaign finance reform. Your colleagues don't believe that we should limit the amount of money that the wealthy and the powerful play. And I think that that is at the root of the problem of all of these hearings. But let me ask our distinguished Attorney General a question, if I might. Well, the gentleman's time has expired. I'll, well, I'll allow one question so we can, uh, because I took a little extra time. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. And let me ask the Attorney General, do you believe, having looked at this situation so carefully, that the current campaign finance laws adequately protect the political process from undue influence from wealthy special interests? Uh, sir, from my experience, they need to be reformed. And I think it is important that everyone work together to seek a reform. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Cox of California is recognized for 10 minutes. I thank the chairman. Uh, Madam Attorney General, I'd like to read to you from yesterday's... Excuse me if I may raise a point of order. Yeah. My, I apologize to my good friend uh, from suspend California. The, suspend the time just one moment. Uh, General, state his point of order. On, on this side, Mr. Chairman, we are very anxious to have every colleague have an opportunity to question our distinguished Attorney General. She has an obligation. Might it be possible to have the rounds restricted to five minutes on, on both sides, so even the more junior members have a chance to ask questions. The Attorney General has indicated that she could uh, be with us, I think, until around 2 o'clock, is that correct? And uh, uh, we already have uh, passed on the uh, uh, procedure that we're going to follow today. We're only talking about 15 minutes additional on each side, so we'll, we're, we have 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, three times, and then we'll go to the five-minute rule for the rest of the uh, members. Mr. Cox. I thank the Chairman. Uh, again, uh, welcome, Madam Attorney General. Uh, I'd like to read to you from page one of yesterday's Los Angeles Times. Carrying envelopes stuffed with bundles of 50 and $100 bills, a slightly built man with a stringy mustache left his Lincoln Plaza hotel room in Monterey Park on an unusual quest. He was looking for volunteers to accept $10,000 in cash. In exchange, she allegedly collected a small packet of personal checks made out to DNC, the Democratic National Committee, an entity that some of the check writers had never heard of. Hundreds of thousands of dollars may have flowed into Democratic Party coffers through these methods. Uh, and again, I'm reading from a page one story in the Los Angeles Times uh, to continue. Uh, records show $80,000 originated in the Bank of China in the account of a Macau-based businessman, Ng Lap Seng. On August 7, 1996, the money was wired to an account in the Riggs National Bank in Washington, D.C., held by Ya Lin Charlie Tree, a controversial Democratic fundraiser and longtime friend of President Clinton's. Pan and Tree are among a handful of figures in the fundraising controversy 
who are believed to be overseas. Pan is no stranger to the White House. Records show he visited the executive mansion at least eight times between August 1995 and October 1996. Pan was an associate of both Tree and another controversial Democratic fundraiser, John Huang. Both Pan and Huang were former executives of the Indonesia-based Lippo Group, whose owners, the Riyadi family, were longtime supporters of Clinton. James Riyadi, we have learned in our hearings, is so close to President Clinton that he is in possession of a unique zip code that permits him to send his mail directly to the President without even the President's staff reading it. In one week, in June 1994, as the chairman stated earlier, uh, James Riyadi was admitted to the White House four times, each time accompanied by John Huang. They met with President Clinton, and days later, $100,000 went from the Lippo Group to Webster Hubble. At that time, Webster Hubble was under investigation by an independent counsel. Now, you had said at the time that Webster Hubble resigned from the Department of Justice. I don't believe he did a thing wrong, and that's perhaps understandable because you worked with him and you were close to him. He was in your department, but of course, he was prosecuted and he did go to jail. Our question is not whether there should be an investigation. There ought to be one. The question is not whether it ought to be conducted in accordance with Justice Department policies. Of course, it must, and the independent counsel statute provides that it must. But the question is whether there is any appearance of a conflict of interest with the administration investigating itself. And with all respect to my colleague from California who earlier asked you whether your relationship with President Clinton antedates your nomination and confirmation as Attorney General, I think it's quite clear that you are a member of the President's Cabinet. So I'd like to ask you about the law, because the law gives you discretion. And we are here because of what you had to say, that this is your call. The law makes it a matter of your discretion. Of course you're following the law whichever way you go. It's a matter of your discretion, and we're here to ask you about your discretion. Specifically, in the exercise of your discretion, have you begun a preliminary investigation under the independent counsel statute of John Huang? No, we have not. Uh, have you, in your discretion, begun a preliminary investigation into Charlie Tree? By preliminary investigation, do you mean the preliminary investigation on both these questions under the that is referred to? Statute. With respect to what is described as, an in, as a preliminary investigation under the independent counsel act, we have not commenced a preliminary investigation under the act. Uh, have you con commenced an independent counsel preliminary investigation, preliminary investigation with respect to Antonio Pan? No, we have not. Have you commenced a preliminary investigation with respect to Webster Hubble? The, I'm, I'm not sure what I can tell you. Well, you I can have tell me that under the statute, you can tell me that. I you have, have oversight. seen press reports that another independent uh, that an independent counsel is pursuing this matter I cannot I don't think without further commenting and affecting his independence I don't think I can comment further well I'm asking you a different question whether or not you have commenced a preliminary investigation I don't want to ask you about what anybody else is doing have you commenced a preliminary investigation of Webster Hubble I don't think that I can comment with respect to whatever action has been taken with under the independent counsel statute and the need for confidentiality. And is that a claim of privilege on your part? No, it's not a claim of privilege. It's a claim that it's, it's confidential. And therefore, it's simply your preference not to answer this committee? I believe your preference for this committee to do is not have not a valid claim of privilege. I think you're required to answer the question. What I have tried to do is to make sure that I do not comment in any way that would affect what an independent counsel is doing. I will be happy to talk with the independent counsel and see what I might be able to comment on and what I can't. But I do not think that you want me to do anything that might imperil an independent counsel's investigation. No, indeed, my concern is that you are not even commencing these investigations. Have you commenced under the independent counsel statute a preliminary investigation of Mark Middleton? N no, I have not. Earlier in your testimony today, you stated that 
it's your interpretation of the law that a political conflict of interest or any conflict of interest in order to uh, permit you to proceed under the independent counsel statute uh, must be actual rather than potential. Is that an accurate statement of your That's testimony? That's correct. Now, I'd like to uh, read to you the statute. When the Attorney General determines that an investigation or prosecution of a person by the Department of Justice may, may result in a personal, financial, or political conflict of interest, the Attorney General may conduct a preliminary investigation. Now, is it still your view, having been refreshed with the language of the statute, that you must have an actual conflict of interest? Yes, we'll be happy to provide you with the letter in which we outlined our position to Senator Hatch. Can you explain to me why Section 591C does not mean what it says? I'll be happy to provide the no, letter. I mean right now. Can you tell me I right now? I do not have the memorandum with me. Well, uh, if somebody could supply you with a copy of the statute, it would be greatly helpful to me. Here's what the statute says. It says, when the Attorney General determines that an investigation or prosecution of a person by the Department of Justice may result in a personal, financial, or political conflict of interest, the Attorney General may conduct a preliminary investigation of such person in accordance with Section 592, if, et cetera. Precisely. That's just what I read to you. So you and I are reading off the same page. And I believe there can be no cavil about what that sentence says. If a person being investigated by the Department of Justice may result in a personal, financial, or political conflict of interest, then you can go and appoint uh, an independent counsel following a preliminary investigation by the Department of Justice. And I just ask you whether you have started even, commenced, begun preliminary investigations with respect to any of these people covered in yesterday's Los Angeles Times article, and your answer is no. I just, uh, I, I'm trying to understand your interpretation of the law because I'm it ties to, in the if, teeth of the statute. Give stat me a moment. I'll see if I, I have the copy of the letter here. Well, Madam Attorney General, because my time is limited, uh, I think if you could get back to us in writing, yes. I would greatly appreciate it. I'll be it. happy to send you a copy of the letter that we sent to Senator Hatch. But I think you understand my puzzlement because... Uh, this is really about your discretion. It's, and, and I think you're quite right to say the buck stops here, it stops with me. But one of the reasons that uh, we're going to talk to the head of the FBI after we're finished with you is that uh, and he's Don't say it's like finished with me. It sounds like you're giving me a hard time. I think you're, you're I appreciate the chairman's thoughtfulness in, in terms of just pursuing it. Uh, uh, well, I, I mean, hope you're not finished with me because I hope that you will continue your oversight function. I mean to do so. Uh, you told the chairman that uh, you discussed your decision not to go forward with an independent counsel with political as well as career people at the Department of Justice, but you declined to answer his question when he asked you specifically whether you discussed this matter with Eric Holder or Mr. Hogan, your chief of staff, and I'd like to ask you those questions once again. Did you, I don't want to ask you what you discussed with them, and I think I can I understand the basis of your... Uh, I discussed my decision with senior staff at the Department of Justice. I discussed it with Director Free. I discussed it with lawyers in the department. Does I've, that include Eric Holder and Mr. Hogan? Again, I don't think that I should talk about what people advise me I when it is my decision. We may have a disagreement about whether you have to answer this question. Is it your view you do not have to answer this question? My hope is that this committee would understand how important it is to have full and frank discussion and that they would And for that, that reason, I do not wish to ask you anything about the content of your conversation with these people, but I do wish to know whether or not you discussed this question with them. Those two people, either Dis one of them, did you did discuss, you discuss this what question with them? with them? Your decision whether to proceed with an independent counsel in this matter. I think if I tell you who I discuss it with, then your next question is going to be, what did you discuss? And I am trying my what, level what best to answer, answer the question. To answer the question. I mean, apart from discretion, do you believe that we cannot uh, properly, as members of Congress, know the answer to this question? I just would hope that you'd realize that you made me responsible and that you'd ask me the questions about why I did something or why I didn't. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, it is my understanding that uh, absent a claim of executive privilege, it is 
perfectly within the province of this committee to know the answer to the question that you earlier put and the question that I just put again, uh, since the uh, witness is obviously uninterested in answering the question that we have fairly put to her, uh, I would request of the Attorney General and ask the Chairman to uh, uh, make the same request that uh, we get a valid claim of privilege in writing from the Department of Justice following the hearing. Here's the answer. This is in my letter to Senator Hatch of April the 14th, 1997. Fourth, even this discretionary provision is not available unless I find a conflict of interest to the sort contemplated by the Act. The Congress has made it very clear that this provision should be invoked only in certain narrow circumstances. Under the Act, I must conclude that there is a potential for an actual conflict of interest, rather than merely an appearance of a conflict of interest. The Congress especially expressly adopted this higher standard to ensure that the provision would not be invoked unnecessarily. C-128, Congressional Record H-9507, Daily Edition, December 13, 1982, Statement of Representative Hall. Moreover, I must find that there is the potential for such an actual conflict with respect to the investigation of a particular person, not with respect to the overall matter. Indeed, when the Act was reauthorized in 1994, Congress considered a proposal for a more flexible standard for invoking the discretionary clause which would have permitted it to use its use to refer any matter to an independent counsel when the purposes of the Act would be served. Congress rejected this situation, suggestion, explaining that such a standard would substantially lower the th threshold for use of the general discretionary provision. H.R. Conference Report Number 511, 103rd Congress, Second Session, 9-1994. Mr. Chairman, I see that my time has expired. With all respect to the Attorney General, uh, I'm a lawyer. Uh, the statute trumps your memo. The statute says may. It's clearly potential. Uh, Be and happy with to get any to, memorandum that you have and consider it. With respect to uh, uh, the questions that are still pending that the Attorney General has refused to answer, I, I would reiterate my request of the Attorney General uh, that she provide us with a written statement of her claim of privilege and her refusal to answer those questions. We will make that request and we'll pursue this further. Uh, Mr. Lantos. <clears throat> Before yielding to my friend from Vermont, I want the record to show that the Attorney General <clears throat> has been fully forthcoming in answering all appropriate questions. Questions directed to the Attorney General that interfere with her official responsibilities as Attorney General are inappropriate questions, should not be asked, and she is perfectly proper in not responding to them. I now would like to yield to my good friend from Vermont uh, for the balance of his questioning time. Thank you very much, Mr. Lantos. Um, Madam Attorney General, let me open uh, a discussion on an area that, to the best of my knowledge, we really haven't talked about uh, this morning yet. It is my understanding that the decision you made with regard to the phone calls made by the President and Vice President related to whether they were in violation of the Pendleton Act. The Pendleton Act. Can you tell us what the purpose of the Pendleton Act is and what were your findings uh, regarding the President and Vice President's calls in relation to the Pendleton Act? The Pendleton Act was adopted in the 1800s and in the 1880s. My understanding from my reading of the legislative history is that uh, people would come to federal offices and say, look, this is how you got your job, uh, you better contribute. And just the, the fact of solicitation within federal offices uh, created a, a chilling effect. Obviously, as technology has changed, those issues have changed. And one of our findings uh, is, and let me, a significant open legal issue under Section 607 is whether a telephone call solicitation from federal workspace to a private location is a solicitation in the federal workplace. This is a difficult issue made more complicated by the legislative history of 607 and by the only Supreme Court decision discussing the statute. However, I have concluded, based on the clear facts developed in the course of this preliminary investigation, that I need not finally resolve this legal issue, and I do not finally resolve the legal issue. 
but I therefore assume for purposes of this investigation that under Section 607, a solicitation over the telephone could be deemed to have occurred in both the location from which the call was placed and the location where the call was received. Uh, and so I do not reach the issue of whether 607 would cover this. I assume it for the purposes of discussion. Okay. I, uh, the chairman and others have <coughs> expressed great shock that the head of the FBI and you are in disagreement. Now, I don't know about the chairman, but in my staff and the world that I work in, there is usually a lot of disagreement among serious people. My understanding is that you are the number one law enforcement person in this country. Is that correct? Well, the chairman said that Director Free was the number one law enforcement person. I have never quibbled about that. But you I, are I've got my responsibilities, and I'm going to do them. Okay. But you are the head, you are the Attorney General of the United States of America. How many attorneys do you have working under you? The last I counted, there were about 6,000 in U.S. Attorney's offices and in Maine Justice and other offices across the country. In your effort to do the best job that you can, is it uncommon that people who work with you or under you occasionally express disagreement with you? Occasionally express disagreement? <laughs> what has, the reason I feel so strongly about this is I think they have learned that they can speak openly and fairly. And we have such good discussions and they so inform the issue. Okay, my time is up. Thank you very much, madam. I want to yield to my good friend, distinguished colleague from New York, Mrs. Maloney. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, attorney General Reno, am I correct that you have been the Attorney General of the United States for almost five years? That's right. Am I also correct that you are familiar with the responsibilities under the Independent Counsel Act? I've learned an awful lot about it in the last four and a half years. And among those uh, responsibilities is the determination of whether to apply for the appointment of an independent counsel, correct? That's correct. And are there certain uh, statutory standards for making that determination? Yes, there are. In fact, during your tenure as Attorney General, you've made determinations to apply for the appointment of an independent counsel on a number of occasions, and haven't you done so at least on four occasions? That's correct. And at least one of those occasions involved uh, President Clinton. That's correct. With respect to your current uh, decision, isn't it true that you reviewed all information reasonably available to you? That's right. Did you include all information provided to you by the FBI? That's correct. Did you thoroughly review all information provided to you prior to making your decision? I went over it very carefully. Did you have any discussions or communications with President Clinton or White House personnel prior to making your decision? The only communication I had was with Chuck Ruff, the White House counsel, when I called him to find out why we had not been notified prior to um, the hearing and prior to responding to Chairman Hyde and Hatch, why we'd not been notified when Congress had been notified before us mm -hmm. and we had responded to a 30-day letter, I wanted to know why that had happened and that's the only conversation that I have had. Did President Clinton or any White House personnel participate in any way in your decision? No. Did you have any discussions with President Clinton? or any White House personnel regarding what your decision would be? No. Isn't it true that uh, you were not President Clinton's first choice for Attorney General? That's right. <laughs> and isn't it true that prior to your appointment as Attorney General, you had no political or personal connection with President Clinton? The only personal connection I had was that I had helped start a drug court in Dade County that's proven very successful, and the public defender in that drug court was Mrs. Clinton's brother. Mm -hmm. Isn't it true that uh, you made your decision independently after you reviewed carefully all the evidence? I, I think I described to the chairman my process, which was, I mean, it's review all the evidence, go back and talk to people, hear people out, see what evolves, think about it, 
get memorandum early enough so that you can really go through it in detail. I would come back with a list of things and call people in and say, what about this? What about that? What can we do here? And it has been a very detailed process because I wanted to make sure that I did what I thought was right. Was your decision in any way influenced by the White House or political concerns? No. Do you have any doubt that you have fulfilled your statutory obligations fairly, fully, and without bias? Absolutely. As I mentioned to the chairman at some point, I, mm -hmm. he and I may disagree, and I may have done the wrong thing, but I know I've tried to do what was right to the best of my ability. Madam uh, Attorney General, we've heard many allegations uh, today that the scope of uh, your investigation was too narrow. Uh, well, I might suggest that the scope of uh, your investi investigation include uh, issue advertising. Issue advertising is uh, securing large amounts of uh, soft money in, in our campaign system. And the triad management services, the, uh, this particular group allegedly funneled millions of dollars in into issue ads into two nonprofit organizations, Citizens for Reform and citizens for the Republican Education Fund. Uh, these practices allowed wealthy donors to pour unregulated sums of money, large sums of money, into congressional races without even minimal disclosure requirements. And it has been reported in numerous uh, newspapers. In one ad financed by Triad, a candidate from Montana was accused of beating his wife. Uh, the papers allege that the ad was produced in coordination with the candidate's uh, opponent. And my question is, is the coordination between a campaign and an outside group legal? With respect to all of these issues, I think that I should not again comment on this, on what's legal and what's not legal while the matter is pending. As I said in April, coordination between presidential candidates and their national party committees on the national party spending for political advertisements does not appear to be forbidden either by the act or the public financing laws. But I think it is important that the FEC continue to look at that, as I understand they are, and that as we develop any evidence that indicates that we should take action, that we would do so. And otherwise, I don't think I should comment. You mentioned earlier um, uh, that you believe that we should, as a Congress, move forward with campaign finance reform. We've had numerous um, oversight hearings, many of which you have participated in, yet there have been uh, very few hearings and very uh, little serious discussion on how to reform um, the campaign finance system. Would you agree that if we were to limit the amount of soft money that could be contributed, many of the abuses you have investigated could not have taken place? Again, I think... Many that, that have been mentioned in the press could not have taken place. I think it's very important that we work together to achieve reform. I don't think that I should talk about the specifics of it while my re major responsibility is the conduct of this investigation. Um, earlier, you talked about the, the Pendleton Act. Um, do you think that the Pendleton Act should be uh, amended to provide greater clarity about what actions constitute a violation of that, all, of that law? Yes, ma'am. You do. And you did mention earlier that uh, you thought that we should limit the amount of money for uh, independent uh, prosecutors. Do you think we should always also limit the amount of time? I did not suggest limiting money for independent prosecutors. What I talked about was the budget process mm -hmm. whereby they have a budget that they spend and that they are responsible for rather than having just access without limitation. I don't think it would limit their independence and I think it would be a, a sounder process. Mm -hmm. My time is up, but just in closing, it has been uh pointed out repeatedly that you alone have the statutory responsibility, the legal responsibility, to make a determination for an independent counsel. And I just want to note that I am sure that you have dealt with this matter in a fair and unbiased manner. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, Mr. Barr, recognized for 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, turning your attention, uh, Ms. Reno, to Ms. O'Leary, in your opinion, your notification with regard to Ms. O'Leary at page two, uh, you make the statement that if Mrs. O'Leary was involved in the solicitation of the donation and the donation was an express quid pro quo in exchange for the meeting, as Mr. Chung's allegations suggest that these facts could constitute a potential violation of federal criminal law, uh, which uh, particular federal criminal laws on, uh, would you have in mind or could that possibly apply to only 201 or are there, might there be others such as 18 U.S.C. 600, 641? Let me do this, Congressman. What I have tried to do is provide for the notification to the court. I want to make sure that I don't in any way interfere with, as, as we reflect here, therefore, based on the results of the, um, let's see. We have tried to make clear that we are continuing this investigation, that we do not have evidence sufficient with respect to Mrs. O'Leary uh, to proceed. But what I would like to do is to make sure that I don't in any way interfere with the foregoing investigation, and I will provide you that answer if I can. Well, let me, let me maybe approach it in a, in a different way. Uh, could an express quid pro quo uh, between a solicitation uh, and a meeting be a violation of provisions of the U.S. Criminal Code in addition to Section 201, possibly Section 600, possibly Section 641, not with regard to the facts of this case in particular, but as a general matter, and understanding as I know you do those statutes. Again, this has been res addressed specifically with respect to Section 201. I understand. And I don't... I ju just would like to make sure that we don't do anything that would affect an ongoing investigation if I comment further. And at the conclusion, when I get back to the department, I will clarify it and, and let you know what I can say and can't say without interfering with the ongoing investigation. And what, what, would that be the ongoing investigation of Ms. O'Leary? There is not an ongoing investigation of Mrs. O'Leary. Okay, which one might you be referring to? Where's the... With respect, at page five of the notification, it says, the circumstances surrounding the solicitation and payment of the donation and whether it was linked in any way possible to a, to a possible meeting with Secretary O'Leary and the CINEPAC delegation are disputed and subject to differing interpretations by the participants. These circumstances and whether they may have been there may have been some unlawful conduct by some participants warrant further investigation by the Department of Justice. As a result, we are limited in how much we can reveal about the details of our preliminary investigation. However, there is no evidence whatsoever that suggests that M Mrs. O'Leary had any involvement in or knowledge about the alleged solicitation of the Africare donation or any possible connection that anyone was drawing between the meeting and the donation. And so that's what I want to check to make sure that I don't say anything that would interfere with a subsequent follow-up on that matter. Okay, you're talking about the, the O'Leary matter in the Department of Energy. That's correct. You're not talking about other investigations that might 
involve other parties and possible violations of 18 U.S.C. 201, 600, or 641? I would not comment. With regard to, uh, in particular, the uh, section that you just quoted from pages 5 and 6, uh, and it's a common theme throughout the entire paper, uh, with regard to the evidence vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ms. O'Leary, uh, was Mr. Chung interviewed? Let me just check and see what I My understanding is that it it is in the notification. I can't I I was sure it was and that he was interviewed. He was interviewed. Mm -hmm. And was his uh, uh, was his responses to questions did it indicate as reports have indicated generally that the secretary did thank him expressly for the $25,000 contribution. whether it's here, but I... But it's, it's not in the paper. Uh, my, my question whether or not it's, it's in the paper. I mean, were his, were his responses... He has stated that his belief that Mrs. O'Leary knew about the solicitation was based solely on the secretary's signature on the letter he received confirming our, the meeting. And one or which our investigation determined was an auto pen signature and one or two general thank you statements she made during the meeting and when she stopped by his table at the Africare dinner. These facts are plainly insufficient to support a reasonable inference that Mrs. O'Leary was involved in the solicitation and amount to little more than speculation. Okay. Press reports state very clearly that Mr. Chung said that Energy Secretary O'Leary thanked him expressly for a $25,000 contribution. Were his answers to questioning by the department uh, consistent with those press reports? This notification reflects what the investigation revealed, and, and it, uh, I don't, I think it outlines the press reports, and I think it compares them. So the answer to the question is what? The press reports are not consistent with the notification. But are they consistent with, with his answers to questions during the interviews by the Department of Justice? His press reports are cons... He originally alleged that he was able to secure a meeting with then Secretary O'Leary only after he had donated $25,000 to a charity she, she supports. He stated that his belief that Mrs. O'Leary knew about the solicitation was based solely on the secretary's signature on the letter he received confirming the meeting, which our investigation determined was an auto pin signature, and that information jibes, if that's your question. And one or two general thank you statements she made during the meeting and when she stopped by his table at the Africare dinner afterwards. So, so press reports that uh, Chung said that Energy Secretary O'Leary expressly thanked him for the $25,000 contribution are inconsistent with his answers provided to the Department of Justice interviewers. I can check for you and see exactly if, if this doesn't clarify it for you, let me try to clarify to the extent it would be appropriate in a follow-up for you. Well, I know. The document from which you're reading is an accurate reflection of the department's work. That would be certainly a correct statement, wouldn't it? That's correct. And what I will do is check and see what I can provide you in terms of what he said with respect to the thank yous. If, if he had, in fact, stated that Ms. O'Leary expressly thanked me for a $25,000 
charitable contribution to Africare, would that change the department's position? I think that's what he said originally, and I think with the questions of the people uh, who were there and the, follow the investigation that was done in this matter, this notification sets forth the department's findings. With regard to Mr. Gore, uh, are you familiar, I did not see reflected in your paper to the, your notification on Mr. Gore. Uh, we have it, I think, as document 292. Uh, which is a memorandum to the Vice President dated February 26 of 1996, subject DNC and reelect budgets. Are you familiar with that document? I don't know what document you're referring to without looking at it, sir. Okay. If somebody could hand this to the Attorney General, please. It's on the screen. Uh, it is, it is a, a document uh, dated as indicated, titled as I've indicated, and it goes on to state that the president and vice president uh, would actually be doing the calls, the calls reflecting the subject matter of the memorandum, DNC and reelect budgets. If, in fact, that was the basis for the calls that the vice president made, about which there is little dispute, would not that clearly indicate that the vice president knew that he was, in fact, making calls for reelect money, which is federal money, which clearly would be covered by 18 U.S.C. 607. I don't have a specific recollection of how this issue was addressed. I don't think it's addressed in the notification, and I will provide you that information if it's why, appropriate. Why wouldn't it be? Wouldn't this document be relevant? What I'd like to do is check it out because it's not addressed in the notification, and I want to make sure since... But would, would it not it's regular order, Mr. General, Chairman. ...on the face of it to be relevant? Yeah, the gentleman, gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Lantos, <coughs> you recognize for 10 minutes of someone on your side? I'm delighted to yield to my good friend from Wisconsin, Congressman Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lantos. Uh, Ms. Reno, you showed a lot of enthusiasm when my colleague... Um, Ms. Maloney suggested or asked whether you thought the Pendleton Act uh, should be updated. I just want to offer my assistance. Um, I would be more than willing and, in fact, anxious to work with you in your office. I think that there's a number of members on a bipartisan basis who would like to uh, make sure that our laws are at least understandable. And uh, clearly, I think it's in everyone's best interest if we, if we understand what the, the law is. So I just wanted to make that, that offer to you. With respect to the Pendleton Act, um, one of the one of the criticisms that, that we have heard about your decision is that once you frame the issue, uh, that it was basically a, a done deal that there would be no independent counsel. C could you help me understand how, how you went about framing the issue and, and why you framed it the way you did? From the outset of the investigation, we have tried to consistently, regularly constantly review the evidence that is developed in the ongoing investigation of campaign finance. We've tried to follow all the leads, but my message to everybody has been, if you've determined that the statute, the Independent Counsel Act, may be triggered, look at it carefully, consult with the lawyers in the department who have had experience both through Republican and Democratic administrations in implementing and construing the act to make sure that if it is triggered, we respond immediately. And so as information is developed, we look at it, discuss it, and see whether it has triggered the statute. In the specific instance of the President and the Vice President, 607 was the specific issue that was triggered. With respect to Mrs. O'Leary, it is a separate issue that really there are some, some common denominators to it, but we have tried to take every instance and pursue it. Some people say there's a larger theory, and we try to look at it to see what is the specific and credible information that indicates that there may have been a violation of federal law, and we're constantly looking for that issue to see whether the statute would be triggered. So that when we hear comments 
from particularly from the other side of the aisle, but even from this side of the aisle, about an, uh, an allegation that involves, for example, Chinese money. Why, why did that not, why was that not a part of the consideration here? Again, I have to be careful in how I comment on it, but with respect, the, the statute has two parts, as Chairman Burton has described. One covers covered persons, and if I find specific and credible information that concerning a covered person, then I've got to trigger the statute. I don't have specific and credible information that a covered person knowingly violated a law with respect to, to the issues that you discuss, and I've got to have that information. With respect to other people who are not covered, I still have got, to, the threshold is to find that there is a conflict investigating a person for whom I have specific and credible information. And then I must look at the totality. What is the transaction? What is the relationship? How, how is a covered person impacted in it? They're just, each has to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Much has been made and many comparisons have been made with the decision by President Reagan to uh, appoint an independent counsel in Iran-Contra. Uh, concerning that case. My recollection um, is that that ended in 1992 when President Bush ended that that uh, investigation and pardoned six people. Is that is that right? Am I right? Is that the one where... I don't President remember all the details. I, I don't remember how many people. But, I mean, just because so much has been made that that was such a great Profiles and Courage move, um, we never got to the end of the book. Uh, and I don't recall exactly. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm mistaken, but I thought that that's how the... The Iran Contra uh, special I have counsel. just tried to concentrate on what I have to deal with since March 12, 1993. Good, good. Well, which brings me to my next question. Could you run through, please, for me, the, the different cases where you have appointed an independent counsel? Again, I can tell you that I have sought the appointment of at least four. And those the, cases are? The first case was the case that the chairman alluded to, which, in which I originally appointed a special counsel because the Independent Counsel Act was not then in effect. It had lapsed. I made a statement that when the Independent Counsel Act was passed, I would seek to use the processes of the act, and the court then appointed another independent counsel, Kenneth Starr, and you're generally familiar with the press accounts of Mr. Starr. I have referred related matters or agreed to Mr. Starr pursuing related matters with respect to, to that. So it's commonly known as the Whitewater. I'm sorry, my okay. friend's time has expired. Okay. We, we, we have to move on to Congresswoman Norton. I understand. Thank you very much. Welcome, Madam Attorney General. Uh, I just want to note for the record, since I sat in on the deposition, uh, um, that was um, taken this week of Ms. O'Leary that not only uh, was the submission to the court uh, closing out that matter uh, made with the most definitive language, but in a letter from the counsel of this committee, the, that matter has apparently been closed out as well. Uh, in that letter, December 8th, counsel said that the reason for calling her was uh, because there was no access to Justice Department uh, sources, uh, as is, of course, appropriate, and that, quote, the committee will not be cause it, calling Ms. O'Leary bef before a hearing next week. No other subpoena was issued to your client. So it seems to me that uh, all questioning on that matter is indeed moot. Um, Madam Attorney General, um, I'm sure there is confusion since people have seen tapes and, and there is, is every indication that Democrats and Republicans alike were going around raising all kinds of money from anybody in sight. Um, in your investigation of the president and the vice president, was there any evidence of a request for a quid pro quo or any kind of quid, quid, quo, quid pro quo such as a, a job or a, contract or promise of any sort? With respect to ongoing matters, if there was 
specific and credible information of the kind that you just talked about, it would trigger the statute. With respect to these specific calls covered in the notification, that is not been there's not been specific and credible information to that effect. Is, 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 is some information of, uh, of any kind of quid pro quo required under the statute? With respect to s the matter covered by this notification, yes. by this section notification. 607, yes. it is simply a telephone call, as I have assumed here, though I have not decided, uh, a telephone call to a non-federal location soliciting money or receiving money in a would would be covered you do not need the quid pro quo well yet apparently under uh, department policy there's there are uh, there's more than one gate through which uh, an investigation uh, must in enter and, and uh, um, the department policy apparently also involves aggregating circumstances. Could you give, give, give me an example? Uh, that is to say that the statute is trigger, triggered, not automatically, but if, if you it, had a situation where uh, a, a person sent computer mailings to federal offices soliciting money and the Department of Justice said, look, it looks like it's been a mistake. Please don't do it again. And it was done again and again in total disregard to, to the admonitions. That might be conceivably a basis for it, but it's very dangerous to do what ifs. Yes, but, but clearly uh, you, you're implying that a single incident where you might not be able to show intent might not trigger the statute because the department would look at its own policy to see if there were aggregating circumstances. We have not we have tried not to address the issue of intent. We have tried to address the issue of that, exactly what was done and whether it was a violation of the law. And there's departmental po uh, policy as well as the law to be considered. And the departmental policy sp specifically provided under the Independent Counsel Act uh, that In determining under this chapter whether reasonable grounds exist to warrant further investigation, the Attorney General shall comply with the written or other established policies of the Department of Justice with respect to the conduct of criminal investigations. And, and those would be policies that were in effect before you became Attorney General? That's correct. Uh, now, you testified that you have uh, appointed uh, independent counsel or or your view that there should be an, an independent counsel uh, has uh, taken place on four occasions. At least four occasions. Uh, could any of those, could an independent counsel in any of those investigations conceivably reach a covered person in the normal course of an investigation? Such I, as the president or the vice president. Well, with respect to the first one, the president, Whitewater. No, I'm, I'm now speaking about uh, a, an appointment that is investigating other than the president and the vice president. Could it, it could conceivably, but it would depend on the circumstances. But, but nothing would keep an independent counsel from going there if that is where the evidence led if it was related, and that there you get into the discussion of what is related to the independent counsel's jurisdiction. And if it were related, I would just let the independent counsel handle it as a related matter, or in other instances, as I have done, I might refer it because it is connected. Gentlelady's time has expired. Mr. Shaddy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Attorney General, I'd like to begin my remarks with a few preparatory statements. First of all, I served in the Arizona Attorney General's office for eight years. During that time, we prosecuted many public officials. We prosecuted a member of the governor's cabinet for a felony and convicted him. And we prosecuted the governor himself for a felony. So I have been, I was at that time, the third ranking lawyer in the office where you are now. And I think I have some judgment to bring to that issue. I also believe, Madam Attorney General, that I can fundamentally disagree with what you did 
without being partisan or seeking partisan gain. And that one of the problems here is that you view your critics as totally partisan and trying to change your view and don't look at their criticism in a fair manner. Indeed, I would argue, Madam Attorney General, that if you are correct that a technical violation of the law by the attorney, by the vice president cannot be proven or the president could not be proven, the greatest disservice you have done is to them by not allowing the appointment of an independent counsel to make that point. I do believe, Madam Attorney General, that you believe you've done the right thing. I do believe that in your words you have made your decision based upon the law and the facts. I believe indeed that you have thoroughly focused on crossing the T's and dotting the I's, but regrettably I think you've missed the larger picture. I think you've approached this as a line prosecutor and not in the fashion that you should as the sitting Attorney General. I don't think your job is to cross the T's and dot the I's. I think your job is to step back and look at the forest and look at the whole picture. I think it's your job to have a higher calling and to ensure that there is public confidence in the decisions you make and that no one will believe that the president or the vice president is above the law or that they were cleared by someone who had a conflict of interest. And I would cite in support of that position, your own testimony on May 14, 1993, to the Senate Government Affairs Committee, in which you said, the credibility and public confidence engendered by the fact that an independent and impartial outsider has examined the evidence and concluded that prosecution is not warranted serves to clear a public official's name in a way that no Justice Department investigation ever could. And indeed, I think that's the problem here. I'd like to walk through just a series of events uh, in your report and uh, address some of those if I can. I believe you invited us to go over your report. Which your report? The report with respect to Vice President Gore, if you would, and the question of whether or not he illegally sought uh, hard money contributions in the calls he made from the White House. First of all, your report concludes, does it not, Madam Attorney General, that Vice President Gore did in fact make calls from his White House, White House office. I believe it concludes that he did so on 10 or 11 occasions and that he spoke to at least 45 people. Is that correct? That's correct. And I'd like to make a point uh, respecting your experience as the third ranking officer in the Attorney General's office. Uh, you fundamentally disagree with me. And as I mentioned to the chairman earlier, I may not be right, but I've tried to reach the right conclusion. I understand. And one that. of the things that I've tried to do is to listen very carefully to my critics. I don't listen to critics who talk to me about polls or throw the New York Times at me, well, but I try to read the New York Times in terms of its substance, and I try to listen to people. Because I my have, time is very limited. I, I really like to talk but to you about some criticism I have of this report. That but I, I would like to be to. able to respond because I think it's only fair to do so, and if you, if, if you would permit me, I would be grateful because I think it's important to understand the process. I have specifically said, when others said, oh, he or she is after you, that's not the issue. The issue is, what are the facts? What is the law? And I've tried to follow that. I believe I have done the right thing. I, I know what it's said. like to be criticized. I got criticized bitterly by people for asking for the appointment of at least four independent prosecutors, and I get criticized bitterly for not asking for it. If we could and I'm Attorney damned General. if I do and damned if I don't. It's and a tough so job. I try to look at the evidence and the law, and I try to look at the evidence and the law presented by my critics, and thus I would be happy to talk with you about your criticisms. Good. Um, your report also concludes that some of the money was in fact raised by the vice president was in fact used by the DNC as hard money. That's on page eight. You would agree with that? That's correct. Okay. Um, your report uh, also concludes that at least for the purposes of the report, the stat you will assume that the statute makes it illegal for the pres vice president from the White House to raise hard money contributions. That's you, correct. You make that assumption. Okay. You also then. So, so, for example, when you say the White House, I mean, again, we're talking about the official. Right. Let's assume that. Places in the White House. So, if you had found that Mr. Gore had solicited money for the purpose of influencing an election for a federal office, that is, hard money, from his White House office, 
and had known that he was doing so, you would have concluded at least that an independent counsel was necessary, would you not? It would depend on the circumstances, sir. Again, what I would try to do is apply the policy that I've described here uh, with respect to whether there were aggravating circumstances. Okay. Uh, putting aside the aggravating circumstances question, you then conclude, I believe at page 10 of the report, that there is, and in your words, no evidence on which to conclude that the vice president was raising contributions that were hard money, that is, that were campaign contributions. Is that correct? That he was soliciting hard money. No evidence to believe that he was doing that. That's correct. And based on that, you conclude there is no reasonable ground to believe that a further investigation of the allegation that he broke the law is required. That's correct. Okay. Um, would you agree with me, Madam Attorney General, that the best evidence of whether or not the Vice President was soliciting hard money campaign contributions would be his own words? It would be a variety of, of, of information. It certainly would be fairly good evidence, would it not? His own description of what he was doing? Yes, but okay. again, we want to, wanted to make sure that we did not rely on, on the Vice President predominantly, that we looked at all the evidence. But your report pretty well concludes that, number one, yes, he made the calls. Yes, some of the money was used as hard money, but he didn't know of the DNC policy to use it as hard money, so he didn't know he was raising hard money. And you just agreed with me that if he was raising hard money, that that would appear to be a violation of the law, at least your report assumed that, and that it was likely, absent the issue of uh, um, aggravating circumstances, that you would have called for an independent investigation, right? Depending on the circumstances okay. and the aggravating circumstances. I simply want to go to, to the Vice President's uh, own press conference on this issue. A press conference, importantly, that occurred before the defense of soft money had occurred. And I want to point out that in the transcript of that press conference, the Vice President does not once say that he believed he was raising soft money. And I'd like to read from that press conference. The first paragraph that I'd like to read reads as follows. First of all, I want to spell out the facts of my role in the campaign. First of all, to state the obvious. obvious. I was a candidate for re-election in the campaign. I worked very hard for the re-election of, of President Clinton and myself. I am very proud that I was able to be effective in helping to re-elect President Clinton, and I was very proud that I was able to also, as a part of that effort, to help raise campaign funds. Now, he describes them himself as campaign funds. Then if we could put on the screen, at a later point in the press conference, he says, we felt as we were preparing for our campaign, a general sense that we wanted to make sure that we had the ability to compete. Okay, now he's talking about our campaign. First he was talking about the Health Spray's campaign funds. Now he's talking about funds for our campaign. And an additional point in the campaign, and we can put this one up, I was helping to raise funds for the campaign. And then he's, there's a sentence that is not pertinent, and he says, but I don't think it is surprising to people that when a president and a vice president are running for re-election and the vice president helps to raise funds for the campaign. Each of these appear to me, Madam Attorney General, to be references to his re-election campaign, which would be hard money, would they not? That's correct. Okay. Then the last one I want to bring to your attention is that in that same portion of the transcript, at the same press what I answered when you ask, is that correct, that contributions to the to Clinton his Gore campaign, campaign would be hard money? Right. And as a matter of fact, Madam Attorney General, your report finds that he used, although he said at the press conference he used a DNC credit card, in point of fact, he used a Clinton Gore credit card for the mo most of the calls. And your report also finds that, does it not? That's correct. Yeah, at page 14, I believe it says that. Now, the last quote I want to bring you from his press conference is that it says, point blank, he says, um, my counsel advises me that there is no controlling legal authority, the phrase that became famous from that press conference, or case that says there was any violation of law whatsoever in the manner in which I asked people to contribute to our re-election campaign. Now, we've had four different references to our campaign, the campaign, and in this case, a specific reference to the manner in which 
I, the vice president, asked people to contribute to our re-election campaign. It seems to me, Madam Attorney General, that's very strong evidence that he thought he was raising hard money. And my question to you is why nowhere in your lengthy report on why, where you resolve all these doubts in favor of the vice president and say no independent counsel is necessary, that press conference is not discussed even once and his own words in it aren't used even once. And I want to suggest that the reason is the vice president had, had not had time to shape his testimony to talk about soft money at the press conference. Indeed, at the press conference, what he says is that he and the president aren't covered by the statute, and besides which, the statute doesn't apply to him. Now, later, your investigative report Regular order, Mr. shows that you know, he didn't believe it was hard money. I think this is pretty clear evidence that at the time he did it, he thought it was hard money. Based on the interview of over 200 witnesses, based on the analysis of documents, we disagree. Well, well why isn't the press conference mentioned in your report then? Regular order, Mr. You Chairman. You may answer that, Ms. Reno. What we have tried to do is to take all the information that was available to us in the investigation. We have looked at the issue with respect to the credit card. We had, as it indicates, we have looked at the documentation. We have looked at the notes on the documentation. We have talked to the people who were solicited, and we have tried to find out from them just what was solicited. But the press conference isn't mentioned in your report. I don't think it is, sir. Mr. Lantos. <coughs> I'm very pleased to yield five minutes to my friend and colleague, Congressman Fatah. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's good to see everyone. Let me wish everyone a happy holiday season. And I'm glad the chairman brought us all to town so that we could be here together. Uh, to the uh, attorney general, I, it must be a very difficult job because since Clinton's election, uh, he has been uh, followed by a string of allegations. And if one would have appointed an independent counsel on each and every occasion, uh, there probably would not be room uh, for any other activity. Uh, since his election in 92, we've had allegations, uh, you know, from Jerry Farwell that he's been involved in murders in Arkansas. We had um, Whitewater, we had Foggate, Travelgate. Now we have the campaign scandals. Uh, and I've left out a few, like Gary Aldridge saying that he was sneaking out of the White House at night, uh, going downtown to a hotel or, or something of the sort. So it's difficult to follow all of this, but I think it is safe to assume that it's safe to assume that uh, as you deal with allegations, uh, there has to be some foundation before one would embark on a, a process under which an independent counsel would be appointed. And the threshold as set by the Congress, not by you, is that there be specific and credible evidence that the president, uh, not that he beat the Republicans, but that he actually did something wrong um, before you would cause an independent counsel to be appointed. Is that correct? Specific and credible inf information that he may have violated federal criminal law. Because in the public arena, there's probably not been another person who has attracted such wild and comprehensive allegations uh, from his uh, conservative uh, and partisan opponents. But let me move to the question of what happens after an allegation. There's an investigation and whether it's a preliminary investigation by the Justice Department or whether it's a congressional investigation, investigations are set aside to try to determine what the facts are. Now, Senator Thompson had an investigation in the Senate related to the matters that have brought you here today, uh, even though you are headed to a very important meeting on international law enforcement matters. Um, and Senator Thompson spent millions of dollars. He subpoenaed and uh, you know, uh, uh, of documents and witnesses and depositions. Are there, any, are there any limitations between the Senate investigation processes and what's available to the Justice Department in terms of proceeding? I don't really want to discuss what we can do that a congressional committee can, but it is important that we... Well, let, let's walk through it now. Both the Senate committee can issue subpoenas and the Department of Justice can issue subpoenas for documents and for, uh, for persons to, to come and, and present either before a grand jury or before the Senate in, in that case. Is that accurate? That's correct. So in the search for the truth, uh, there was, at least in terms of documents or personal testimony, 
the Republican majority in the Senate, and in that case, also the Republican majority here in the House. We spent $4 million. We've done hundreds of depositions. Um, and in this search for the truth, the Republican Party, even though it wants to criticize your process, has had processes available to it to chase the wildest allegations that they want to make about the White House uh, as it relates to this matter. And the point I'm trying to make is that even though you have been brought here today as part of the committee's oversight responsibility, if there's any feeling on behalf of this committee and its majority, even after the failings of the Thompson Committee in the Senate and their, the fact that they have now retired from this process, uh, the, this committee could subpoena people, depose people, and we've done it, to search out any avenue of, uh, of information that somehow, because of your process being imperfect, uh, that we think should be brought to light, and that this committee could make referrals to the Justice Department. Isn't that correct? As I understand it, it is, sir. So if we found some evidence that there was some actual wrongdoing, or if to go back to the original allegation that the Chinese government had a conspiracy to influence the presidential election, which is how Senator Thompson started out his hearing, and at best we've been able to determine is that to the degree that the Chinese government had some interest in elections in America, it was in the congressional elections, but to the degree that we found any information, we could refer it to the Justice Department. So I guess the question that I'm really trying to get at is, is that you've been brought here today because the majority has a complaint about your decision-making process. Gentlemen's now, time has expired. I have to move on to Mr. Cummings. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Madam Attorney General, uh, thank you for being here. Um, in listening to your testimony, um, I am just very impressed with your independence and your forthrightness. And I think that a lot of people in America feel the same way. I find it very interesting, a few moments ago, I guess hours ago now, Mr. Lantos was asking you about your relationship with the President. And it's interesting to note that in the past, many times when presidents appointed attorney generals, they were people who they knew well. In some instances, they were like best friends. In the instance of John Kennedy, it was his own brother. President Kennedy was his own brother. And I was just wondering about your feelings with regard to against of having a distance, the attorney general having a certain distance from the president. Do you have any opinions on that? I mean, just generally? I try to call it like I see it. I will take the evidence where it leads me. But I have, in the four and a half years that I have been Attorney General, I have never once felt that I did not have access to the President on issues of policy or administration policy or, or anything in which access to the President was, was important or desirable. And I have always found a very good, frank, thoughtful commentator on the other end. When it comes to matters like this, though, when you're addressing issues that directly could affect the president and his future, um, or the vice president for that matter, does it give you any more comfort when you, say, come before a body like this, or when you're making those decisions, to know that there has always been that you're not, as Mr. Lanto said, a, uh, a good friend uh, or a buddy of the president. I mean, does it give you any additional level of comfort? I'm just curious. No, because I think the, the statute, as I mentioned earlier, assumes that there is a conflict. The president of the United States can fire me whenever he wants, and so you could assume a conflict there. But Congress has set the threshold and it's said that the Attorney General shall determine that threshold. And I call it like I see it. I think that you probably have already answered this question by what you just said, but so that the American public can be very clear, um, when you make these decisions, you don't worry about the President firing you, do you? I don't worry about the President firing me. As I told the Senate Judiciary Committee at my confirmation hearing, I'll 
follow what the president says, but when I think he asked me to do wrong or to do something like that, I'll say, bye, Mr. President, I'm going home only. I'll get in my truck and go explore America first. And I can tell you that in these four and a half years, the president has never asked me to do anything remotely in the realm of doing something wrong. A little bit earlier, a statement was made and was more, it seemed, an implication that perhaps um, you may have felt that the president or the vice president were, were above the law. Um, you don't feel that way, do you? I've spent an awful lot of time subjecting them to this really stiff scrutiny of the law. I have, as has been indicated, asked for the appointment of an independent counsel with respect to the president. I will follow the law. One of the and interesting... I will apply it. I guess, I guess I speak it from a standpoint of a defense counsel when I ask this question and will make this statement. Um, you spent, we spent a lot of time here talking about um, why you didn't appoint a uh, special prosecutor and there's been uh, substantial criticism. But I guess there's something that we haven't talked about a lot here today, and that is fairness to the person being investigated. Um, I think um, it is very important in our judicial system and our, in this whole, in the, all that you do, I guess, you, you take into consideration fairness, not just from the standpoint of the states, I mean, the, I'm sorry, the countries, the federal governments uh, trying to bring charges, but also to fairness to the person being investigated. Could you speak on that for just a moment, please? I think one of the worst things imaginable is to, to charge a person or to take action with a respect to a person who's innocent. And I think the prosecutor in America has a, a very important responsibility to make sure that innocent people don't get prosecuted and that the guilty get prosecuted and convicted according to principles of due process and fair play and that they are convicted in a court and not in headlines. And so I, and I guess when you, you talk about waking up at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and trying to figure all of this out, I guess you, you're looking at both sides of that, the side of the federal government and your responsibility as sworn, as a sworn officer, and at the same time, fairness to those who may be accused. My responsibility as a member of the cabinet of the federal government as attorney general is the same. It is to protect the innocent and to convict the guilty. And I owe that responsibility to the American people because they are the government. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Horn. Mr. Chairman, would you give me three minutes? I'll give you four minutes. Thank you, sir. The uh, chair will recess, uh, subject to the call of the chair, but don't anybody move. Committee will come to order. I thought that was about two, two minutes and 13 seconds, so you pretty fast. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Mr. Horn. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's uh, good to see you, uh, Madam Attorney General. I can recall the fine job you did when, as a member of the Civil Rights Commission, I went to Dade County with my colleagues on a terrible murder situation. And uh, you were a most impressive state's attorney, and you attorney general in many ways but I'm going to raise one question with you that uh, I'd like to see what your thinking is we're simply amazed as we get into this about the abuse of illegal foreign money the money that's laundered through non-citizens or straw donors and what I want to bring up is a situation where money seems to have clearly cured uh, the political favor in ways that would never have been dreamed possible if we thought about it. I'm going to ask you a few questions about the dog track case in Hudson, Wisconsin, and I do it for two reasons. One is a very able federal judge, Barbara Crabb, who was nominated, appointed by President Jimmy Carter, a Democrat, who's handling this case, has had this to say about it. Quote, drawing all reasonable inferences from the undisputed facts I believe there is a distinct possibility that improper political influence affected the decision. Second, I raise this question because I think it's going to shed some light 
on what's going on in some parts of the Department of Justice. By now, the facts are pretty well known. The career professionals in the Department of the Interior that has jurisdiction over Indian gaming law at the local level approved an application by Indian tribes to take land into trust for a casino at a Greyhound track in Hudson, Wisconsin. Then after the first round of approvals, very high-priced Washington lobbyists began to weigh in against the dog track. They had meetings with the president, with the vice president and staff, with senior White House staff, with the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, with the chair of the re-election campaign of the president. No stone was left unturned. The night before Secretary Babbitt made the decision to reject the application, which was almost unheard of. Practically every single Indian gaming request has been approved by the Secretary of the Interior. One of the lobbyists for the dog track opponents had a $420,000 fundraiser for the President of the United States. He sat next to the President that night before. Your deputy sat next to the President the night before, Gorlick. Now, the Secretary of the Interior indicated to one lifelong friend the next day that the poor tribes, and that was true, this was a fight between Indian tribes that are very well off in Minnesota, the neighboring state, already have a casino, didn't want the, co the competition. The members of the poor tribes in Wisconsin that wanted the license are getting about $6,000 per year. The people in the tribes in Minnesota get a de delivery to them from the casino receipts of $400,000 per person. They are not exactly people without means. And the ones in Wisconsin are. They've got poor education, poor health care. And when the secretary made that, that decision, he made victims out of that tribe. He turned his back on good schooling and on good health care. And the White House policies and huge campaign contributions, said the secretary to a lifelong friend, he said the poor tribes are going to lose. White House politics, huge campaign contributions from tribal opponents of the Hudson dog track had carried the day. Now, before we begin, I want to make one point about fairness. The Hudson dog track matter is not some inside the beltway congressional dispute. It involves real people and that's what I've mentioned, people that are very poor, that they haven't been able to help themselves, but that casino would help them. They'd get medical insurance, health clinics, schools, hospitals, care for the elderly. They'd be able to build roads. And uh, when you think of that gap of $6,000 a person for the poor tribes and 400000 for the rich ones, it uh, makes you shudder. Now, let me ask you a few questions on this round. Madam Attorney General, there's currently an investigation to determine whether the independent counsel should be appointed in the Hudson dog track matter. That investigation is being conducted by Department of Justice lawyers. Am I correct on that? That's correct. There's also an ongoing civil lawsuit involving the Hudson dog track. Is that uh, correct? That's correct. And that is being defended by Justice Department of Lawyers, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, so within the Department of Justice, you have lawyers both defending and investigating the same manner. How do we deal with this? It seems a clear conflict of interest. And if you were a law professor, I think you'd give this case as when I students came for a final exam, and I wonder what you think they'd say. Well, here's what I think they would say. When I came to Washington, I was immediately faced with situations where we might be investigating a prison guard, but at the same time defending the lawsuit against him. And I asked about this potential for conflict. And when the Civil Division or the Environment and Natural Resources Division might be representing one part of the government and another part of the, the government have other interests, we try to build an appropriate structure that will permit that and we constantly review it to determine whether it's it's appropriate as you have pointed out there is now a preliminary investigation underway and time will tell what what that dictates but we have been very careful in this instance to try to make sure that we have separate teams uh, 
each team reports to the department's senior leadership and to me. And we, tr even then, the, the issue of conflict arises and, and we try to address it. Uh, I cannot comment on the pending preliminary investigation as that is obviously uh, ongoing and, and we are proceeding on that. Yeah. The gentleman's time has expired. I'll yield you five minutes on the next round. Uh, Mr. Kucinich. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Reno, I'd like to go back to the beginning of this, uh, uh, of this particular session and uh, ask you to respond to some w what might be considered very fundamental questions, uh, such as, uh, for those viewers, what is an independent council? How do you define it? An independent council is a person appointed by a special division of the court. My understanding is that the people, the three-judge panel on the special division is named by the Chief Justice. The independent council has the authority to pursue the investigation that the special division outlines together with related matters, and we can refer additional matters that may not be related but may have some relevance. Uh, the independent council is appointed after application by the Attorney General and after the Attorney General has determined that the evidence is specific and credible uh, to indicate that this person may have violated federal law and that there is no need for further investigation. Why is it called independent? It is called independent because uh, there is a need in certain situations such as with covered persons where the Congress has presumed that a conflict exists to have someone who does not have that conflict make an independent judgment. So that there might be a conflict within justice, let's say, or a conflict within the administration? If there were a conflict within justice, for example, if, if I had a personal conflict, um, I'd been friends with somebody for all of our lives or something like that, then the Deputy Attorney General would be the deciding authority. What about uh, the independent counsel himself or herself? Uh, what are the specific powers? Once an independent counsel is named, what can an independent counsel then do? The independent uh, counsel has all the authority of the attorney general, including the power to use the grand jury to subpoena people to enter into plea bargains and to grant immunity. The only person that can remove the independent counsel is the attorney general. And have you ever had reason to consider removing an independent counsel? No. If you found an independent counsel was in possible conflict, would you remove an independent counsel? Or if, it, if the independent counsel was in conflict? It, it would depend on the circumstances. Uh, for example, uh, a report out of the Rocky Mountain News in uh, Denver, Colorado, October 22, 1997, points out that uh, Kenneth Starr, who is a uh, uh, independent prosecutor, has uh, volunteered to help Paula Jones gratis in her lawsuit against the uh, president and uh, has demonstrated, this is a direct quote, his regard for the appearance of a conflict of interest, his, his regard for the appearance of a conflict of interest by contributing to Republican candidates and continuing to represent tobacco companies and defense contracts. Uh, that's a direct quote from the uh, Rocky Mountain News. Now, you as the Attorney General have the responsibility for, as you say, reviewing the conduct of the uh, independent counsel. And I would ask you, uh, that matter has been called to your attention? That specific matter has not been called to my attention, but we, I don't think, what I have tried to do is avoid commenting on the activities of the independent council in any public fashion so that I don't do anything that would impair the independence of I, and, and you know, uh, uh, Madam Attorney General, I respect that and I think that you've handled yourself in a manner before this committee which is very fair and impartial. Let me point out one, one point so that I can clarify. I have seen press accounts when I indicated that I was not aware of the specific situation, I have seen press accounts that there have been political contributions. 
but that's just to correct the record. I, I, I guess the, what's instructive here is that when we use the word independent, that word has a, a lot of meaning to people. Uh, for example, we have one independent in this whole Congress, uh, Mr. Sanders. People presume that you're independent of political parties, that you're independent of political influence. If, if evidence is submitted that perhaps the, an independent council is not, it raises questions the notion of independence. And so I think in these hearings, uh, we may come to some kind of a conclusion that may help us strengthen the whole idea of the independent council and the independent council statute so that we can truly have councils who are independent if that's what we're seeking here. Uh, furthermore, I would like to echo the concerns expressed by the independent member of this Congress, Bernie Sanders, about we've gone through all of these hearings and yet no effort is being made, bipartisan effort, to bring about campaign finance reform. Now, when I'm back in my district talking to people about these hearings, they feel that a lot of this is a waste of time. And they particularly feel it's a waste of time when they don't see any action being taken about the underlying pr problem which exists here, which is there's a problem with the campaign financing laws. And if this Congress doesn't go ahead and fix those laws after all this, this exercise will be seen as being hypocritical and totally a sham. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, I will now yield my five minutes to Mr. Horn. I thank the chairman, and to continue the discussion, uh, uh, Attorney General, uh, let me ask you a few more questions. As I understand what's going on, and you say you've got a way to resolve this within the Department of Justice with different teams and so forth, we seem to have one of those teams vigorously defending Secretary of the Interior Babbitt, who was ordered, really, by the White House to make this decision against decisions he and other secretaries had readily approved. And uh, they're apparently not only defending Mr. Babbitt, they're defending the president, because he did sit next to this lobbyist, and 420,000 was delivered at that, uh, as a result of that party. Harold Ickes and Bruce Lindsay, longtime presidential aide and friend. And what gets me here is the issue of documents when there's a civil case involved. The civil litigants have been deprived of various documents they've sought. And uh, you've gone to court, as I understand it, or the Department of Justice representing you have gone to court to protect these particular claims of privilege. And it just seems to me that's very unfair in terms of the civil claimants, namely the Indians in this case. So how do you expect the American people really to have confidence about this matter, because here is truly a, an appearance situation where no matter how, I, I like your business of, you know, I'll take the heat and et cetera. I like people that way. On the other hand, you've got the problem of what do the American people think when they see this is what your attorneys are doing. They're spending their time with the White House. They aren't spending their time with the poor Indians. And how do you explain it? I want to really make sure that we have clarified the issue because a lot has been included in the chairman's letter to me and in the statement that you just made. First of all, I want to put at rest any suggestion that the department has invoked executive privilege with respect to any documents in the Hudson dog track matter. As you know, we have not been asked by your committee to produce any documents in this matter and therefore could not have invoked any privileges against your committee. Moreover, the White House did not consult with the Department in connection with its response to document requests that it received from this committee. Thus, the Department has only raised objections based on privilege with respect to document requests in the civil litigation. And I would note that principles governing the assertion of executive privilege vis-a-vis -vis Congress and the resolution of privilege issues in civil discovery are very different. Now, you say, oh, they have to go to court. The case is in court. And the perfect answer here is if these claims of privilege are not legitimate, I believe the judge who is presiding is the judge that you, to whom you referred, and I think that she will judge fairly. Well, and I, and I certainly hope she does, but the question would be also, 
uh, does this committee have a right to look at those documents? As you know, three or four letters were sent to you. They were never replied to until the assistant attorney general had one hand delivered to us after several months this morning. And he doesn't use the word executive privilege, I note with interest in his letter, he uses the word privilege. And uh, I hope you're right that the judge will say this is nonsense and uh, that will demand uh, that these files be turned over so they can have a fair trial, shall we say. But I think our worry here is, do we have two standards in justice when we have all those people that justice attorneys are helping, Secretary Babbitt, the President, Bruce Lindsay, and Harold Ickes, and uh, we've got a group of poor Indians out there that would like a little justice out of the court system. Now, that's fine, but we shouldn't have the perception that the Department of Justice is against them. As I have pointed out, the matter is now in a preliminary investigation, and we will see what the course of that investigation reveals. Uh, well, let me uh, just uh, note here that uh, claims of privilege, uh, we don't find, well, the Congressional Research Service, we turned this whole thing over to, and they gave us a number of the precedents on this, and the chairman has already put that in the record. Uh, we'd be glad to send it to you again. They didn't find any claim of privilege asserted in this case very persuasive. And, uh, you know, we've you as attorney general or your representatives have fought on the side of the president to keep document from the independent counsel in the SB case, as I understand. And uh, justice has fought on the side of the president to keep documents from the independent counsel in the Whitewater investigation. Now we're fighting on the side of the disappointed, against the disappointed tribes in the Hudson dog track case. And uh, that, I think, bothers all of us. Again, we're talking the appearance. You might, your people might be the fairest in the world, but they aren't acting that way when they sort of stiff this committee like the White House Counsel's Office does and has for five years, I might add, having been here for five years and seen it. Uh, I just don't see how we can rely on justice and your appointees or your career service, as the case may be, uh, when they appear to be the chief supporters of secrecy. And that bothers me. The department's assertion of privileges with respect to documents requested in the civil litigation was consistent with our prior interpretation of the relevant privilege doctrines and court precedents. If you will look carefully, it is unclear to what extent the Congressional Research Service memorandum disagrees with the department's position, since that memorandum focuses primarily on a very different question, the assertion of privileges by the executive branch as against a document request from Congress. It bears re-emphasis that this department has not invoked any privilege in the dog track matter with respect to your committee. And in any event, as I point out, a neutral judge is going to make the decision as is appropriate in the litigation in Wisconsin. I do not know what the preliminary investigation will reveal. If it triggers an independent counsel statute, I'm going to do it. I should <laughs> say I served under 11 attorney generals in a role in justice. And I must say General. my favorite one was Elliot Richardson. And you know what he did yeah. in similar circumstances. Yeah. And I think both of you could be continue to be heroes if you do what he did. Yeah. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Mikhailovich, did I pronounce that correctly? Um, close, Mr. Chairman. It's Blagojevich. Blagojevich. I think we, me, I'm sorry. I have I'm a have to congressional committee on how to pronounce my last name. <laughs> okay. um, Madam Attorney General, I just want to see if we can elaborate a little bit about uh, uh, a, little bit, a little bit on the issue regarding your decision um, to not disclose the internal memorandum uh, between FBI Director Free and and yourself regarding this ongoing criminal investigation. Can you tell us, uh, to the best of your knowledge, some of the previous uh, patterns, the precedences and so forth regarding uh, open criminal files that the Attorney General um, is responsible for and decisions made by some of your predecessors with regard to releasing contents of those files to congressional oversight committees? We have provided that in a previous letter. Uh, we received the chairman's response that cited some cases. We have in the correspondence that was delivered last night indicated that those are closed investigations which present a different problem. And we reiterate the three points that we have tried to raise, which is, first of all, 
people should feel free to speak their mind to the Attorney General and know that the decision is hers and that she stops there and that people ought to be able to talk freely without thinking they're going to be hauled before congressional committees uh, and everybody's subjected to, to the, this scrutiny. I knew what I was getting into and uh, I think it's my responsibility and I, I will be delighted to continue to exercise that. The second is just laying out for people what you're going to do in an investigation is the dumbest thing I know to do. I mean, if you're conducting a professional, effective investigation, you're going to keep it close to the vest and do it the right way. And thirdly, if Congress gets into it, you have some real issues with respect to separation of powers. And Congress is basically an open forum. Its, its processes are open. And it's just inconsistent with the conduct of an efficient investigation. As I indicated uh, and, and ran out of time, I think I have a responsibility to be accountable to the American people. And the way I've always tried to fulfill that accountability is by saying, while an investigation is underway, don't make it public, but let me try to answer questions when it is concluded. And finally, something alluded to earlier, there are some people that may get hurt that should not be hurt by publication of, of documents. I don't know about this one, but you've, you've got to make sure that the processes are fair and that they seek justice for all. Is it not a fact, Madam Attorney General, that some of your predecessors, irrespective of the political party, they were appointed by, took the same approach in previous investigations, and if that is the case, can you elaborate on some of those? I do not have the correspondence with me, but if I would refer you to the letter that we first sent the chairman in res response to his request. And th this is the uh, letter from uh, Charles Cooper, the memorandum it, it, attorney general. It relates, it cites Mr. Cooper's letter. Okay, and Mr. Cooper was, uh, Part of which administration? Reagan. The Reagan administration. And the position that Mr. Cooper enunciated is essentially the position you've undertaken here. Is that correct? That's correct. And what I've tried to point out is that I have tried to look at the institution, rely on the lawyers that advised attorneys general in President Reagan's, President Bush's administration, as well as President Carter's. We shouldn't have shifting sands and shifting foundations. The institution has construed it, career lawyers have construed it, and we should work together to understand how that applies, not just in a Republican administration, but in a Republican and Democratic administration, so that we can ensure that investigations and prosecutions in this country are nonpartisan and nonpolitical. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Gilman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Madam Attorney General and Director, FBI Director Louis Free, we thank you for making yourselves available today to help us clarify some of these issues that have been troubling our oversight committee. Um, Madam Attorney General, are you aware of any restraints or any limitation whatsoever on the FBI's agent's ability to follow leads and investigate covered persons as defined under the independent counsel statute where there is yet no independent counsel appointed to deal with the allegations about those particular persons. I have tried to stress, and I hope you will ask Director Free about this, because I want to make sure that every transaction and every lead is followed. I think Congressman Cox had a whole litany of issues. I can't comment on those issues except to say this investigation is not over. We are proceeding with all leads. We're trying to make sure that we leave no stone unturned. If at a point along the way there is specific and credible information developed that a covered person may have violated the law, then I've got to trigger the preliminary investigation and then if it proves correct, I've got to trigger the appointment of an independent counsel, and I am prepared to do that. Well, before an independent counsel is appointed, can they still go after covered persons as defined?
if you go after covered persons, you've got to have specific and credible, credible information that they may have violated the law and the preliminary investigation is instituted. You can also go after transactions and as you develop information concerning transactions, you can, it may develop that, that a covered person is involved. We are going to make sure we pursue every lead. Does your but my ultimate responsibility is the legal decision that I make myself alone, and that is whether the independent counsel statute has been triggered. You cannot investigate a covered person if the independent counsel statute has been triggered. If it has not been triggered, you mean? If it has not been triggered, I'm sorry. Yeah. So doesn't that make it a pretty difficult threshold for the FBI to pursue some of these leads if an independent counsel definition has not yet been triggered? We are trying to make sure that we leave no stone unturned and that, that every lead is pursued. If it is pursued and specific and credible information is not developed, then we cannot pursue it. But for example, if we, under the situation and the notifications that I have filed, if we proceed with our investigations across the board and develop evidence, additional evidence concerning the violation of 607, then the statute specifically provides that the preliminary investigation is instituted. And that would mean that you've already then triggered an independent counsel to permit that to be pursued? I would have triggered the act, but the no. preliminary investigation would determine whether further investigation was necessary to show that the evidence was specific and credible or that it was not. And you would make that determination, is that correct? That I would make it just like I've made it on at least four occasions and on an additional referrals. So if the director of FBI says, we have some co potentially covered personnel, then you would have to make a decision as to whether or not to trigger the independent counsel in order to enable them to proceed, is that? Just, just exactly what I've been doing. I mean, I've, tr I've triggered it just with respect to this investigation four times now. Well, th doesn't that somewhat create a catch-22 position in order to be able to bring in a covered person? No, I don't think so. It just it requires care in making sure that the independent counsel statute is complied with. Um, Madam Attorney General, you've indicated in several occasions today that you were, you're not uh, con concluding that this is a final determination on an independent counsel, and if there is some sub substantial information or evidence uh, that comes forward, you would still consider the appointment of an independent counsel at a later date. Is that correct? I would even tell you that you, you talk about substantial evidence. The, all the statute requires is specific and credible information that the federal criminal law may have been violated. So it, I don't know that it even rises to the level of substantial. But we're constantly looking at that issue to make sure that we don't miss something that would trigger the statute. So you're not closing down the opportunity then at some later date if there's credible evidence that you would be able to move ahead with an independent counsel. Right, and I wanted to make that point to Congressman Cox and to others who have lists of things that, what about this and what about that? I can't, as I express my frustration to the chairman, I wish I could sit down with you and say, this is everything that we're doing. See, you got any other ideas about what we can do better? That's not the way it works in this country in terms of the, the authority of the prosecutor, but we are pursuing every lead that we can. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Tierney? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Reno, for spending all of this time with us. Uh, as riveting as it is to go over and over the issue of uh, phone calls and, and where they might have been made for and whether they were soliciting hard or soft money or no money at all, uh, I think we've heard extensively on that issue. And I would like to broaden the scope a bit, if we might, to discuss uh, money in politics generally and a little bit of the hard money, soft money distinction. Uh, that's a distinction that I think that is being made, and I think that it goes to the issue that most people are concerned about. It's just a tremendous amount of money and the perceived, if not the real need, by candidates uh, to get more money to get their message out, at least to the extent that the opposition may be doing that, and the effect to which some people think there may have been some coordination uh, between candidacies and so-called issue ads, and whether or not that uh, violation or a concern that we should have 
if the uh, committee members were around, we had a tape that we were going to show. I beg your pardon, I didn't. Which tape are you referring to? He'll know. Right. Well, passing on that, there was... Excuse me. That's all right. You take whatever time you need. Go ahead. Uh, there have been uh, discussions both on the uh, Democratic and the Republican side about whether or not certain so-called issue advocacy advertisements were in fact campaign advertisements. Uh, I was going to show you a tape, and I see it's sporadically coming up and going off on the side, but the issue is whether or not a, a particular ads were, instead of being advocacy ads or issue ads, actually campaign ads run by different candidates, and whether or not those people had, certain candidates had coordinated the efforts of their campaigns with the people doing issue ads. Is that a concern under the current campaign finance reforms? Would the coordination of issue advertisements or issue advocacy advertisements and campaign ads be a problem that we should be concerned about? I have not looked at the campaign reform package in detail because I have thought that it's important for me to concentrate on the investigation and on performing my responsibility here. As I have said in the past, coordination between the presidential candidates and their national parties on national party spending, at least up until a certain point and during the time covered by the events in question here, was assumed by the FEC. Congress created under the FECA the FEC that set administration, provided for the administration of the act and set the policy for the act and they are currently considering this issue. The whole area is, is a confusing area and a very complex area of the law. But just to give you some indications, these cases are not, each varies a bit on the facts and they're not directly in point because they don't relate to, to uh, national parties. But two circuits have recently held that an advertisement does not constitute express advocacy subject to the FECA unless the ad uses explicit terms such as vote for, elect, support, or defeat. There are two other cases that indicate perhaps to the contrary. And I think it is very important for the American political process that we do everything we can to clarify what can and cannot be done. It is a very difficult area of the law because of the First Amendment issues that have arisen. But if we could work together to come up with something that gave people an understanding of what they can, clearly can and can't do, it would make such good sense. Well, I think this is a fair question to ask, I will. Do you agree, at least, that it, there is a, uh, a large amount of misunderstanding or at least uncertainty as to what is allowed and what is not allowed uh, with respect to raising monies and spending monies under the current statute on campaign finance laws? Actually, there is a great debate on that issue, is, and just, just looking at those four opinions that I cited to you rising in, in different contexts, uh, and there is clear confusion. There is also the issue of the First Amendment and the, the Buckley versus Vallejo, what can and can't be done under the Constitution in terms of political expression. Uh, it is a very complex area, and the best way to address it is for people of goodwill to sit down and figure out how we come up with something that makes sense. Ms. Reno, whenever there's a, a vote on Congress, if any particular congressman or congresswoman voted on a matter that affected the economic interest of any one of his or her major campaign contributors, wouldn't there at least be the perception by some that there was some conflict of interest involved there? It would all depend on the circumstances, but you've got to, to, to look at each case and what ifs are, are not good for prosecutors to respond to. Yeah. Well, I guess it goes in, in brief, we're limited with time to the prospect that maybe we all ought to take a good hard look at some public financing of campaigns in order to try and avoid all of these finer distinction areas that are so difficult and so complex and end up with us here at endless hours of hearings 
on fine points of where the phone call was made, whether or not the phone call was made, and what kind of money was solicited. And I'll end with that, and thank you very much for your time. The gentleman's time has expired, Mr. Shays. Greetings. I was reluctant to come today because on my wall is a bill that you and I worked together on closely, a wonderful note from you, and I have lots of respect for you, and yet I feel I have strong disagreements that could affect that friendship. And I think if I could have that feeling, I wonder how you have a feeling with the President of the United States who you clearly have to work with. To me, it's about two issues, accountability, you hold people who commit illegal acts accountable, and it's about, frankly, reform. This Congress exposes wrongdoing, but then reforms the system. We saw it happen in 1974. We saw it happen in the HUD investigation where we brought forward reform. So to me, accountability and reform are both the same thing. Mr. Cox asked, I thought, incredible question. He said, under the independent uh, counsel statute, have you commenced a preliminary investigation on John Juan? You said no. He asked, under the independent counsel statute, have you commenced a preliminary investigation on Charlie Tree? You said no. Then under uh, Antonio Pan, you said no. Then Webb Hubble, I don't know the answer, will come back. Mark Middleton, you said no. I want to ask you, under the independent counsel statute, have you committed a preliminary investigation of the vice president for his fundraising uh, at the temple? I have triggered an investigation of the vice president and have made available through approval of the court uh, the fact that I have with respect to only 607. So that isn't under the independent counsel statute? You did it be uh, before that? You, this is not under the independent counsel statute? You didn't trigger you the days? You copy of the Hatch letter with... Let me just give you the... Because we received a 30-day letter from uh, both Senator Hatch and Congressman Hyde on... I'm asking if you triggered the 90-day finding. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Let me get the letter for okay, you. Okay, let me just go on then. Under the independent counsel uh, statute, have you committed, um, uh, commenced a preliminary investigation of uh, Ron Kerry, the fundraising of the Teamsters, and the possible connection between the DNC and the Teamsters? No. Uh, under the uh, independent uh, counsel statute, have you... Uh, commenced a preliminary investigation of uh, Secretary Babbitt and the Indian Gaming? As I testified earlier, there is a preliminary investigation underway. As I look at it, it seems to me that um, basically you have decided to focus very narrowly and that you're missing kind of the big, what I call, corrupt picture. You see a jigsaw puzzle and I see one that on the table would seem to me that you would want to to in, commence an independent counsel for a variety of people that Mr. Cox asked you about and I've asked you about. And it seems to me like you bump into the trees and you don't take walk back and look at the forest. Let me ask you, under the independent counsel statute that exists today, would you have commenced an investigation of Watergate when you had these three no good bit people who basically broke, they were maybe good, but they broke in, and would you have triggered one? Would you? Would your mind have said maybe it's going to lead to something? Watergate? You think that's too bit? No, but you know what? No, I don't think it's too bit. Okay, I didn't no. think it was too bit. No, don't change it. The issue was when you saw when there was a break-in and people thought it was not going to lead anywhere, you I, have triggered it. I disagree with your suggestion that it wasn't going to lead anywhere. But let me so go back to the facts that, that these issues are going to lead anywhere. You don't think any of these are as significant as a break <laughs> into Watergate? Let me suggest to you what is important. If you and the chairman and Mr. Lantos had specific, there was specific and credible information that you may have violated the law, and all the people on the front row served on the committee with you, and they, because they served with you, might be part, but there was no specific and credible evidence that they were part of this big picture that you talk about, I don't think that they should be pushed along into it. I think I have the whole... I consent I want to make. Hmm? I just need to make an unanimous consent before my time expires here. Well, what uh, is it? Uh, you know, we, we've discussed a number of, of um, concerns that we have about the department and its, and its potential conflicts. And in order to assist you in reviewing these conflicts, 
I am, I'd like to enter into the record for your review uh, records relating to Mark Middleton and his dealings with various foreign nationals, uh, the Lippo Group and the DNC, records relating to Charlie Tree, records relating to Antonia Pan, and records relating to Webster Hubble as it relates to $100,000 of the Lippo payments and his withholding of information. Uh, and I would submit that for the record and then ask that it be pro provided to the department. Without objection. May I now respond? Oh, yes, you can okay. respond. Thank you. I just want it, it is very important that you don't see a big amorphous blob and pull everybody into it saying that they're all part of the investigation. You've got to look at the specific and credible information that exists with respect to them. And if there was no specific and credible information against Mr. Shadag, just because he served on the same committee with you that did something wrong, doesn't mean that he should be wrapped into an investigation that caused that. It is very important that you look both at the big picture, and if you get specific and credible information concerning the big picture, you trigger it. But if you don't have it, you have got to look at the pieces. And that's where people can disagree, but that is where s something is very important to me. And one of the things I hope is that I don't lose your friendship for it, because all I've tried to do was what was the right thing to do. Yeah. And if people go around losing friendship, they, because somebody's tried to do the right thing, that's not entirely right, and I have a great respect for you. Now, what we are trying to do is look at the facts and circumstances. I have triggered the independent counsel statute before on a discretionary issue, and I'm not afraid to do it again. When I look at the facts and figures and look at the person that I have specific and credible information about and say, does this person create a conflict for the Justice Department? And when they do, and I think it should be triggered, I'm going to trigger it. Mr. Thomas. Or Mr. Turner, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Attorney General, I uh, appreciate your testimony here today, and I, I suppose I take a little different tack from what some have said about, uh, I think a remark was made that you bump into the trees, and I think earlier was said you, you're not, uh, your job's not to cross the T's and dot the I's. I, I'd like to say that from my vantage point, I think that probably is your job, and I think we're, as, as the American people would probably agree, we're better off for it. Uh, you are the chief, or supposedly you and Mr. Free may share the title of chief law enforcement officer of this country. Uh, you are over the FBI, one of the most feared agencies in, in government. Uh, anyone who has ever been subject to investigation uh, by the FBI or the IRS understands the power the federal government can bring against an individual. And whether it's the president or an individual that I may represent, a hardworking citizen of the second district of Texas, uh, I think it's important that all of us agree with you that your job is to dot the I's and cross the T's, to be sure that the power of prosecution of the federal government is never brought in an arbitrary way and that the law is clearly followed. You know, we have a campaign finance system today that I guess started out well intended when we passed a law that said you can only contribute $1,000 to a congressional candidate as an individual, or if you're a political action committee, you can give $5,000. It seems that smart lawyers for both the Democrats and the Republicans discovered somewhere along the way that you didn't have to abide by those limits, that you could ask for money, tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars at a time, and pour them into political parties or to nonprofit groups and run so-called issue advocacy ads, which are no more than campaign ads in the mind of an average sixth grader, and you could get by abusing a system that was created to cre place some limits on what people can put into the political process. Now, you have a unique view of that system because your office uh, has investigated, I'm sure, literally hundreds of cases of abuse of that system. And I suppose that without asking you to, to specifically give us recommendations, on what we ought to do to change that system. At least I think maybe the American people would like to hear from you as to what your general view is of the system that we now have and as it's evolved uh, to elect officials to the highest offices in the federal government. I think that what is, is necessary is to clarify what can and can't be done. And I think that with the work that's been done on it, McCain-Feingold, comes very far towards achieving that. 
again, I think the most important thing that people could do would be to sit down and in good faith discuss it. And if people disagree, then disagree in a thoughtful way. They're Republicans and Democrats. But this issue is how you make the funding of democracy work. And there is no issue more important, no issue more vital to this nation than how you fund democracy. And that's what it's all about. And so my recommendation is sit down and let's talk about it. How much time and energy does investigating abuses of the current campaign finance system uh, consume you and your staff? Lots. How many investigations have, have been launched since the last campaign by your office of various allegations? There are major, I mean, the, as part of the whole campaign finance investigation, there are a lot of uh, pieces of that investigation underway, as I've indicated in response to, to comments about what's happening. I can't talk to you about specific cases, but I can say we are pursuing these leads. How many investigators and U.S. attorneys across this country? We have over 120 country? lawyers and agents assigned. Across the country investigating congressional and presidential allegations. There's one other issue that I want to address very briefly just to give you the opportunity to address it if you choose today. Following uh, your testimony and Mr. Free's testimony, I understand that uh, Independent Counsel Donald Smaltz has been called to testify before our committee. And apparently he has told the press that the Justice Department decided not to prosecute Secretary Epsi's former Chief of Staff, Ron Blackley, and suggested that the Justice Department obstructed his investigation uh, without a basis for doing so. Uh, inasmuch as that apparently will be his testimony, uh, and, it, and, and there have been reports to that effect, I thought it might be appropriate while you are here to give you an opportunity to explain to us uh, what the Justice Department's position was with respect to Mr. Smaltz. I appreciate that very much. I'm limited in what I can say, both because the independent counsel matters remain in large part under seal and because the Blackley case is still pending in court. I can assure you, and I will assure Mr. Schmaltz, having just heard in these last days about his concern, that there was never any effort to obstruct his investigation, and I regret that he even has concerns that there were. In 1994, the Department received a referral from the Department of Agriculture Inspector General concerning Mr. Blackley. The Department investigated this single matter and closed it as without prosecutive merit. Mr. Schmaltz was originally given jurisdiction to investigate whether Secretary Espy had received illegal bribes or gratuities. In 1995, Mr. Schmaltz went directly to the court that appoints independent counsels and asked to have his jurisdiction expanded to investigate and prosecute a wide range of individuals who might have dealt with Blackley or Espy. We opposed the application in court. Although large portions of these papers remain under seal, I can tell you some of our reasons. First, Mr. Schmaltz did not claim that the particular persons who were the basis of his application had anything to do with the gratuities that were the basis of Mr. Schmaltz's original jurisdiction. We did not believe that the new matters were related to his jurisdiction. Instead, as we have done with many other independent counsels, we believe that it was appropriate for the department to investigate and prosecute these matters, and if evidence against Secretary Espy developed, turn that evidence over to Mr. Schmaltz. Remembering now that Mr. Espy was the covered person and the reason the statute had been triggered. As I have said, the department has had this sort of cooperative relationship with numerous other independent counsels, I'm told, and on different occasions. Secondly, we believe that it was not lawful for the court to give Mr. Schmaltz jurisdiction over the objection of the Department of Justice. You must remember that under the Constitution, the executive branch has the power and the responsibility to enforce the laws. The Supreme Court upheld the Independent Counsel Act in part, and this is important, because the Attorney General retains substantial control over the decision to seek an independent counsel and the independent counsel's jurisdiction. We have an obligation to make sure that that statute's constitutionality is maintained. We did not think that the court could expand its jurisdiction on its own 
or that an independent counsel has jurisdiction to, in <clears throat> to investigate anything he happens to come across because that would present serious separation of powers issues. We believed and still believe that Mr. Schmaltz's request to the court presented important issues, and accordingly, we litigated it in a responsible and professional manner, and we had no, obje no intention whatsoever of attempting to obstruct. If we had gone otherwise, we would have investigated it, shared it with him, seen where it left, went to. His subsequent prosecution of Mr. Blackley, I am told, was on different charges than those which the Inspector General had referred to us and on which we had declined prosecution. In addition, Mr. Schmaltz has raised something that's very disturbing to me, and that is anonymous Department of Justice officials that are critical of Mr. Schmaltz, and he cites some examples. He had previously sent me a letter concerning a leak of some information, and we referred that to our Office of Professional Responsibility. They are also reviewing this, and I expect that they will pursue it and have made clear that, that this is what should be done. But uh, if Mr. Schmaltz thinks that we intended to do that, I just regret that impression. It is certainly not an accurate impression based on what we in were trying to do. Gentlemen's time has expired. Ms. Morello. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Attorney General, for spending the day with us. I must admit that I, I am disturbed that an independent counsel hasn't been appointed to investigate alleged abuses by the Clinton Gore reelection effort and most recently the fundraising phone calls made by the President and the Vice President. I, I really think the American people. Uh, who become so cynical of government because of campaign abuses deserve an inquiry untainted by the suspicion that the Justice Department is protecting the executive branch. And while our committee is charged with the responsibility of investigating all campaign illegalities and improprieties, I also want to point out that Congress has the power to clarify existing laws to ensure that such abuses Abuses that should so clearly um, be illegal will not happen again. I remember in your opening testimony you said that uh, the vice presidential um, calls were for soft money, but some later did become hard money. And I'm struck by the confusion over the meaning and the force of the Federal Election Campaign Act. And I'm really rather amazed at the disagreement over what activities FECA prohibits and what FECA does not cover. So I have a few questions I'd like to pose that I hope will shed light on how we in Congress can clarify and change existing campaign finance laws. Some may be a little bit repetitive. I think some of my colleagues may have touched on some of them, but, but first, so I am clear on the Justice Department's position. I'd like to just ask you a few questions, Madam Attorney General. It, it is my understanding that under the Pendleton Act, campaign contributions as defined by the Federal Election Act may not be solicited in federal buildings. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Under 2 U.S. Code Section 441E, contributions may not be made by foreign nationals in connection with an election to any political office, right? I'm not sure of the number, but it's in here. Great. Okay, great. Um, under 2 U.S. Code Section 441B, contributions may not be made by business corporations and labor unions, right? And under 2 U.S. Code Section 434, contributions are to be fully disclosed, right? These laws should be clear, but legal definitions aren't always what they seem, as is the case when soft money comes into play. And as I understand it, each of these laws has been weakened by the soft money loophole. The Federal Election Campaign Act defines a contribution as a donation of money or anything of value for the purpose of influencing a federal election. Contribution is, therefore, a legal term with a definition that is much more narrow, specific, and technical than the usual meaning of the word. The FECA definition of contribution, therefore, excludes soft money. Because the soft money loophole has undermined um, uh, all of the um, um, laws would it be helpful to the Justice Department in um, this case 
or in future cases if Congress enacted campaign law reforms that clarify the law and ensure that no political contributions, hard money, soft money, any money may be raised with government resources or can be solicited from foreign sources or corporations. What do you think? You have to, uh, you, you get into some interesting areas uh, and I'd have to look at, at all the issues with respect to uh, what you can and can't do. For example, Congress has said we can't solicit and we can't receive, but you can bring a contribution to the to our office if we get rid of it in seven days or something like that. And so there are some logistics that you have to look at and consider. But again, Congresswoman, I would just love having been the recipient of yours and Mr. Shays and other, if people would just sit down and let's talk about it and figure out how McCain-Feingold can be improved upon what can be done about 607 to make sure people know exactly what they can and can't do. Th that's kind of what I'm getting at, Madam Attorney General. For instance, in light of the soft money loophole, is it the department's legal position that the Pendleton Act does not cover soft money donations because the uh, FECA does not cover soft money? Is that the department's position? 607 specifically something. refers to the FECA and so that's, that's the connection. Okay. Um, is it the department's position that the corporate and union contribution ban does not cover soft money donations because the FECA does not cover soft money? That's the that's department's correct. position? Okay, and I just wonder about what effect the soft money loophole had on, soft, on foreign soft money donations, seeing as how the FECA does not cover soft money. The department has a position on that? I need to clarify for you something on that. I think there is another provision that uh, is affected there. I can't recall it off the top of my head, and I'll clarify that for you. Okay. So what okay. I'm getting at is that Generally, we need to come expressed. up with some definitions, and Congress has a role in it, too. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Chairman, may I ask what your plans are so I can either tell well, the, the uh, Italian uh, Minister of Justice and Minister of Interior that... Uh, Ms. Reno, I, I, I apologize for the length of the hearing, but we have a number of members who still have questions. I think we ought to be through with in probably another half hour, if that's possible. If not, maybe we can ask you to return. I'd rather not do that. Okay, we've moved it up to 345. Could I be sure that oh, I sure. make 345? If you're not, I'll go speak for you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Allen. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And Ms. Reno, I very much appreciate your being here today. I want to contrast what I have heard from you throughout this hearing. Your, this, the words specific and credible evidence have passed your lips on a number of occasions today. And I am glad that the highest lawyer in this land is sticking to the law as it was enacted, as this Congress uh, passed it. And I want to contrast the emphasis that you've shown in, in focusing on specific and credible evidence with a couple of phrases. Uh, the chairman earlier referred to this whole mess, and uh, Representative Shea has referred to the big corrupt picture. It seems to me that it is critically, critically important that our country's top lawyer follow the law, focus on what the law says specifically. I want to... Uh, follow up on, on some of the things that Congresswoman Morello was saying, in particular about soft money. It strikes me from your testimony that this question of, of tele Pendleton Act, but a problem for our campaign system. And I appreciate your uh, suggestion that it's time to reform the, Pop the Pendleton Act so that the legal issues are, are clearer. would not have occurred because it wouldn't be 
neither the president nor the vice president will be out there asking for that particular type of uh, funding. Just judging by the comments made to me informally over these last weeks as we have investigated this, I think this question would still be asked by many people of what they can and can't do under the Pendleton Act, but generally you're correct. Yeah. I, I would just note for the record that, that we all ought to, on this committee, be judged by our willingness to legislate and not just to investigate. There are eight members on the Republican side who have signed on to one bill or another that would uh, reduce or eliminate soft money. And, but there are 18 Democrats who have signed on to a similar legislation. So I, I would just say it is clear that on this side of the aisle there is a determination to do something about soft money and in most cases get rid of it, not simply eliminate it. I want to refer uh, now, uh, you, you raised some questions earlier in your testimony about the, the budget for independent uh, councils. And if I could sh have the screen now show uh, a comparison, which I've asked to be produced. For the year, from March 1996 to March 1997, independent councils have been, have cost $21 million, and they have returned 13 indictments. And just by comparison, during that same period of time, or during the time of the fiscal year 1997, the U.S. Attorney for the District of Massachusetts has filed 1,050 cases at a cost of $17 million. Are you concerned with the costs that independent councils are running up in the course of doing their work, and do you have any suggestions for how we should deal with that? What I have, spe what I have specifically said is that I'm not going to comment on any specific independent council because to do so would be to have some impact on their independence, and I have tried very carefully not to comment at all. And recognize, too, that these are major investigations of critical importance to the nation, and they should be adequately funded. All I'm saying when I talk about budgets is a more general concept. I don't care whether they spend a little bit or a lot. Each person who does the spending should be accountable for their spending and have to budget and do what I do each year and come up with a budget. Good. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Mike of Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Reno, in your testimony, you said sometime after the uh, 1994 elections, the DNC began to split some large checks into soft and hard money accounts without the donor's prior knowledge or consent, including several of the donations solicited by the vice president. Investigators uncovered no evidence that the vice president was aware of the DNC's practice or in any way knew that donations he solicited would uh, make their way into hard money accounts. Is the same the case with the president? My recollection is that there is one, one check that may have gone it was made out to non-federal account and non may have been crossed out. I'm not sure whether it went into a federal account or a non-federal account, but it was made at the residence. The solicitation was made at the residence. Now, let me ask you this. If you found information to the contrary, uh, would you appoint an independent counsel? What I have said Consider. previously today, sir, is that the Independent Counsel Act specifically provides that if an investigation is closed because no further investigation is necessary and new evidence is developed, you would. it will trigger the preliminary investigation and I would apply the standards that I have in this to determine whether we could proceed. If I may, let me run you through a, a quick scenario. November 1995, November uh, 2nd, the Vice President uh, meets and sits next uh, to, at a meeting uh, with Pauline Kanchanilak, uh, with uh, Charlie Tree, with, uh, I think it's Wary uh, Dinata, the Indonesian gardener, and John Wong, or Wang. Uh, uh, this is on the 11th, I'm sorry, 11-2, which is uh, November 2nd. Uh, 
have you talked to uh, or any of your investigators talked to or had access to Charlie Tree, to uh, Wary and Dana, uh, Dana, Danetta, whatever his name is, the gardener, or uh, Pauline Kanchanilak? I cannot discuss what we're doing in the continuing investigation except as to say what I have already said, that we're pursuing every well, lead. Let me go from that, if I may, to um, uh, this is in November. Put up on the screen what the president said on uh, December uh, 7th, a few, a few weeks later. Uh, then we realized we could run these ads through the Democratic Party, which meant we, raised, we, we could raise money in tens, twenties, and hundred thousand dollar blocks, and we didn't have to do it all in the thousand dollars and run down what I uh, can spend, which is prohibited by law. So that's what we have done. That's after uh, that uh, meeting. Uh, then we have, um, on d December 12th, put up the, uh, the gardener, uh, how do you pronounce that, Weary and Detta, and he is on tape with the president saying, this is a few days later, he's saying, James Riotti uh, sent me. Uh, this is also the dude that gave $100,000 uh, to Webb Hubble, your former number uh, three individual. Uh, then let's move along to Pauline Kanchanilak. Um, Pauline Kanchanilak and the, the money that was funneled into state campaigns. Pauline Kanchanilak met with the, the president and the residents. I have the, uh, I have the, uh, uh, the visitor log here, and this one is uh, June 18th, 96. June 18th, 96. Pauline Kanchanilak meets with the president. Uh, and I have a list of the money that went to states from Pauline Kanchanilak and her uh, sister-in-law, Dognet uh, Cronenberg. Um, Florida got uh, $60,000 a few days later. Uh, California, $54,000 uh, ended up there. Illinois, $55,000. Pennsylvania, $50,000. Ohio, $43,000. Uh, then we've heard this talk about uh, about the support of the uh, the support of fine gold intent, I want to bring up this uh, uh, what's what's happened uh, in Kansas. Six years ago, the state of Kansas passed a law designed to limit soft money coming into the state. The statute, a mini uh, McCain fine gold bill, clearly limits the amount of soft money that can be contributed by the Democratic National Committee or the Republican National Committee to twenty five thousand dollars. It also limits the amount of soft money that can come from uh, other state political parties to $15,000. Where's the charts? Uh, based with this limit, uh, my investigation has uncovered evidence that, that the DNC actively trampled on the laws of both Kansas and the United States. And you can see, and uh, would you provide the Attorney General, put it on the screen, a list of these uh, conduit payments. I've got the assistant to, list Yes, to about. subvert, to, uh, a mini uh, uh, soft money uh, state law. Uh, very, very uh, conspiratorial, in my opinion, it's a gentleman if you, you start putting these, uh, these uh, points expired. together. Uh, and I'd like additional time to finish this, if I may. Well, we're under the five-minute rule, and uh, the minority is about to object. Yeah. I can hear them breathing on my shoulder. Uh, so, if you could summarize real quickly, and, and uh, it's heavy breathing, Mr. It's heavy Chairman. Heavy breathing, yes. Mr. Chairman, I would yield him one minute of my time, and then I would have four minutes to conclude. If that would be all right. Uh, do you object to him yielding one minute of his time? Uh, we we should move five minutes by. Uh, five. I'll, I'll allow you to yield him one minute on the next round, if it's okay with you, Mr. Davis. Is that all right, uh, Mr. Micah? Okay, Mr. Lantos. Well, in deference to our Attorney General, who has been here much longer than her self-established deadline, I was going to yield back our time. But in view of this litany of democratic crimes, which seem to have no point to them, except to one, one more time repeat all the democratic crimes, I want to take my five minutes to talk about uh, some recent uh, Republican shenanigans. The tobacco industry contributed $8.8 .8 million to the Republican Party since the Republican takeover of Congress in 1995. In fact, the top three corporate contributors over that time period were all tobacco companies. 
Philip Morris, R.J.R. R. Nabisco, and Brown and Williamson. Following these contributions, and at the urging of former Republican National Committee Chairman Haley Barber, who, as I understand it now, is a tobacco industry lobbyist, the Republican leadership included a $50 billion tax credit to the tobacco industry in this year's initial budget deal. Since 1994, Amway Corporation has contributed $2,866,000 to the Republicans, including the single largest ever contribution to the Republican National Committee, $1.7 million. In addition, Amway founder Richard DeVos and his family contributed $1,163,000 to Republican committees and candidates, including $1 million from Mr. DeVos and his wife to the Republican National Committee in April of this year. In April of this year. <clears throat> I mean, the, the sheer hypocrisy of colleagues on the other side <laughs> <laughs> complaining about soft money contributions when in April of 1997 one individual contributes a million dollars uh, to the Republican National Committee. The Republican leadership included a $280 million tax provision that would benefit Amway stockholders in the budget deal. Now, this is not the only such activity. In April 1995, Fruit of the Loom contributed $100,000 to the Republican National Committee. <clears throat> Golden Rule Financial Corporation contributed $620,775 in soft money to Republican committees. Uh, Golden Rule also happened to be the top proponent and beneficiary of medical savings accounts as an alternative to the current Medicare system. Following these contributions, medical savings accounts were included in the Republican proposal to deal with our medical finance problems. Um, PNM Cedar Products, a major supplier of wood for pencils, developed a close relationship with the Republican leadership. Um, the the notion that these soft money contributions, which I oppose in all form, I think there should be a total ban on soft money contributions, either by individuals, corporations, or any other entity, uh, that these soft money contributions were the specialty of one political party is so patently absurd as to, as to uh, uh, be almost nauseating. Uh, we have had an abuse and a more successful abuse of current campaign finance laws by the other side by virtue of the fact that they have succeeded in raising more money. Uh, this, in this campaign cycle, our colleagues on the other side are way ahead, way ahead in raising money, hard money, soft money, mixed money, than is our side. Uh, Clearly, the notion of dealing with past transgressions to be remotely fair would have to be a bipartisan approach. It is palpably a non-bipartisan approach. When we have 700 subpoenas is issued by the chairman of this committee to Democrats and 10 or 11 uh, to Republicans, the appalling lopsidedness becomes self-evident. What is clearly called for is what our distinguished Attorney General has called for, a serious attempt to reform campaign finance laws. Some favor full public financing. Others favor <clears throat> the McCain-Feingold approach or some variant of it. But we have got to see to it that we restore the confidence of the American people in the electoral process and these one-sided partisan political witch hunts won't do anything to achieve that goal. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman, gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Davis. I'd be happy to yield one minute to Mr. Micah. 
Thank you. The fact is none of those uh, folks met with the president or vice president of the United States, or, nor has uh, fled the country, uh, and they are accessible to this committee. Uh, Ms. Reno, my question is uh, I cited three or four individuals pretty heavily involved in a conduit of uh, incredible amounts of money who have personally met with the president and vice president. Uh, you're not able to tell me whether uh, that's being investigated. Is there any uh, attempt uh, uh, at, or are you taking any action to bring these people back into the country? Again, we are trying to pursue every lead and we look forward to, to, to the chance to have some. Well, if, if you aren't, I think we have a responsibility. If we just aren't any committee of Congress, we are in investigations and oversight. And I'm prepared to, uh, I am prepared to uh, uh, proceed with contempt uh, uh, procedures against you, contempt of Congress, if we don't find out, I'd be glad to work. What do you want to know, sir? I would like to work with you, and we... Uh, do you want to know all details of the investigation? Well, I, I would like to see a copy of the memo that was subpoenaed and has not well, been open to this committee. I just think it would be very, very wrong for Congress in its oversight function to become part of a prosecution and an investigation. It would politicize investigations. It would politicize the, have, uh, the prosecution process. We have I think that's with, wrong. Uh, this committee has worked with top secret uh, information and numerous uh, investigations in a cooperative manner, and we're prepared to do that with you. Uh, if it means uh, that that has to be done in executive session or in li some limited basis, I think we'd be willing to I work with you. I think there is a v very distinct difference between those other matters that you discuss and criminal investigations, and I think we should think long and hard before Congress becomes involved in criminal investigations and criminal prosecutions. I think we must do everything possible to keep politics out of it, to make sure that it is run by the executive in an appropriate way, and I will work with you in every way I can to honor your, ob your oversight function, and I would hope that you could work with me to honor my responsibility to conduct an investigation in a fair, impartial way without making it public. Thank you. Um, reclaiming my time, Mr. Chairman. Let me just, Madam Attorney General, thank you for staying. As I know it's been a very long day, and I'll try to be brief. I want to move, since we're hearing from Mr. Smaltz tomorrow, to just ask you to elaborate on some of the comments you made uh, when Mr. Turner asked you previously. As you know, the Smaltz uh, investigation has secured 10 indictments of 18 individuals and companies in five different jurisdictions. Uh, this investigation has so far recovered more than $4.5 million in fines and penalties for the U.S. Treasury. And we will hear from Mr. Smaltz tomorrow in his perspective on dealing with the Justice Department, but I wanted to make sure the Attorney General had an opportunity today to, uh, if she can, clarify the Justice Department's role. My understanding is that the Department of Justice uh, declined originally to prosecute uh, Mr. Blackley for his uh, uh, false statements on his financial disclosure forms. Is that, is that correct? There was an initial, as I testified, an initial declination. And you declined to prosecute under those grounds? For a specific case, I'll, I'll be happy to furnish you with a specific case in which the declination was provided. And then when Mr. Uh, Smaltz came forward and wanted to expand his investigation to include some of these items, uh, you, didn't you oppose the independent counsel's effort to prosecute Mr. Blackley? In fact, um, his application for referral to Blackley matter, there were two legal grounds under the independent counsel statute, and you lost your argument in both counts. Yes, I indicated that out of our responsibility for construing the statute as it has been construed both through Republican and Democratic administrations and in connection with our responsibility to ensure its constitutionality, we made an argument that we thought was responsible and professional. As I indicated, it was not done with any intent to obstruct Mr. Schmaltz. And as I indicated in my previous testimony, we have on a number of occasions, both in this administration and otherwise, worked with independent counsel to make sure that we shared information as appropriate and that we cooperated with them in every way possible. As I indicated previously in my testimony, I regret if Mr. Schmaltz feels that there was any intent to obstruct because there clearly was not. But well, we, we, we will hear from him tomorrow, and he will be able to further elaborate. I guess the concern is that 
the Justice Department didn't want to prosecute on their own when these items came forward? No, I think, sir, that there was additional information that was uh, before Mr. Schmaltz when he determined to prosecute. But we don't know if you ever would have uncovered this information or not. I think that's, that's one of the questions we'll ask Mr. Schmaltz tomorrow in terms of... Well, I don't think Mr. Schmaltz could answer that, but I do think that if we had the opportunity to sit down with him and talk about it, uh, we could understand just what his point was and, and pursue it. Well, we'll get that out. We'll air it tomorrow, but I think the American people ought to know that Mr. Blackley was convicted of three counts of lying to hide $22,000 he received in 1993 from Mississippi agribusinesses in violation of 18 U.S.C. Uh, 1001. Those three businesses sought and received in excess of $400,000 in USDA subsidies in the one year that Blackley served as ESPY's chief of staff and Blackley attempted to influence and reverse a USDA decision not to provide one of those businesses with the amount of subsidies it requested. And the, the key here, I think, is that this investigation has recovered more than $4.5 million in fines and penalties uh, for the Treasury. We'll be able to hear more about this uh, tomorrow, but I just wanted to give you an opportunity on the record. I to appreciate the that. opportunity, and you it, can tell Mr. Schmaltz I never intended to obstruct right. it, that and we Mr. have Chairman, had excellent him working consent. relationships. If you'll let me finish, since you said you wanted to let me have a chance to get sure. something on the record. Uh, I was going to ask unanimous consent to let you supplement it. That well, was, uh, it but go ahead now. Unanimous consent, don't I worry. I have no objection. Uh, okay. Is there no, any objection? No objection. I wasn't trying to cut you off. I wanted to give you an opportunity right. to. I just think it is very important as we proceed through these complicated matters this administration prosecuted somebody that many people in this Congress said we would never do. We would never follow through, and they cried politics. And we prosecuted, and we did what was right. We prosecute and reclaim for the American people millions and millions and millions of dollars. We send an awful lot of people to jail. I respect the independent counsel, and I have not commented in any way publicly with respect to the independent counsel. But I will tell you, when I have seen the Department of Justice prosecute and convict people in tremendously complex cases, such as Oak Bomb, in the World Trade Center, when I look at the recent methamphetamine investigation that came down, I'll match you point by point with everyone. But the basic issue is, did we try to obstruct him? No, we were just trying to do what we thought was our duty under the independent counsel statute, and we will continue to try to do that. Mr. Fatah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, say that uh, to the Attorney General, a lot has been said uh, since you've uh, rendered your decision in this matter, and I've heard uh, Unfortunately, calls for your impeachment, or uh, now we hear uh, a threat of a contempt uh, citation. But I do want to try to set the record straight. You were asked a series of questions about whether or not you had initiated preliminary investigations as related to a number of named people, Charlie Tree, John Wong, so forth and so on. And to each, you said no. That does not mean that those people or matters associated with or allegations having to do with are not being looked into by the Justice Department. Is that correct? Thank you so much for answering, asking that question so I can answer it once again and <coughs> say because a preliminary investigation has not been instituted does not mean we are not pursuing every lead we possibly can. In fact, you said and you testified and it's a fact that the task force that you have set up has more resources than any other ongoing effort of the Justice Department. That's as I understand it. Over 100 agents and 120 lawyers. 120 agents and lawyers. So the independent counsel route to uh, a uh, truth searching exercise is only one route. The normal route is the Justice Department, with all of its expertise, pursuing a matter. And you've done that through this joint task force uh, in which the FBI and others are actively participating in. That's correct. So that when my colleagues ask you these questions about whether or not certain people are being looked into, and they elicit the answer, which is a truthful answer, that there is no, there's no independent counsel preliminary review, it doesn't, the American public should not believe that you are not doing everything that you're capable of doing or looking into this. And let me try to 
further help you clarify the record, you have made decisions in the past to appoint independent counsels. Kenneth Starr to investigate the president and the first lady as it related to Whitewater. Is yes, that sir. correct? Yes, sir. You appointed an independent counsel to investigate the activities of the late Commerce Secretary, Ron Brown. I sought the appointment. And also for uh, Henry Cisneros, the Secretary of HUD. That's correct. So there have been many times in the past when members on the other side of the aisle in the Congress have applauded your independence and your decision-making process because they approved of the final conclusion that you arrived at. That's correct, sir. And now, because they disagree with this point, you've used the same decision-making process, right? That's correct. You've looked at the facts, looked at the law, and you've arrived at a conclusion. And so I would just ask my colleagues as they go about the business of applauding some decisions and criticizing others that they keep in mind that the same decision-making process has been applied and that as there are other matters that you have indicated you might be looking into, there's also a federal law that prevents you from discussing anything that may be before a grand jury or evidence that has been presented or been prepared to go before a grand jury. Isn't that also correct? Yes. Rule 6E prohibits me discussing grand jury testimony. So you couldn't answer half of the questions that have been put to you today if, in fact, they were legitimately part of the task force's effort to find out what the facts may be? I've tried to answer every question that I could that would not interfere with the appropriate conduct of a criminal investigation. And any of the lawyers who are members of this committee would more normally know that it would be against the law for you to, as a government attorney, to dis disclose any information that was going well, I think the chairman has has recognized that by suggesting that at least with 6E material that that there is a limitation. And the, the last thing I want to say is that even though you're being criticized today, you should feel free to know that you know things change around here. A few months ago, they were criticizing uh, the FBI director, and they wanted there were many leading members of the Congress, uh, Republican members, who were criticizing his activities, and now they want to applaud his activities because for the moment they agree with. Uh, seemingly his point of view on a particular matter. There's a certain ebb and flow here. If you are making decisions that they agree with, then they hold you up, and if you're not, then they tear you down. But I think that the American public is well served by your independence and by your willingness to stand behind your decisions. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, may I take two and a half minutes? Two and a half minutes. Stand in recess for two and a half minutes. <laughs> the committee will come to order, Mr. Pappas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Reno. Uh, Thank you for being here and for staying as long as you would, have. Would, would you be willing to yield for me for just one sure. second? Real briefly, Ms. Reno, first of all, I want to correct the record. Uh, when uh, Mr. Fisk was up for reappointment as the independent counsel, you recommended him for reappointment. A number of us were concerned about Mr. Fisk's reappointment. Uh, information was sent to the three-judge panel, and they chose to not appoint Mr. Fisk, but to appoint Mr. Starr. You indicated you appointed Mr. Starr. I just wanted to correct the record. No, I, what I indicated and what I meant to indicate, sir, was that I had appointed Mr. Fisk, that I sought Mr. Fisk's reappointment. I understand. But that when I triggered what I said I was going to do was that if the Independent Counsel Act was passed, I would go to the court to seek the appointment of a court-appointed independent I, counsel. I, under, I understand. And that's what the I... The impression was it was that you appointed Mr. Starr. Let me I just, couldn't appoint Mr. Starr. And let me just say one more uh, thing real quickly, and that is... When we asked for the memo, very clearly I stated to Mr. Free's counsel and Mr. Free and to your counsel that we didn't want any grand jury testimony, anything that pertained to the investigation. You could redact. We wanted to see the, uh, the redacted copy so we had some idea of the reason for the change. That's the reason, sir, I made the statement to, to the member just in, the, I think, the last round that indicated that you had in, uh, would accept a redacted copy. Mr. Pabst, thank you. <clears throat> 
Ms. Reno, I'd like to refer to a letter dated November 4th, uh, 1997, that is signed by Lee Radek, R-A-D-E-K, Chief of Public Integrity Section Criminal Division. This is to Bradley Raymond, who is the attorney representing James Hoffa. The uh, uh, second paragraph, there is a sentence which I'll uh, quote from, quote, we have concluded that the officials of the Clinton-Gore 1996 re-election campaign against whom allegations have been made are not covered persons, covered, post cur covered persons being in quotes, within the meaning of the Independent Counsel Act. This is in response to two letters from Mr. Raymond, uh, I believe addressed to you uh, or to your department uh, dated September 12th and October 6th, 1997. I'm wondering if you could uh, provide us with an explanation of the analysis used to make this decision. Do you have the letter there? Pardon me? Do you have the letter there? Yes. Yes, I do. I don't have, I thought that I had um, IBT. Let me. I can certainly provide a copy of this to you if someone could give it to Ms. Reno. Thank you. I've highlighted it there. Okay. He states that they are not covered persons within the meaning of the Independent Counsel Act, and the relevant would be uh, 591B6, I believe, which provides that the chairman and treasurer of the principal National Campaign Committee seeking the election or re-election of the president and any officers, officer of that committee exercising authority at the national level during the incumbency of the president would be covered. I believe, as I recall, though I don't have the specific information with me, that the decision was that they were not any officer of that committee exercising authority at the national level. Would you, since you sound somewhat unsure, would you check that and get that back to. to us for the record? Thank you. And I now would like to yield to Mr. Barr. Thank you. Uh, Madam Attorney General, uh, uh, just briefly, uh, one statement that you made earlier, and, and you've made it in other uh, uh, venues as well, that there's some big blob out there. Uh, first of all, uh, prosecutors uh, deal with large blobs all the time. They're usually conspiracies, uh, and they bring meaning to them. I don't think that's really even though what we have here, and that is a large blob. We have very clear evidence uh, through uh, uh, the words of, uh, of Dick Morris clearly indicating a, a, a systematic effort by the, uh, by the president and vice president to evade campaign limits. We have the president's own words, as you saw earlier today, not for the first time. Uh, in Exhibit uh, C-90, the president clearly indicating, not in some amorphous blob, but very clearly an effort to, uh, to evade campaign limits. You saw through, uh, through uh, exhibits uh, presented by Mr. Shattuck, the specific words of the vice president uh, uh, that he was in, it was his intent to raise money specifically for the federal campaign, even though that didn't make it into your memo, those are his words. You have the uh, documents that I submitted earlier as well, Exhibit 292, uh, that clearly indicate in a memo to the vice president in preparation for a meeting with the president that, uh, that they were uh, uh, intending to raise money for their re-elect budgets. Uh, yet in the face of all that and other evidence we've seen in this committee previously, for example, uh, even though uh, one member of the White House uh, staff, the First Lady's former Chief of Staff, seeing memos uh, that clearly indicated you cannot take and receive campaign funds at the White House or on official property, she did so. Uh, and apparently uh, it is not so-called aggravating circumstances uh, where that sort of person, clearly knowing that they're not supposed to because they have received at least two memos by very learned counsels to the president that it is illegal to do so and then they do so. That apparently does not rise to the level of an aggravating circumstance as well. And that's what mystifies, Madam Attorney General, a lot of us up here that this is not some Regular order, law. Mr. Chairman. There are very specific, specific incidents. <coughs> and I would, uh, uh, again, urgently solicit you're looking at these not as amorphous blobs, but as very discreet pieces of evidence indicating systemic abuse by this administration in the last yeah. election cycle. Gentlemen, time has expired. As I indicated previously on a number of occasions, we are pursuing each lead and leaving no stone unturned, pursuing each transaction. And when there is specific and credible information that a covered person has may have violated the law, 
then we will trigger the independent counsel statute. But you're quite right. It is important that we pursue the specifics, and we are doing so. Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would yield one minute to Mr. Kucinich. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Uh, members of Congress, uh, we had the power to ask uh, the Attorney General Reno to be here today, and she has complied. She has been very thorough in her presentation, very detailed. I don't think anyone who's watched these proceedings would dispute that. And at the end of all this, at the end of hours and hours, it just doesn't seem fair to have an esteemed colleague on the other side uh, raise the issue of possible contempt of Congress proceedings. Uh, we saw Maggie Williams, the First Lady's former Chief of Staff, threatened with criminal prosecution in this same room, despite the fact that no illegality was uncovered. Now, the American people are watching these proceedings, and we should be very careful how we use our power here, and not to use that power for purposes of media excitement or for intimidation, implied threats to pursue legal action against witnesses. If we have credible and specific evidence to proceed with such an attack, and I do not believe such evidence exists in a matter before us, then do it. But to visit a threat on a witness does not reflect well on this committee or this process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Reno, I want to thank you also for being here today. I think you've been very patient. Obviously, you've been very, very professional. And I think you've been very direct in the answers to the questions that have been posed to you today. Um, because we're near the end of your testimony and we're going to be hearing shortly from Mr. Free, I want to return just for a short time to the, the letter that you and Mr. Free sent to this committee yesterday, my birthday, um, talking about the, your reasons for not wanting to give uh, the memorandum to this committee. In the letter, you state, it is unprecedented for a congressional committee to demand internal decision-making memoranda generated during an ongoing criminal investigation. So you're saying that you're unaware of any precedent whatsoever for this? So far as I know, and what the way we have done this is we have consulted the lawyers in the Office of Legal Counsel who have had continuing responsibility for this issue. Uh, I, I don't know of any. And your position is that this could hamper your investigation if these materials were released at this time? It is the very strong feeling of the Justice Department. If we're required to release documents such as this, it is going to set a precedent that can have a very disastrous effect, not just on this investigation, but on all investigations for the future. And we would just like to work with people to try to get the questions answered. I think we have framed today where the differences are. I think people understand why I've done things and why I haven't. You'll be able to hear from Director Free and see if we can't get through this honoring the oversight function of Congress and honoring my responsibility for conducting a professional and effective investigation. Ironically, I think that you have some support from maybe some unexpected quarters, at least in, in the arguments you made. Uh, on September 24th in this committee, the issue at that time was the release of depositions, uh, with the Democrats, frankly, arguing for the release of depositions and the Republicans arguing it against it. Uh, at that time, Mr. Barr from the other side stated, and I'll quote, there's an additional reason in addition to the one cited by the gentleman from California, and that is that witnesses then can collude their testimony if these documents are released. Another is, as a former prosecutor, I am well aware of if these documents, such as we are talking about here, are released, particularly in the early stage, they can cause, these, cause those witnesses to be intimidated so that, they, so that their testimony may change, it may be shaded. So I think that there are very, very sound reasons from both a legal and from a historical standpoint of how this body, the House of Representatives, has treated these documents in the past, and I urge the defeat of this amendment. Mr. Davis um, echoed those comments when he said, but if you do it in the middle of the process or at the beginning of the process when you have different witnesses that have, been made that have made conflicting statements, it really undermines the whole investigatory role where we have seen people stonewall stymie and try to shut down this investigation and some of the witnesses that have been deposed to date. So I think that I understand, you understand, and I think many of the majority understand why you don't want to release this document. And I'd like to now yield to um, my friend from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Uh, <clears throat> Madam Attorney General, again, I just want to thank you for being here. And I want to <clears throat> thank you. I, I, just, I just, as uh, you were speaking, I was just thinking 
that most lawyers will tell you, whether they are on the defense or prosecution side, the thing that they want most is fairness, is fairness. If they feel, if they go to trial or they go through a process, and even if they don't win, if they believe that they have been treated fairly, that is the, that's the critical question, and I want to thank you for all that you're doing. I sit here and I wonder how you, you take all of this, but uh, I encourage you to stand up and stand strong. And thank you, thank you, and thank you again. The gentleman you... You're back. You Madam Attorney General, on behalf of the Democrats on this committee, on behalf of the American people, I want to thank you for yet another exemplary performance as an outstanding public figure. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Snowbarger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Attorney General, thank you for being here today. I've got two or three lines of question. We'll see how much uh, time we can, uh, time we'll have to pursue these. I wanted to follow up on a question that the, the chairman asked right at the beginning. Uh, he asked if you would, were requested to do so by the president, would you appoint an independent uh, counsel or independent prosecutor? I think your response was it depends on the circumstances. But let me try to follow up then. Uh, if you were requested to do so by the president, uh, would you appoint an independent uh, counsel on the matters related to the phone calls uh, made in the White House or on other federal property? It would depend on what the president's feelings were about it. Well, if he asked you to do so... What I would be doing is, is doing it under the... I would not be doing it under the independent counsel statute. I would be doing it under special counsel statute, and, and I'd have to look at what, he, the, what his reasons were. Okay. What about uh, the uh, foreign money situation that, that we've alluded to and that uh, has been in the press? Again, it would be under the special counsel provisions, the administrative appointment, and, and I'd have to look at it. You have to look at the case or the statute? No, I'd have to look at the facts, why he wanted me to do it. Okay. Are you looking at the facts related to the foreign contributions that we've talked about? No, I'd, I'd have to understand why he wanted me to do it. Well, if, if he wanted to have credible investigations in the minds of the American people, would that be sufficient reason? It would depend on the circumstances. What about uh, the president's involvement uh, uh, in um, these I, ads I will just, the result of I will just money? flat out tell you to do what ifs for a prosecutor is not a, a professional thing to do because you come up with so many different variations and you cannot judge the future by the the different variations that occur, so I don't think it's a useful pursuit. I'm happy to try to answer your question. So, so that the fact that the President requested those would not make any difference whatsoever? No, I didn't say that, sir. So if you heard from him today and he asked you for independent counsel uh, be appointed in all those cases, you'd, you'd examine that at least and, and potentially appoint uh, special I'd prosecutor? I'd examine and understand his reasons. Okay. You go know, a different, different uh, route here. Um, your investigation now, particularly on the phone call situation, since we, we finally have, I guess, some ruling there, uh, or determination out of your office, has, has taken a considerable amount of time. I think you originally had 90 days and requested additional time after that. Uh, so it's, it's gone through a fairly long process. Um, and I guess my concern that I expressed to you is that we've gone through a fairly long process. Have we reached a conclusion now? About what, sir? About the, the phone calls. I guess that's the only thing that you. I have reached on the conclusion point. that is set forth in the notification. Okay. So that matter is ended at this point. That matter is ended uh, with respect to the president and the vice president. There are matters that are we are continuing to investigate. Okay. One of the concerns that I have is that if new information is developed with respect to the president and the vice president, it will trigger the 90 days. And who would be developing that information? That would be part of the whole task force investigation. FBI agents would be the investigators. One of the concerns I have about all of this and, and the amount of time that it's taking in the Justice Department, and again, I want, I want you to take the time that, that's required, uh, I suppose, but uh, uh, in, in some ways it, it hampers the investigation of this committee. Certain types of evidence, uh, uh, access to, uh, to witnesses, maybe through grants of immunity, things of that nature, are directly tied to investigations that you have ongoing. And uh, it seems, it appears at times that uh, while your efforts are really appreciated, they are also hampering the efforts of this committee. And so I'm trying to figure out, you know, when in the process we can ha uh, expect to uh, have access 
uh, to all that information, have access to all of those witnesses. I guess my, my question is, do we have, I mean, are, are you saying that we currently, that we will now have access to all of that, uh, at least on the phone call situation uh, out of the White House? You have access under the order of the special division of the court to what is in the notification as I understand it. But, but nothing beyond that? That's correct. You're gonna hold everything else close to the vest and... I'm gonna to try to conduct an appropriate investigation. I am going to try to work with the chairman in every way that I can on issues of immunity. We did so with Senator Thompson. We're gonna try. At times our interest may be in conflict, but where they aren't, I'm gonna to try to make sure that we do everything we can to cooperate. Yeah, my, my frustration is <clears throat> that you say in, in the notice that no thir further investigation is warranted. And at the same time, you've also indicated to the public that no one has yet been exonerated, that the investigation is still ongoing, that if new evidence is, is uh, found, that then you'll go back and re-examine this decision, only you'll take another 90 days to do that. And it seems like we keep postponing and postponing any final determination that, that would allow us to get into things that may not be criminal in nature, but may be a part of the campaign finance investigation that we need to pursue. I just want to make sure that no stone is left unturned so that when you call me before you, if I'm still around, uh, after the investigation has been concluded, I can answer your questions to the best of my ability. Well, my, my comment is that your thoroughness affects our thoroughness. Has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Miller. Uh, Madam Attorney General, uh, I'm new to this committee. This is my first day to attend uh, uh, this uh, committee meeting. Uh, and I have a question that's unrelated to what's been asked so far, uh, if I may ask, and that's concerning a horrible crime that took place in my area of Florida, Sarasota, Florida, and the Department of Justice is now involved in it. And I'm going to ask is what you know about it, but also what, you know, get your commitment that you'll do everything you can to have the accused. I, let me, may I describe the crime? I, mean, I, think I, I know about the crime. I want to make sure everybody else understands oh. what a horrible, heinous crime took place. This is a, uh, on November 7th, last month, a 35-year-old um, mother of six children, including four quadruplets who are aged 23 months, was murdered. Uh, the 13-year-old returned from school that afternoon and found the mother uh, lying on the kitchen floor with the quadruplets covered with her mother's blood. Uh, the good police work in our area has uh, the, uh, identified a conspiracy, apparently, that's taken place and a hired gun. Uh, the person that's accused is a U.S. citizen born in California, raised in Texas. He returned to Texas and then went to Mexico, and now he's being held in jail in Mexico. Uh, the Mexican government is resisting. The person should be deported. He's a U.S. citizen. Mexico has nothing to do with this particular crime. It's outrageous that they're holding somebody that's a you know, U.S. citizen accused of a murder in the United States. Um, and what I'm asking is that we can do everything we can to extradite him, because the, the treaty says the word may, so there is the ability to do that. And what we need to do is build up as much pressure on the Mexican government. I'm asking if you will use your offices and the Department of Justice as much as possible to persuade them that Mr. Mc, Mr. Del Toro should be brought back to the United States to stand trial. He's a U.S. citizen, and there's no excuse in our opinion, and it's a high-profile case in Florida. I know you, hopefully maybe you've talked to Mr. Moreland, our state's attorney. So I'd appreciate if anything you can do in this case, maybe you can update us right now where we stand. This is a terrible crime. I heard about it almost the moment it happened, and it is just a, a very, very terrible crime. With most South American countries, language similar to our extradition, extradition treaty with Mexico states that the requested country may refuse extradition, requested country may refuse extradition if the re requesting country does not waive the death penalty. Despite the apparent flexibility that you refer to in Article 8 of the treaty, Mexico does not have any discretion in requesting assurances on the death penalty since its domestic law prohibits the surrender of anyone facing the death penalty without such assurances. We're working closely with Mr. Moreland's office to do everything we can to see that he is brought back to stand trial as soon as humanly possible, and I follow this matter almost on a daily basis. Well, it's, to me, it is outrageous that a U.S. citizen can escape. I mean, what, was, what happened to Timothy McVeigh had escaped to Mexico is a question I asked. I mean, would they be holding him and we'd have to wait and we couldn't stand trial? And I One of the things <laughs> that I'm trying to, to address with my colleagues, and that's the reason, Mr. Chairman, if this could be the, almost the limit because they're, they're waiting, mm -hmm. is as we build trust in the world, I think it is very important that everyone know that there is no safe haven and no place to hide. 
I think that should apply both to people who are U.S. nationals and people who are nationals of other country if they commit a, a serious crime here in this country. And I, I want to do everything I can to build an understanding that says it's not a matter of sovereignty, it's a matter of what a good prosecutor says. And a good prosecutor knows that the best, most appropriate, most just place to try a case is where the crime was committed. And so I've spent a lot of time and effort uh, on that. I think we're making slow progress, but we have much more to do, and it's something that is very, a very, very great concern to me. And when I see situations like this, it's something that I focus on daily. I appreciate that. If it's time, I give it to uh, Mr. Barr. If, uh, if uh, Mr. Barr, can you take the rest of my time, or you can yield your time to? I'll yield the balance of my time, Mr. Barr. Uh, just um, quickly, uh, Ms. Reno, uh, to follow up uh, on a prior discussion that you had with regard to the applicability of uh, Section 591C, the other persons under the Independent Counsel Statute, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, John Huang and uh, Charlie Tree uh, in particular is the fact that you have indeed, as you've indicated, uh, not ruled out investigations of them, uh, but you have not done so under the independent counsel, uh, indicate to us that you have concluded that there is no and would be no conflict of interest uh, with regard to them, keeping in mind that the language of 591C uh, indicates that uh, it may result in a conflict, not that it shall result in a conflict, but may result in a conflict. Have you reached a conclusion that an investigation of John Huang and or Charlie Tree would not result in any conflict of interest? Or may not result. At, at this point, based on all that I know, I have not triggered the statute with respect to them. But does that, does that mean that you have concluded that an investigation of them would not result in a conflict of interest. It means that I have not determined that an investigation or prosecution of either man by the Department of Justice may result in a personal, financial, or political conflict of interest. That's what you've concluded? Yes, sir. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, we have our differences, uh, Ms. Reno, but I want to tell you I really appreciate your patience today in being with us, and I hope we have a chance to talk again before long. Thank you. You are free to go to your next speech. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll take a 10-minute break, and then we'll have Mr. Free. Ten of you were magnificent. Thank you. Thank you. No, there's nothing. We appreciate you more than I can ever tell you. The uh, committee will come to order. Is uh, Mr. Lantos, uh, there he is. See his smiling face.